The Second Coming of Christ by Paramhansa Yogananda. Preface These spiritual interpretations, received and interpreted through Christ consciousness, are the methods which the Masters have taken to show the world the common scientific platform of intuitive perception where the Christian Bible, the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, Hindu Old and New Testaments, and true scriptures of all true religions can find unity. The spiritual interpretation of the Christian Bible reveals and liberates the truth hidden in the dark caves of theoretical and theological studies. Jesus Christ was crucified once, but his Christian teaching has been and is now being crucified by ignorant people. The understanding and application of these intuitively perceived teachings are attempting to show how the Christ consciousness of Jesus, free from theological crucifixion, can be brought back a second time into the souls of men. These spiritual interpretations are born of intuition and will be found to be universally true if they are meditated upon with intuitive perception. The Universal Christ but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. As a small cup cannot hold an ocean within it, no matter how willing it may be to do so, likewise the cup of material human consciousness cannot grasp the universal Christ consciousness, no matter how desirous it is. But when the student, by the precept to method of concentration and meditation, enlarges the caliber of his consciousness and all Adam's Christ consciousness within his own, this is what is meant by received him. Thus, according to Jesus, all souls who can actually find their souls one with Christ consciousness by intuitive self realization can be called the sons of God. All scriptures, such as the Bhagavad Gita or the Hindu Bible and the Christian Bible, have a threefold meaning. In other words, the scriptures deal with three factors of human beings, namely the material, the mental, and the spiritual. Hence, all true scriptures have been so written that they serve to be beneficial to the body, mind, and soul of man. True scriptures are like the wells of divine waters, which can quench the threefold material, mental, and spiritual thirsts of man. In addition, the scriptures, in order to be worthwhile, should really help the businessman, the mental man, and the spiritual man. Although both the material and the psychological interpretations of the scriptures are necessary, it should be remembered that the scriptural authors undertook with great pains to point out to man that the spiritual interpretations are of supreme importance to him. A materially or intellectually successful man may not be truly, scientifically successful man who makes a perfect success of life, whereas a spiritual man is the happy all-round man who is healthy, intellectual, contented, and truly prosperous with all satisfying wisdom. Since by intuition the spiritual authors first sought to make man primarily spiritual, I give the spiritual interpretation with the psychological and material interpretations interwoven. These interpretations will help alike the spiritual aspirant, the intellectual man, and the businessman. These intuitively perceived spiritual interpretations of the words spoken by Jesus Christ are to be studied every day conscientiously and meditated upon by true Christian and all true devotees of God. Universal Christ consciousness appeared in the vehicle of Jesus, and now through the specific techniques of concentration and meditation is taught in the original precept to lessons, and these intuitionally received interpretations of the scriptures, the Christ consciousness is coming a second time to manifest through the consciousness of every true devotee of God. A Sacred Remembrance when Paramhansa Yogananda began writing his intuitively perceived interpretations of the sayings of Jesus, he prayed for Christ to guide him in divining the true meaning in his words. Paramhansa Ji was blessed with the presence and vision of Jesus Christ many times during his life. On one such occasion, in later years he asked a question of Jesus pertaining to these writings. It was a time of silent prayer and his room became filled with an opal blue light, and Christ appeared, radiant and about him a glow of golden light. Looking into his wondrously beautiful eyes, he asked Christ if he had pleased him in the way he had interpreted his teachings. 
At once a chalice appeared at Christ's lips, and then came over to touch his own, and Christ answered, Your lips have quaffed the same living waters from which I drink. Words of matchless assurance. This holy response was sacredly cherished within his heart. Chapter 1. The Divine Nature of Jesus the Boy. And he said unto them, How is it that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my Father's business? This scripture depicts the proper divine attitude of Jesus to his parents. In the above statement, the perfect life of Jesus brings forth a perfect utterance as to how a divine child, consecrated to serve humanity, should behave. Jesus hints that it is the highest duty of parents not to worry about a divine child like Jesus, who is protected by the King of Kings. He implies also that the highest duty of the Son was to look after the celestial business of spreading the kingdom of the Heavenly Father. He implied that duty to our Heavenly Father comes first and foremost, and that duty to parents, although important, is secondary. Jesus knew that parental love and affection, being blind, might demand from him greater attention to his earthly Father's business than to his Heavenly Father's business, for which he came on earth. He also here signifies to his parents that they should know, and at the same time wish for him to be busy with his Heavenly Father's business. Since parental and filial relationships are brought about by God, parents should first teach their children that it is good to be proficient in God's business. The above saying was the first hint by Jesus to his parents as to what they would have to expect, and about what his life was going to be. As all noble parents are lovers of God and of his business, so they should wish the first interest of their children to be in God's business. All parents should start their children on the right road in life by making them first proficient in contacting God and in doing all things with God consciousness. A life guided by God's inner, intuitive direction can be successful, healthy, and complete only when activity is balanced with wisdom and happiness. The ordinary man thinks that this world, his family, and his work are his business, but the spiritual man knows that parents, children, family ties, the business world, and all else are God's business. He knows that everyone should help to maintain a world by love and service compelled and actuated by instinctive blood ties. Hence, all business should be spiritualized, that is, everything should be done with the consciousness of God within, and man should try to please God by harmonizing all things with his ideals. Religious duties should not conflict with the duties of business, neither should duty to business conflict with spiritual duties. When such conflict occurs, the spiritual duty is incomplete and should be modified. Business duties also should be revised when they militate against spiritual duties. Spiritual and material duties should work together like two stallions, pulling the car of life harmoniously and uniformly to one happy goal. A successful life, therefore, must be begun with spiritual culture first, for all material and moral actions are governed by spiritual laws. All business must first conform with God's business of divine laws in order to be of lasting benefit to mankind. Any money-making business which caters only to human luxury and false or evil propensities is bound to be destroyed by the workings of the divine law of the survival of the worthiest. The business which does harm to the real spiritual comfort of people is not doing real service and is bound to meet with destruction because of the very nature of its activities. Chapter 2. Baptism Then cometh Jesus Galilee to Jordan unto John, to be baptized of him. But John him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and, lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him, and, lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. The original ceremony of baptism by water came from India. Baptism means immersion in water in order to cleanse or purify. 
purification of the body should precede the purification of the mind. Hence, all souls who desired to begin living the spiritual life had to purify their bodies. Cleanliness is next to godliness, but baptism of the body, unless followed by baptism of the mind, becomes practically meaningless. If we bathe and thus purify our bodies, we will find that our mind will temporarily become purified, but unless we change our soul's wickedness by calmness and meditation and constant spiritual vigilance, we will remain the same old devils with bad habits in spite of the temporary purifying effect of the water on our bodies. To illustrate this metaphorically, a Hindu saint said to his would-be disciple, Son, it is necessary to bathe in the Ganges to purify the mind from sin. The sins will leave you temporarily while you bathe in the holy waters, but they will wait for you in the trees skirting the Ganges, and as soon as you come out of the sacred influence of the holy water, they will again jump on you. It is well to immerse initiates in water, but the ceremony of immersion without following it up with continued spiritual lessons and meditation and God contact is of little value. The aristocratic modern way of baptism consists in sprinkling water on the head. This is all that is left of the original custom of purifying the body by water. Immersion of initiates in water may be unnecessary if they are mentally evolved, but sprinkling of water on the head of evolved people is unnecessary unless this is done only out of respect to the ancient, baptismal ceremonies. It is evident that Jesus, although he was so evolved, did not fail to go into the water. He did not fully immerse, for the river Jordan was practically dry at that time. Another important matter in connection with the baptism of Jesus Christ is that he insisted on being baptized by John, who in self-realization was inferior to him. John said he was not worthy to unloose the lashet of the shoes of a lass. Modern baptism has become baptism by water only. Specific precept to methods of concentration and meditation are showing the real way of baptizing self with spirit and ultimate wisdom. Feeling his spiritual inferiority, John wondered why Jesus wanted to be baptized with water. This action of Jesus distinctly demonstrated the ancient, pre-Christian Hindu custom and the real spiritual way, which every God aspirant should follow. The method of finding God is different from the methods demanded by most colleges for any kind of specific training. Even in medical training, the student never learns if he roams from college to college, joining different medical institutions and listening to a few lectures, but without going through intensive training in materia medica, physiology, dissection, and other studies in one college. Also, it is true that a student cannot join all the universities at the same time. Students should follow one course in one college until he receives a certificate that he has completed certain studies, but alas, in spiritual denominations even the loyalty the usual intellectual college expects, is not given to the denomination by the aspirant, nor is the time necessary for self-realization given to the practice of the spiritual lessons. Such people continue taking lessons from any new, good, bad, or indifferent teachers who happen to come to town and advertise. I say that people should discriminate between the so-called teacher, who uses religion only to make money or just a living, and the real teacher who may use business methods in his religion in order to serve his brethren with real spirituality. It is extremely necessary to remember that in the beginning it is wise to compare many spiritual paths and teachers, but when real guru preceptor and the teaching is found, then the restless searching must cease. The thirsty one should not keep seeking wells, but should go to the best well and daily drink its nectar. That is why in the beginning we seek many until we find the right path and the right master, and then remain loyal to him through death and eternity, until final emancipation. Why Jesus sought baptism from John the Baptist, the Guru disciple relationship. We can have many teachers first, but only one Guru and no more teachers afterwards. Teachers call those who come to learn from them students, but a Guru calls the spiritual aspirant who comes to him a disciple. Jesus himself said, 
none cometh unto the Father but by me. This signifies that human souls are mostly true children of God roaming away from him in the wilderness of suffering. Such souls are impelled by the scourge of sorrow to have faint glimpses of their lost home of spiritual blessedness. They begin to long for God and inwardly pray for a way out of the conundrum of life. Then when the prayers of such errant children become deep and strong enough, God is touched and sends help. It is then that the one Father of all sends a superman on earth to give help to the lost seeking souls. Such a man, ordained by God, to help the individual in response to deep prayer, is not an ordinary teacher, but a guru or a vehicle, whose body, speech, mind, and spirituality, God himself uses to bring the lost souls back to the home of immortality. In the Hindu scriptures, an original 1929 edition of Whispers from Eternity, it is written, As a naughty baby, I cried for my mother divine, and she came to me as my guru. My guru, thou the voice of God, I found thee in response to my soul cries. If all the gods are displeased, and yet thou art pleased, I am safe in the fortress of thy pleasure. And if all the gods protect me by the parapets of their blessings, and yet I receive not thy benedictions, I am an orphan left to pine spiritually in the ruins of thy displeasure. Together we will fly to his shores, and then we will smash our planes of finitude forever and vanish in our infinite life. This conception of guru and disciple depicts the only real way to retrace the truant soul's footsteps back to God. This guru and disciple relationship is not the enslaving relationship between the blind church or temple members and a priest of a temple or church elected, not by God, but by the temple or church organization, or by a higher church dignitary honored by orthodox followers, but unknown to God. Freedom of will and obedience. My guru said to me, Allow me to discipline you, for freedom of will consists in not doing things according to the dictates of prenatal or postnatal habits or mental whims, but according to the suggestions of wisdom and free choice. He continued, If you tune in your will with mine, you will find freedom. Formerly, my will was guided by habits, but when I tuned it in with the God guided and wisdom guided will of my Guru, I found freedom. To tune in with a soul whose will is guided by wisdom is to find freedom of will. Most teachers who slavishly control their students after the pattern of dogmatic teachings destroy the power of free will in them, but obedience to a cure does not produce spiritual blindness in the disciple. On the contrary, it develops his third eye of wisdom and intuition. Most teachers want their students to see through the teacher's eyes, but Aguru disciplines the disciple only until he can guide himself through wisdom. A guru, a preceptor, is sent by God. If a disciple, after following a guru for a long time, should spurn him, then he actually spurns the help sent by God. A guru is not a help for this life only. He also makes a spiritual soul contact with the disciple and says, Let our friendship be eternal, and let us help each other through incarnations until we are both completely emancipated in spirit. Sometimes, likewise, an advanced disciple can help a guru and vice versa. Such friendship is not based on any selfish consideration or on any condition. Such divine friendship and perpetual goodwill expressed between two or more souls gives birth to the ever-pure, unselfish, all-emancipating, divine love. My master said to me, I will be your friend from now until eternity no matter whether you are on the lowest mental plane or on the highest plane of wisdom. I will be your friend if ever you should err, for then you will need my friendship more than at any other time. When I accepted my master's unconditional friendship, he said, Will you be my friend under all circumstances? Will you protect me in my highest or in my lowest strata of mind? I was stupefied, for how could I dream of my master being in the lowest strata, but until I vowed to be his friend always, under all circumstances, he did not rest. He was gladdened when I said, I will be thine always. It was then after this amazing spiritual compact, 
that I understood the significance of a guru, and really, I never found complete satisfaction, comfort and God consciousness until I turned myself in with the divine consciousness of my master. Jesus knew of the above law of emancipation. He must have found in John his reincarnated guru, a guru, although inferior in spiritual quality, is a guru just the same, a vehicle of God always. This is why Jesus insisted on being baptized by John the Baptist. Jesus also had spoken of John the Baptist as the reincarnated prophet Elias Elijah. Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. The Sanskrit scriptures have a statement exactly parallel to this. There are many sages with many wisdoms with their scriptural and spiritual interpretations apparently contradictory, but the real secret of religion is hidden in cave. The path followed by a man of self-realization is the path to be followed by any spiritual aspirant. A scripture, no matter what records of spiritual truths it contains in its bosom, is not as useful as a saint, who is veritably a walking, talking, living scripture. There is a vast difference between the powerful sulfuric acid in a bottle and the mere statement of its formula as H2SO4. Neither the formula itself, nor the description of the power of sulfuric acid in a book can ever describe its burning, vital quality. Truths of self-realization are like little insignificant seeds, but their power and wisdom yielding qualities are truly felt when they are seen to grow into huge trees in the gardens of the self-realization of saints, trees laden with the fruits of divine love. We meet little teachers in the beginning through our vague desires to know truth. But the guru or preceptor is the living embodiment of scriptural truths and is the agent of salvation appointed by God in response to a devotee's demands for release from all the bondage of matter. It is very difficult to choose the right path from the many religious paths and varied religious opinions. Most people who wander from church to church seeking intellectual inspiration never find God, for intellectual inspiration is necessary only until one begins to drink God. Otherwise, intellectual inspiration, when it forgets to taste God, is detrimental to self-realization. It is more easy to follow a living, breathing, talking man who lives truth than a mute scripture. If a saint has reached his goal, whether by the shorter yoga route, or by the long-winded spiritual prayer way, he experiences actual self-realization. Anyone following him certainly would reach the goal by using either method. Unlike ordinary prayers, real prayers, which alone can bring conscious response from God, must be offered in meditation intensely and for many hours continuously until divine response comes. The signs of a guru are as follows. His eyes are still and unwinking whenever he wants them to be so. By the practice of yoga, his breath is quiet without his forcibly holding it in his lungs. His mind is calm without effort. If a man has eyelids that blink continually and lungs acting like bellows all the time and a mind always restless like a butterfly and he keeps on telling you he is in cosmic consciousness, laugh at him. Just as a man cannot pretend that he is sleeping while he continues to run, so one with restless eyes, breath, and mind cannot convince you, who know better, that he is in cosmic consciousness. Just as sleep manifests in the body by certain physiological changes, so the muscle eyes, breath, all usually become still during cosmic consciousness. No cure can be developed alone by years of study in the intellectual factory of a theological seminary, which deems it has attained its ends when it confers B.D. or D.D. degrees. Such titles can be won by men of good memory, but character, self-control, and intuition can be developed only by knowledge of advanced psychophysical methods of self-realization and deep, daily meditation. Jesus and his disciples were products of unceasing meditation and intuitive devotion, and not merely results of intellectual theological seminaries. Most Christian churches today have wandered away from the path of self-realization and are satisfied with sermons, ceremonies, organizations, and festivities. 
The complete revival and restoration of Christian churches can be effected only by discarding the oft-repeated theoretical sermons and too frequently changing psychophysical ceremonies and replacing them with added concentration during church services on the part members. They should concentrate more and more on perfect stillness in both the physical and mental realms. For stillness and peace are the real temples wherein God most often visits his devotees. The secret of true religion lies in the cave of stillness, in the cave of wisdom, in the cave of the spiritual eye. By concentrating on the point between the eyebrows and delving into the depths of quiet, one can find answers to all the religious queries of the heart. A disciple should tune in with the will of his guru. Such tuning in of your habit-led and whim-guided will with the wisdom-guided will of your guru is far different from mechanical obedience to an unspiritual guide, no matter whether he is traditionally, religiously, or socially elected. To follow the blind unthinkingly is to fall with them into the ditch of ignorance completely. To follow the awakened if you are blind is to reach the goal without danger. How can you take away the blot from your brother's eyes if there is still a blot in your own? Very few people truly know what freedom of will means. To be compelled to do things by the dictates of your own instincts and habits is not freedom. To be good because you have been so for a long time, and to refrain from evil because you are accustomed to do so is not freedom. When your will is perfectly free to choose good instead of evil any time anywhere because you really feel good, you will know real happiness, then indeed are you free. Evil gives only sorrow. When the influences of heredity, prenatal and postnatal habits, family, social and world environment, all cease to influence your judgment, when you can act, guided only by your highest inner intuitive discrimination, then only are you free. Until then the way to all righteousness lies in tuning in your whim-guided will with the wisdom-guided will of your guru. Harnessing your will to wisdom, you will cease to be swayed by prejudice and error, for you will then always be guided by righteousness. Hence, the first requisite in your spiritual path lies, not entirely in going to church services and being a passive member, satisfied merely with listening to sermons, but also in finding your spiritual guru who will lead you as far along the spiritual path as you wish to go. Having found him, follow him closely, obey him with intelligent devotion, and practice what he teaches you. Thus, ultimately, you will attain your highest goal, the baptism of Jesus by water and by the Holy Ghost. The Gospel tells us that John the Baptist had said to the people, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus, being high in spiritual advancement, obeyed the law of temporary purity signified by baptism by water. But immediately following his baptism by water, he was also baptized by the Spirit. The real, advanced Kuru asks his disciple first to bathe his body with water, and then after the body feels the influence of temporary cleanliness and purity, he baptizes him with spirit. But sometimes it has happened that when the disciple is further advanced, as Jesus was, and the Guru, like John the Baptist, not so far advanced, then the Spirit of God uses the Holy Ghost to baptize the advanced disciple through the medium of the divine agent, the Guru, even though he is less advanced in spirituality than his disciple. A guru must be wise, but sometimes a guru of past incarnations is in this life less advanced in wisdom than the disciple. Sometimes it is given him to redeem a disciple more spiritually advanced than himself. A guru being the agent of salvation appointed by God, must take the disciple through successive incarnations if necessary until complete salvation of the disciple is reached. A great secret of understanding lies in the reason for the less advanced Guru, John, initiating as his disciple the so greatly advanced Savior of mankind, Jesus. In his past incarnations John the Baptist had been appointed as the agent to be the original Guru of Jesus. In the dim past, when John was first sent by God as the Guru of Jesus in response to his prayers, 
the guru consciousness of John was more advanced than the disciple consciousness of Jesus. At that time the souls of John the Baptist and of Jesus were eternally bound together by the law of unconditional divine friendship, and both at this long ago first meeting as guru and disciple had made the resolution, we will be friends forever, striving for one another's perfection until both of us redeem our omnipresence, now locked behind the bars of flesh. So as time went on and many incarnations passed, by a superior effort, the soul of Jesus advanced further than did the soul of John. Jesus knew that the soul of the prophet Elias or Elijah was his guru preceptor of former incarnations, and that it had reincarnated in the body of John the Baptist. The prophet Elias, who was much more highly advanced than Jesus when he first became his disciple, later on, through the irony of his own karmic law actions of past lives, had lessened in spirituality, and thus had the power to baptize with water only. By intuition John the Baptist knew of the coming of Jesus Christ, yet having less spirituality for a time he forgot he was once Elias. After the baptism of Jesus, John was informed of this fact, for Elias has come already. But John the Baptist knew that Jesus, though now so far advanced as to become the Redeemer of the world, was this disciple of former incarnations, and thus he predicted, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier that I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus was now more advanced than John the Baptist, yet he accepted him as his guru preceptor of former incarnations, the agent first sent be God to enter with him into this spiritual, divine covenant and this divinely ordained friendship. We will be divine friends forever until our souls by mutual help and the lasting goodwill of many incarnations break the bubble walls off caging desires and set free our imprisoned omnipresence to become one with the sea of infinitude. This is why Jesus said, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness, and why he chose to be baptized by John with water according to the ancient custom. It is very interesting then to note how the Spirit of God used the Holy Ghost for the spiritual baptism of Jesus. Real gurus know not only how to baptize with water but also with Spirit or the Holy Ghost. But alas! Many Hindus in their temples, and many Christians in their churches are baptized only with water, temporarily experiencing good physical baptism, but knowing and perceiving nothing of those marvelous soul-renewing experiences of spiritual baptism. Ministers in churches and priests in temples are oftentimes chosen only by virtue of their intellectual study of the scriptures and sacerdotal authority conferred on them by ceremonies, performed by formerly higher spiritual authority. But real ministers and priests who are fit to be gurus train first their inner selves in the theological school of intuition and meditation. They must spiritually baptize themselves first before they can aspire to baptize others at all. They teach their disciples not for mundane gains, but being impelled by God, they baptize them spiritually. It is admirable to lecture and teach good principles, but without becoming a real guru one cannot redeem souls nor should he accept others as disciples until he has progressed far himself. Once the true relationship of guru and disciple is established there will be no more blind spiritual gropings, roaming, or partings because of admonition on the part of the guru, or for any other reason. Usually there is instantaneous recognition between guru preceptor and disciple, but sometimes it takes long to remember consciously that past close friendship or to recognize the forgotten memory of past incarnations, so long buried beneath ash heaps of ignorance. Know also that one cannot be a guru by self-choice, he must be ordained to serve and save others by a real guru, or else he must hear in reality the voice of God asking him to redeem others. Many become self-appointed gurus after reading a few occult books, and listening to the voice of their own misguided imagination or their falsely imaginative subconscious mind. The many kings of baptism described. If you bathe every day and meditate immediately thereafter, 
if you are near a river or a lake surrounded by God's scenic grandeur and you bathe in them with the consciousness of purity, then you will feel the power of baptism by water. Water opens the pores of the skin, letting out the disturbing body poisons, calming and soothing the circulatory system. Baptism by Water Water cools the nerve endings and sends reports of cool sensations throughout the vital centers, balancing evenly all the vital energies. All life came primarily from energy, then from nebulae, then from water. All seeds of life are irrevocably connected with water. Physical life cannot exist without it. Baptism by Feeling if you love poetry and are much in the company of a great poet, he will baptize you with those clean, wholesome feelings and the appreciation of good in everything which are aroused always by good poesy. Such baptism by feeling makes one imaginative and sympathetic. Baptism by moral consciousness or self-control. If you associate long with men of high morality and self-control you will feel automatically an influence of moral consciousness and self-control in your life. Business Baptism If purposely and attentively you associate with great creative business minds, you will be baptized or saturated with the consciousness of creative business. Baptism by the Holy Ghost the human body is a collective vibration of grossly stirring atoms and electrons an intelligent life force finer than electrons. The soul a reflection of spirit while dwelling within it cannot remember its omnipresent state. But by meditation one can hear the vibration of the body by closing the ears. As taught in the original precept a given meditation technique, and then tune it in with the cosmic mind which emanates from the vibration of all atoms and life force. The Christian Bible says, God is the word, cosmic, intelligent, sounding vibration. Sage Panda Jolly, greatest of Hindu yogis, says, The Spirit, God the Father, or Aswara, manifests himself as the cosmic vibration or matter. Spirit was made flesh for the intelligent spirit materializes itself into gross flesh by changing its rate of vibration. Cosmic intelligence becomes cosmic intelligent motion, or vibration, which changes into cosmic energy. This intelligent cosmic energy changes into electrons and atoms. Electrons and atoms change into gas, sometimes known as comic nebulae. Cosmic nebulae, or masses of diffused gaseous matter, change into water. Water changes into solid matter. Man's body is a part this variously divided matter. In cosmic vibration all things are one, but when cosmic vibration becomes frozen into matter, then it becomes many. So man's body, being separated from cosmic vibration, again must retrace the various states of higher vibrations in order to lift his consciousness from the vibrations of breath, heart, and circulation to the vibrating sound emanating from cosmic life force in all atoms. With closed eyes, one can feel his consciousness limited by feelings of the flesh and by the sounds of breath, heart, and circulation. But by deep meditation, as taught in the original precept a given meditation technique, the precept a student can hear the voice of cosmic sound emanating from all atoms and sparks of cosmic energy. By listening to this omnipresent sound the consciousness of the body caged soul begins gradually to spread itself from the limitations of the body into omnipresence. One listening to this cosmic sound will find his consciousness spreading with it to limitlessness. This cosmic sound, emanating from cosmic vibration, is called the Holy Ghost. Ghost signifies an intelligent, invisible, conscious force or intelligent cosmic vibration. It is holy because the immanent outflowing consciousness of God the Father, or Christ intelligence, guides it to create all finite matter. The ancients not versed in the polished language of modern times, used Holy Ghost and Word for intelligent cosmic vibration, which is the first materialization of God the Father in matter. The Hindus speak of this Holy Ghost as the Aum. A stands for a car or creative vibration, U for Ukar or preservative vibration, and M from a car or destructive vibration. 
The storm roar of the sea creates the waves, preserves them for some time as larger or smaller waves, and then dissolves them. So the cosmic sound of Alm or Holy Ghost creates all things as nebulae, preserves them in the forms of the present cosmos and worlds, and ultimately will dissolve all things in the bosom sea of God. But this cosmic dissolution is sometimes only partial and temporary, and again sometimes it is complete and for a long time. In the partial temporary dissolution, portions only of matter and worlds are dissolved, but in complete dissolution the entire system of universes, all stars and planets, all things are dissolved. But the dissolving off all creation is impossible until all souls cease to desire anything at all, and thus become fully emancipated in God. Unredeemed souls desire life, and with it they desire the earth, the sky, and its starry beauties. So, in order to fulfill our desire for children, souls come on earth as fleshly human beings. Alm has to create the entire universe at the behest of God the Father. Because of the endless rise and dissolution of the desires of creatures, their universe is endlessly being dissolved and recreated again. Hence, baptism by the Holy Ghost means first the dissolution of all wrong desires by good desires, and then the conquering of all good desires by an only desire for the blessed contact of God. To know God is not the negation of all desires, but instead their complete fulfillment. Men of the world strive wrongly to fulfill desires by forgetting to distinguish between those of the world and those of the soul. Just as by feeding somebody else your hunger cannot be satisfied, so by wrongly trying to satisfy the senses your soul can never be happy. Senses crave indulgence, greed, and temptations to excite and amuse them, whereas soul can be satisfied only by the calmness, peace, and bliss born of meditation and the moderate use of the sense servants. Ambition for good things, noble achievements, and spiritual organizational work, serving the many, must be instituted to displace desires for selfishness and greed and for helping only one's own self or one's immediate family. Enjoy all good work and achievements with God. By contacting God in the world and in meditation you will find all your heart's desires fulfilled. Then you will be a true man of renunciation, for you will find that nothing is more worthwhile, more pleasant or attractive than the all-beautiful, all-satisfying, all-thirst-quenching ever-new joyous God. Desire for one object alone keeps your consciousness tied to that object. Love for all things as the expression of God keeps man's consciousness expanded in omnipresence. So when baptized by the Holy Ghost must be unattached, enjoying good things only with the joyousness of God within. He must learn first to hear through touch the am or cosmic sound. First, by the precept to given technique of meditation, as taught in the original precept to lessons, he hears the sound of Holy Ghost when all bodily and astral sounds cease. Then by deeper meditation on this sound, by higher processes learned from the Guru, he can be one with the sound and touch it. Then after touching or feeling it, by still higher methods, the spiritual aspirant will find his consciousness vibrating simultaneously in his body and in several continents. As he progresses further by deeper and longer meditation, he will find his consciousness vibrating simultaneously in his body in the earth, the planets, the universes, and in every particle of matter. The intelligent holy vibration, or the first manifestation of God the Father therefore manifests as the cosmic sound of Aum or Amen, which can be heard in meditation. It also manifests itself as cosmic energy in all matter. All earthly sounds and the sounds of the body, the heart, lungs, etc., come from the cosmic sound of Aum. Aum contains all the sounds of the nine octaves perceptible to the human ear as well as all cosmic sounds, low or high, which cannot be registered in the human ear. So also all forms of earthly lights, coal light, gas light, electric light, astral light, come from cosmic energy. Cosmic sound manifests as cosmic energy and vice versa. 
This cosmic sound manifests as the astral sounds of harps, bells, etc., microcosmic cosmic energy in the astral body of man. So also this cosmic energy exists as the reflected, luminous or astral body of man. Higher lessons of precept to teaching can teach one to hear and locate the astral sounds emanating from the spinal cord. The physical body is condensed cosmic energy. The astral body is also condensed cosmic energy. The physical body has two eyes, positive and negative, due to the law of relativity. The astral body has only one eye, which is variously named. The spiritual eye, the single eye the Christian Bible, the third eye the Hindu Bible, the star of the East, the star of wisdom, the dove descending from heaven, the inner eye, the intuitive eye, Shiva's eye, the star through which the wise men saw, etc., etc. During the baptism by the Holy Ghost, as perceived by Jesus Christ, he perceived it as a cosmic sound or heaven, and the spiritual eye as the dove. This spiritual eye is a spiritual telescope with three rays as its lenses. The outer circle is golden. The inner lens of light is blue and is studded with a five-pointed silver star as the third ray. The microcosmic cosmic energy microcosmically manifests in the human body as the specific reflected life energy or the astral body. The spiritual or astral eye is the eye of the astral body. The astral eye is the individualized cosmic energy in the human body. In meditation, first the life force must be withdrawn from the body and must cross the portals of cosmic energy represented by the golden ring then it must plunge in the blue light representing Christ consciousness. Then it must penetrate through the silver star representing spirit in the region of the infinite. These three, golden, blue, and silver light, contain all walls of rays of ultraviolet, electronic, and atomic rays, rays of cosmic energy through which on has to penetrate before one can reach heaven. The golden halo and the blue central light are two wings of the dove, and the little white star represents the mouth of the dove. The outer golden light is the Holy Ghost or cosmic energy or nature. The blue represents God the Son or Christ, and the silver star represents God Father. So Jesus, during his baptism, saw the cosmic energy manifested in bodily shape or materialized out of the ether as the telescopic spiritual astral eye, and out of that spiritual eye representing the cosmic energy came a voice, or intelligent, all creative, cosmic sound, saying, or vibrating, an intelligible voice for all language comes from the Holy Ghost, Thou art my son or my manifestation, I am glad thou hast risen lifted thy consciousness from matter, and tuned in with my omnipresence. All material human beings are prodigal sons who have left the home of omnipresent Holy Ghost and have identified themselves with the infinitely smaller territory of the human body. This Holy Ghost is the great comforter. Being guided by the universal, reflected, God consciousness, it contains the all-coveted bliss of God. One filled with this Holy Ghost or Holy Vibration can talk with the diverse tongues of inspirations of men, animals, and atoms. Since all languages are productions of the Holy Ghost, when man can hear, touch, and spread an alm or cosmic sound emanating from Holy Ghost, then can understand or utter all languages, not only men, but also of all animals and all atoms too. Holy Ghost, Am of the Hindus, the Mohammedan Amen, the Christian Amen, voice of many waters, word are the same thing. Am is called the word because the word signifies cosmic intelligent vibratory sound which is the origin of all sounds and languages. This intelligent cosmic vibration or word is the first manifestation of God in creation. On the day of Pentecost the disciples were filled with the new wine of joy coming from the touch of Alm, or the comforting holy vibration, and they could talk in divers tongues. Such were some of the experiences of Jesus after his baptism by the Holy Ghost, 
and such can be the experiences of precept to students now if they study the precept to lessons, and do not forget them, but continue to practice them constantly and continually in real life as the years roll by. More on Baptism by the Holy Ghost Man is a combination of body, life, force, and consciousness. His consciousness is a reflection of Christ consciousness. His life force is a reflection of cosmic energy. His body is condensed cosmic energy and life energy. Consciousness, life force, and the body are the different rates of conscious, cosmic vibration. Life force vibrating more finely becomes cosmic consciousness and life force when it vibrates grossly, changes into electrons, atoms, molecules, and bodily flesh. After all, the human body, life force, and consciousness being three different vibrations are held together by the nucleus of ego and soul. Man is condensed miniature vibration. In order to free the soul from the cage of the threefold vibrations of body, life force, and consciousness, it has to be baptized or united with the original cosmic vibration of Aum. When the wave feels itself isolated from the sea then, the boundaries of the wave must be expanded until they take on the shape of the sea. In the same way when the soul feels itself confined in the physical, astral, and ideational bodies, it should be taught how to detach itself consciously from three bodies and become expanded into spirit. By the highest meditation the body loosens its atomic vibrations and becomes life force, and by deeper meditation, the astral body becomes elaborated into the ideational body. Then by wisdom the ideational consciousness becomes expanded into Christ consciousness. But it must be remembered that when the yogi or precept a student listens to cosmic vibration, his mind is diverted from the physical sounds of matter outside his body to the circulatory sounds of the vibrating flesh. Then his consciousness is diverted from the vibrations of the body to the musical vibrations of the astral body. Then his consciousness wanders from the vibrations of the astral body to the vibrations of consciousness in all atoms. Then the consciousness of the yogi listens to the Holy Ghost or cosmic sound emanating from all atoms. This is the way that ordinary consciousness should be baptized or expanded into Christ consciousness through the expanding power of the Holy Ghost or the all-spreading alm vibrating sound heard in meditation by the practice of the meditation technique taught in the precept to lessons. When you utter alm it travels not only all around the earth, but throughout all space and eternity. So the sound emanating from the vibration of all atoms is called the Holy Ghost or the sacred vibration. As above said, when by the practice of the precept a given meditation technique, one is able to shut out sounds of matter, his consciousness passes through the vibrating sounds of the body and through the musical astral sounds to the sound of Aum or the Holy Ghost. When the yogi's consciousness is able not only to hear this cosmic sound but also to feel its actual presence in every unit of space, in all finite vibrating matter, then the soul of the yogi becomes one with the Holy Ghost or Holy Vibration. Jesus, the Savior, a yogi having met his guru of former lives, preceptor, Saint John, was baptized by this omnipresent sound of Aum, and he also saw with it the spiritual dove, or the light with the two wings of golden and blue color representing vibrating creation and Christ consciousness, and the silvery starry mouth representing spirit. Baptism by Christ Consciousness This voice of the omnipresent vibration of Aum signified Thou art my Son. Jesus felt his consciousness attuned to the Christ Consciousness or the only begotten reflection of God the Father's intelligence in the holy vibration. In other words, Jesus first felt his body as the entire vibratory creation in which his little body was included. Then feeling his cosmic, finite body, he felt that within the cosmic body of all creation there was a Christ or universal intelligence. This Christ is the only begotten Son, because it is the only active reflected intelligence of the indirectly active, transcendental lying beyond creative vibration God the Father, in vibratory creation. As the husband is reborn and the wife as the son, so God the Father transcendental intelligence 
is reflected in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the Virgin Creation, as the only begotten Son, or Christ Consciousness. The illustrations on the next pages serves best to illustrate Spirit, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In figure A, the Son is seen to exist by itself without anything surrounding it. Such a sun can be described as a bright mass of light with power and heat spreading its rays into space. But in figure B, the sun is found to be active, existing in relation to the blue crystal ball. In this figure, the sunlight is divided as the inactive ball, and the active light appearing as blue light in the blue crystal ball. This division of the one sunlight into white and blue light is possible due to the dividing effect of the third object, the blue crystal ball. So the sun is one without any object around it, and with an object around it becomes divided into two lights. Just as the sun is bright and spherically spreads its rays in space when it stands by itself without any surrounding creation, so the spirit as in fig. He is called the unmanifested absolute. When no goblin nebulae breathed and glided in the space body, when no fire-eyed baby planets opened their eyes in the cradle of space, when the ocean of space was unpeopled, uninhabited by floating island universes, when the sun and moon and planetary families did not swim in space, when the little ball of earth with its doll houses and little human beings did not exist, when no object of any kind had come into being, spirit existed. This spirit in its unmanifested form cannot be described except that it was the knower, the known, and all the objects known which existed as one. In it the being, its cosmic consciousness and its powers, all were one without differentiation. It could be described as the ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new joyous spirit. Spirit is ever-new bliss. There was even no space, for the spirit did not exist in space or time. There was no dual conception or law of relativity in spirit. It was everything that there was, is, or is to be. Space and time are categories of objects. As soon as a human being sees a planet hanging in the sky, then he conceives that the planet is occupying dimensional space and existing in time. But when there were no finite objects in creation, neither was there space nor time, but only the blissful spirit existed. But when the sun falls on a blue crystal ball its light suffers formal change and division. The unmanifested spirit felt, I am alone. I am conscious bliss, but there is no one to taste me. Even as he thus dreamed, he became many. Spirit was invisible, existing alone in the home of all space. He piped to himself the ever-new, ever-entertaining song of perfect, beatific bliss. As he sang through his voice of eternity to himself, he wondered if aught but himself were listening and enjoying his song. To his astonishment, he felt he was the cosmic song, and he was the singing. Even as thus he thought, lo, he became too, spirit and nature, man and woman, positive and negative, stamen and pistil of the flowers, peacock and peahen, male gem and female gem. The spirit evolves itself as three. Thus in fig. D. The spirit is seen as divided into three. As soon as the cosmic, bachelor spirit becomes active and creates the universe, he is no longer spirit, but the husband, God the Father, wedded to the Virgin Mary or cosmic vibration. Matter cannot be different from spirit. Spirit being the only substance that there was when he wanted to create, he had no substance but himself to create with, for if there were two substances, spirit and matter, then both could not be infinite and all-powerful. Thus spirit having nothing else but itself began to create a magic delusion or the cosmic magical measure, which made the infinite look like the finite, even as the calm ocean becomes distorted into ripples on its surface by the action of a storm. So all vibratory creation is nothing but frozen spirit. Spirit dreamed a vibratory universe or Holy Ghost and it was there. All forms of matter are different rates of vibrating spirit thought. Thought of matter, energy, all matter, all things are nothing but the differently vibrating thoughts of the spirit, 
even as man in his dreams creates a world with lightning and clouds, people being born or dying, loving or fighting and experiencing heat or cold. All the births and deaths, sickness and disease, solids, liquids or gases in a dream are nothing but the differently vibrating thoughts of the dreamer. This universe is a motion picture of God's thoughts on the screen of human consciousness. Spirit evolves the holy vibration around. So all things, all created planets and living beings in the Holy Ghost or holy vibration are nothing but the frozen imagination of God. This Holy Ghost in the Hindu Bibles is called the Aum, but by the scientists it is known as cosmic vibration. The spirit, therefore, could not create matter as anything different from itself, for it had only itself as the tissue or material with which to build the cosmos. God the Father As soon as the spirit evolved a cosmic vibratory thought, through the action of the cosmic magical measuring power of delusion, it became condensed into cosmic energy. Cosmic energy then became condensed into the material cosmos with solid, liquid, and gaseous substances. After creating the ideational, astral and physical vibration or Holy Ghost, the uncreated, unmanifested Spirit became God the Father. Spirit became the creator of all creative vibration. This God the Father is called the Sat in the Hindu Bibles, and is the transcendental intelligence, according to metaphysical science. This virgin vibratory creation, or Holy Ghost, became the consort of God the Father, that is, God the Father existed transcendentally, or outside the vibratory creation as a conscious, separate cosmic consciousness, just as the sunlight remains around and beyond the crystal ball as in fig. B. It should be noted that all human similes are imperfect since by their material nature they are limited and cannot exemplify spiritual truths except in a limited way. It should be noted also that the sun does not create the crystal ball, whereas the spirit as God the Father evolved the Holy Ghost as in fig. D. In order to divide itself the spirit first differentiated itself as God, the Father and the Holy Ghost vibration creation of the only begotten Son or Christ. Then the Spirit found that the Holy Ghost could not sustain itself just by its inactive omnipresence, so it made itself manifest as the active Christ intelligence in all vibratory creation to create, recreate, preserve, and mold it according to its divine purpose. So the distinct, active, differentiated, conscious intelligence, existing in all specks of vibratory creation, or Holy Ghost, is called the only begotten Christ's Son. It must be remembered that Christ consciousness in all specks of creation is the only existing reflection of God the Father. Hence, Christ intelligence is spoken of as the only begotten Son. The Christian Church has failed to differentiate between Jesus the body and Jesus the vehicle in which the only begotten Son, or Christ consciousness, was manifested. Jesus himself said that he was not speaking of his body as the only begotten Son, but of his soul which was not circumscribed by the body, but was one with the only begotten Son, Christ consciousness in all specks of vibration. God so loved the world or matter, that he gave his only begotten Son to redeem it, that is, God the Father remained hidden as Christ intelligence in all matter and in all living beings in order to bring all things by beautiful evolutional coaxings back to his home of all blessedness, when they should overcome all mortal tests and should reincarnate in matter no more. In other words, go no more out. Jesus said to all those that received him to then he gave the power to become the sons of God. The plural number in sons of God shows distinctly from his own lips that not his body but his spirit was the only begotten Son, and all those could become sons of God who could clarify their consciousness by meditation and receive, or in an unobstructed way reflect the power of God. In other words they could be one with the only begotten reflection in all matter, and become sons of God like Jesus. Before Jesus came, sage Bayasa, writer of the Hindu Bible, Bhagavad Gita, was a son of God, 
and knew how to be one with the only begotten reflection or key taste the Chaitanya, the undistorted consciousness existing in all vibratory creation. So also Swami Shankara, the founder of the Swami Order of Renunciation about 700 AD, Babaji Lahiri Mahaseya, Sri Yukteswar, my guru, and others having Christ consciousness were sons of God. The Spirit could not be partial in creating one as Jesus and all others as mortal beings. A divinely imported Jesus could be made by the thousands by God and they would, being predestined, naturally behave on earth as Christs, as spiritual puppets of God. Such Christs could not be the ideals of struggling mortals with all their frailties. But when we see a man who by self-struggle and proper use of his God-given free choice and power of meditation become a Christ, then we can stir hope of salvation in the weak, matter-tortured, fear-malign, timorous, frail, human breast. Just as the husband is born again and the wife as the son, so inactive God the Father, active and manifest in Holy Ghost became the only reflected, only begotten Son. Therefore it should be remembered by the precept of student that after listening to and feeling the cosmic sound in all the physical, astral, and ideational cosmos, or in the physical, astral, and ideational Holy Ghost, his consciousness becomes stable in all creation, it feels the presence of Christ consciousness in all vibration. Then the precept of student becomes Christ-like, his consciousness experiences the second coming of Christ, he feels in his vehicle the presence of Christ consciousness as Jesus felt Christ expressed in his body. All human beings find their consciousness hide bound by the body, but by listening to and feeling the am vibration and intuitive Christ consciousness the yogi realizes that God the Father's cosmic consciousness exists inactively in regions where there is no motion or presence of the Holy Ghost vibration. For the Holy Ghost vibration is limited only to a certain tract of space which is peopled by the cosmos and all island universes. Holy vibration is condensed into planetary creation. When the precept student feels his consciousness one with Christ consciousness, he realizes that Christ consciousness is nothing but the reflection of the cosmic consciousness of God the Father. Then the precept a student, like Jesus, can say I Christ consciousness in creation and my Father cosmic consciousness beyond creation are one. As the white light beyond the blue crystal ball and the blue light and the crystal ball are the same, so also the cosmic consciousness God the Father, existing beyond all vibratory, Holy Ghost creation and the Christ consciousness Kites the Chaitanya, in all vibratory creation are the same. When vibratory creation exists, God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost exist. When by cosmic dissolution greater than Noah's flood, which was only partial dissolution, or when by universal dissolution the holy vibration is dissolved, then automatically God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost become reconverted into the one unmanifested, absolute spirit. Chapter 3 Why Jesus Was Tempted by the Devil the cosmic struggle. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. Jesus the man had become one with the holy vibration. His body was one with all creation, in which his little body moved. His consciousness was Christ consciousness, but until the body goes beyond the Christ state and becomes one with the Father, and until the complete union of body, Holy Ghost, Christ consciousness, and God consciousness are perceived as one spirit, mortal tests born of past delusion remain. Although Jesus was one with the Holy Ghost, still his old limited human consciousness and its earthly desires, through the law of habit, tried to attract his expanded consciousness to earthly consciousness. This is the psychological explanation of the origin of the tempting, by the firmly established bad mortal habits, of the new divine habit, in order to keep him from contacting the great comforter. All satisfaction comes from holy vibration, for it is the sum total of all earthly things looked for. Since pleasure is evil because it limits the soul, blinds it, and keeps it from seeking the unlimited happiness in the universal sensorium of the Holy Ghost. 
The Spirit alone is perfect. Everything else in creation is imperfect. Creation started with the law of duality, with the law of division. Spirit was perfect. Nothing else was necessary for his perfection, hence creation was unnecessary for his evolution. Then why did Spirit create it all? The only answer to that question is that he wanted to consciously enjoy himself. The Spirit thought, I am the very nectar of bliss, but there is no one to enjoy me, so I will create a cosmic play and divide myself into many, then myself as many selves gradually with many mouths of minds may taste the nectar in my infinite self. This cosmic play came out of the Spirit's desireless desire. That is, this desire for cosmic play was unnecessary to complete the Spirit's being, for he was already perfect. But this cosmic desire itself was imperfect, for it was an urge, a desire to do something. Just as poison does not affect the serpent, so this cosmic delusive desire existing in spirit does not affect him. This cosmic desire of spirit was an unnecessary desire, just as sometimes a father may play with his child through a desireless desire which is unnecessary for the father's development. It was imperfect because it wanted to accomplish something when that accomplishment was not necessary for the completion of the all-perfect spirit. This imperfect desire was the original thought vibration which divided the spirit into many through the law of duality. Besides, the spirit at first found that he alone, being the only substance existent, could not very well divide himself into two distinct essentially different objects of spirit and matter. So the spirit created the differentiation between spirit and matter in thought only, just as a piece of stone and a thought of a piece of stone in a dream have no essential difference except in the difference existing in frozen human imagination. Thus the spirit had to practice a cosmic deception, a universal mental magic to perform before the duality of matter and mind and the dualities of finite objects. This delusive cosmic differentiation in thought is responsible for all imperfections in creation. Then again, according to the law of cause and effect, the small cells which came out of spirit were specially gifted with the power of free choice and independent action even as spirit possessed. This cosmic delusive will thus inherited the power and free choice of spirit to act independently of his perfect will. As the one sheet of water of the calm sea is chopped into many miniature pieces of water called waves by the action of a third agent, the wind storm, so the conscious cosmic, delusive, desireless desire of spirit manifested itself as the independent conscious magical measure, or the Maya cosmic measure of delusion of the Hindu scriptures, and was solely entrusted with the independent power of superficially dividing the spirit into the perception of perfect finite objects materialized as icebergs of planets and wavelets of stars, floating on the vast sea of infinity. This cosmic delusive magical measure has ever since manifested itself as the Holy Ghost, the cosmic sacred vibration, or nature Sanskrit Prakriti. The plan of spirit was that this subjective conscious cosmic delusive force should be endowed with independence in order to cooperate with objectified conscious cosmic vibration in objectified conscious cosmic energy and with only reflected Christ intelligence present in it to create perfect finite objects, perfect gems and mines, perfect flowers, perfect animals and human stars in perfect planets were thus created. These perfect objects, after displaying a flawless stream of perfect form, health, habits, and modes of existence on the stage of time, without disease or painful premature death or cruel accidents, were to dissolve back into spirit, just as numerous waves after a separate happy existence without the necessity of being killed or shattered by accidents dissolve back into their one self, the sea at the end of the storm. That is why in the Christian Bible we find the perfect Adam and Eve communing with God, so easily and simply, under the tree and near the altar. 
They were only cast away from the paradise of cosmic consciousness when they were tempted by the devil of cosmic ignorance. According to God's plan, the flower, plant, animals, and human cells were to live recharged by cosmic energy and not cruelly feed on one another. Then after a perfect existence, a perfect expression and pleasant mutual entertainment, without suffering, all created forms were to dissolve back into him. Just as rainbows come and go, just as forms of flowers, animals, and human bodies can be created by electrical devices and moving pictures for entertainment and switched on or off at will, so all living creatures and all created things were to exist like mutually entertaining vitaphone pictures on the screen of space, and were to disappear in God at the end of their cycle, after the drama of that period was perfectly played. This conscious cosmic delusive force, receiving independent power from God, found that all things and all living forms after a perfect existence began to dissolve back into the cosmic energy. In this way the cosmic delusive force began to think that, inasmuch as the cosmic energy manifestations of the Holy Ghost or Holy Vibration were to dissolve back into spirit, it must itself cease existing with the disappearance of the holy vibration. Just as the storm disappears when waves dissolve into the sea, so with the withdrawal of holy vibration, the cosmic delusive force would have to lose its separate existence. This thought frightened the cosmic delusive force, the force which aims to keep things in manifestation, and ever since. He has rebelled. Before this the cosmic delusive force was considered an archangel of God and was in a friendly manner cooperating with Christ's intelligence and holy vibration in creating perfect finite objects. It was at this period that the cosmic delusive force fell from heaven in this form of lightning and began to act in apparent opposition to Christ's intelligence and conscious cosmic holy vibration. The falling of Satan as lightning from heaven signifies that originally all cosmic energy being vibrated by the Holy Ghost and Christ intelligence was flowing Godward, then the creative, cosmic delusive force, fearing complete withdrawal of all energy back into God, began to turn the flow of cosmic energy away from his heavenly presence toward finite creation. Just as when waves want to fall back into the sea, a fresh storm can compel them to retain their forms, so the cosmic delusive force became rebellious and began, through the mundane desire of beings, arising from imperfect living to slap them back into finite existence through the law of reincarnation. Reincarnation was started by Satan, so the human beings would have to come back again and again to earth until they could lose their imperfect desire to stay on earth and could finally go back to spirit. Ever since creating the law of reincarnation, the cosmic delusive force has tortured the immortal souls of the children of God by forcibly imprisoning them again and again behind the bars of painful flesh and making them stay away from their kingdom of omnipresence. By creating the law of reincarnation or punishment by law of cause and effect which law governs human actions law of karma, the archangel of God, the cosmic delusive force, converted himself into the rebellious Satan. Since then this conflict has existed between the God-tuned, universal, only begotten Son of Christ intelligence, the Holy Ghost, and the matter-bent lover of finite creation, Satan. Jesus, possessing Christ consciousness, realized the tug of war between the perfect, universally intelligent, holy vibration and the satanic pull or imperfection toward finite creation. Ever since his rebellion, Satan has created imperfect patterns, representing evil, disease, pain, and catastrophe to disturb the desireless, perfect existence of human beings who were destined to return to God after perfectly playing his cosmic drama, inaugurated to entertain his immortal children. Human beings, disturbed by disease, wanted perfect health, but were cut off by premature death. They wanted to live long, therefore Satan created in them earthbound desires, and Satan also deluded them into indulging in mental desires which would bring them back again and again under his dominance by the pernicious law of reincarnation. 
Satan began to create imperfect patterns of plants, infested trees, and diseased human beings in order to foil the perfect patterns of perfect plants, healthy trees, and wholesome human beings instituted by God through holy vibration acting in consonance with Christ's intelligence. How Satan Creates Death, Disease, and Disturbance Many modern scriptural interpreters, unable to understand why Christ himself introduced the idea of the existence of Satan, have tried to explain away the old conception of a devil by saying it is obsolete, that evil does not exist, or that God does know no evil. Such interpreters, unable to solve the problem of how it was possible for evil to originate in God, who is only good, have gone to the extreme of denying the existence of evil. In the first place, let me say that the denial of the power of evil has some good points, although it is childish to deny the existence and temptations of evil in this world of seeming duality. Even if the conscious evil force of Satan does exist, it could not influence human minds if we did not mentally accept it. It is better to know all the lures of evil and the ways to combat them than to be blind and deny their existence. Knowledge only and not indifference can produce final emancipation. The great drama of cosmic existence has endowed man with free choice and the power of reason. Man, the image of God, has the same liberty or free choice in his sphere as God the Father has. If God is almighty and knows that we are suffering, why does he, being almighty and eternally blessed, allow weaklings to suffer from the temptations of evil? The answer is that after receiving independence, the cosmic force began to fill creation with patterns of imperfections, displacing the perfect patterns of God's first plan. God then destroyed all creation, as described in Genesis, but seemingly he found himself illogically using his almighty power in arbitrarily destroying creation. Also he seemed to be contradicting his own laws, inasmuch as he destroyed the power of Satan after once giving him independence of action. Then God created again, and reinstated the original power of independent free choice which he gave to Satan and to all creation. God could destroy Satan even now and free us at once from the thraldom of earthly miseries, imperfections, broken hearts, and death by using his almighty material force, but he would not do that because that would be taking away our independence. Since God gave independence to man and Satan, he can free them only through teaching them the right use of their own power of free choice. God is enjoying his eternal blessed state in selfish happiness, but he is suffering for our miserable tragic existence, delayed evolution on earth, and belated return to the paradise of all emancipating wisdom. He is continuously trying to use the superior force of divine love expressed as the parental, friendly, filial, all-surrendering pure conjugal love to coax man to forsake his cooperation with evil, which helps and strengthens it to destroy him. Man stands in the middle with God on one side and Satan on the other side, each ready to pull him in whichever direction he wishes to go. It is up to man to signal God or Satan as to which direction he wants to be pulled. Man is perfectly free to act without being influenced by God or Satan, but whenever he does act right or as a pure, ennobling thought, that is the signal to God, and he is automatically pulled toward God, but as soon as man thinks or acts evil, he is automatically pulled toward Satan. However, being essentially an image of God, Man can never be eternally drowned in the Hades of evil. No matter how persistently sinful man is, he can never suffer eternal punishment. Evil promises happiness and results only in unhappiness. As soon as man realizes this, then he begins to wish for emancipation and for God. This wish for goodness and freedom serves as a portal through which God is again invited to come into the life of the prodigal son and lead him to the abode of freedom. Even fathomless evil cannot destroy man's soul, for he is essentially immortal and eternally good. Evil is a temporary parasite. 
All evil is a passive graft, a temporary parasite on the tree of life, which can be amputated by the knife of wisdom possessed by man. Whenever man initiates good actions, he is proceeding toward a paradise of bliss, hidden in the womb of eternal futurity. God is coaxing us with an array of limitless good happenings, and is influencing us for our own welfare, whereas Satan is tempting us with pleasant-looking but fleeting happiness producing patterns of evil. Satan's patterns are temptations because they are deceptive contrivances created to consciously delude us by promising us good and giving us evil instead. According to the dual conception of good and evil God and Satan, it becomes easy to understand why there is so much good, together with so much evil. The sky and earth are full of the productions of God's patterns of perfection and Satan's patterns of imperfection to influence man. The beautiful sunshine, clouds, and rain are created by God to benefit man. Cataclysms, earthquakes, and floods were created by Satan to make man uncomfortable. An eternal display of goodness is materialized in nature and the life of man, proving that God is trying to impress man and influence him to use his free will and return to the abode of bliss. Satan, through deceptive, apparently pleasant contrivances of temporary happiness yielding acts, greed, and lust is trying to keep man tied to this misery making limited earth. Jesus, as a manifestation of God, came to speak of the eternal kingdom of heaven, upon whose threshold no sorrow can tread. Jesus taught that permanent happiness can only be found in God. Satan deludes man into seeking permanent happiness in impermanent material things. God made man immortal. He was to remain on earth as an immortal. He was to behold the drama of change with a changeless immortal mind and after seeing change dancing on the stage of changelessness, he was to return to the bosom of eternal blessedness. Then evil crept in, causing man to concentrate on the changes of life and on outward appearances rather than on the underlying immortality in all things, and thus made him conceive the false idea of death or complete annihilation. The motion picture of a man's life, his birth, life on earth, and death, seen on the screen, produces the joyous consciousness of his birth and the sad concept of his death or end, but satanic ignorance hides from view the motion pictures of man's prenatal life as he joyously began the descent from God, and the joyous return to God as he hurried back after death. Satan has made us forget our prenatal and postnatal experiences, and by showing us for a time this drama of life and then lowering the curtain, it has produced in us the erroneous conception called death. I am not denying the experience of the change called death, but I consider it only as an outwardly moving link in the chain of immortality, all of which is hidden from our view. To say that death or change does not exist is unmetaphysical and erroneous. To forget this dismal, delusive death, man should behold all changes dancing on the bosom of changelessness. Man should behold the changeless ocean of infinity as wavelets of change appearing and disappearing. Supernatural death versus painful death. If Adam and Eve had not transgressed the wishes of God, and their descendants had not allowed themselves to be influenced by hereditary ignorance, then modern man would not have to witness the heartrending painful deaths through accident and disease. Man appeared on earth, being materialized by God, and was to live on earth, beholding the birth, sustenance, growth, and the painless, sorrowless return of the body in complete perfection. Then as it is possible to watch the slow process of a flower budding, growing, and disappearing on the movie screen, so man should behold his life picture on the screen of his consciousness through the stages from childhood to a full-grown individual, and then his disappearance unto God of his own accord by his own power of dematerialization. Man, being out of tune with God, has lost his power of dematerialization, so he is frightened by the screen picture of life prematurely cut off even before he has finished seeing the whole perfect picture of his changeful life. This premature withdrawal of the motion picture of life produces pain due to attachment to those screen pictures of flesh and consciousness, 
and is known in the world as terrible death by pain. We mortals have so many misconceptions about death that it has grown into importance and has fixed in us an idea of annihilation and pain instead of being seen as a phenomena necessary in the successive steps which the soul must follow in order to return from the state of change to the changeless state. It is necessary for death or change to come so that the soul may finish beholding this motion picture of life and be released in order to go back to the home of immortality. Satan saw that it would all be very simple if the immortal children of God, after beholding a perfect earthly existence with a changeless attitude, would go back to immortality again. So Satan made imperfect patterns or tampered with the showing of a perfect picture of life before it was completed and caused mental and bodily pain through delusion. This dissatisfaction, arising from an imperfect, prematurely destroyed picture of life, created in man the desire to see perfect pictures of life in order to behold then until completion. Ever since the immortal images of God forgot their already perfect immortality and began to introduce delusive imperfections in the perfect dramas of life staged on the screen of time. Ever since, immortals have been coming and going from earth by the law of cause and effect which governs desires. Ever since, this law of cause and effect has affected free souls as the law of karma action, which keeps them earthbound. This law of cause and effect, which imprisons souls on earth in Satan's kingdom of finitude, has been called reincarnation. How to destroy reincarnation? Immortal souls can only expect to be free by utterly destroying all seeds of earthly desires by divine contact with God through meditation. This reminds the soul of the unending fulfillment in the immortal inheritances of bliss, which makes desires for earthly ways unnecessary and ridiculous. Emancipation from reincarnation is also possible by playing the living drama of a perfect life of health, abundance, and wisdom on the screen of consciousness. That is, if one can remove the consciousness of sickness and not fear sickness if it does come, and not desire health while suffering from ill health, then one can remember one's soul, which was always well and was neither sick nor healthy. If we can feel and know that we are the children of God, and as such passes everything, even as our Father God does, although we may be poor or rich, we can be free. If we can feel that we have divine knowledge, because we are made in the image of God, although humanly speaking we know little, then we can be free from reincarnation. Fear of sickness and a desire for mortal health, fear of poverty and a desire for opulence, a feeling of lack of knowledge as well as a desire to know everything, belong to the domain of ignorance. Of course if we are stricken with ill health, failure, or ignorance we need not continue to remain so. We should strive for health, prosperity, and wisdom without being afraid of failure. While struggling, man must know that his struggle for health, prosperity, and wisdom is born of delusion, for he already has all he needs within his inner powerful self. It is only because he erroneously imagined, when in spiritually ignorant mortal company, that he did not have these, that is why he lacked them. All he has to do is to think right and not strive to acquire things. He needs only to know that he already has everything. Once a healthy, wealthy, and wise prince dreamed that he was poor, and in the dream he shouted, Oh, I am suffering from cancer and I lost all my wisdom and riches. His wife, the queen, woke up and aroused him, saying, Look, prince, laugh and rejoice, for you are neither suffering from sickness nor have lost riches and wisdom, but you are comfortably lying at my side in health and wisdom in your rich kingdom. You are only dreaming about these catastrophes. So it is with ignorant man. He is dreaming about lack and failure when he might claim his birthright of joy, health, and plenty as a son of the ruler of the universe. He is now living in his perfect kingdom, but is dreaming evil. The constant desire for health and prosperity, which is so much harped upon in modern spiritual organizations, is the way to slavery. We must seek God first and then find health and prosperity through him. Beggars get only a beggar's share, whereas a son of God gets his son's share. That is why Jesus spoke of seeking and knowing the kingdom of God first. 
When that is actually accomplished, then health and prosperity will be added. The acquirement of wisdom and everything else that the soul of man needs will be received as a matter of his divine birthright. It is best to feel by visualization and by divine contact and meditation that you are already perfect in health and wisdom and have abundance, rather than try to succeed by begging for health, prosperity, and wisdom. In fact, man's mortal efforts are bound by the laws of cause and effect. Man cannot get more than he deserves. By the method of begging, no human being can ever fulfill all his endless desires, but by first realizing his oneness with God, man can own everything he needs. Man cannot have immortality by begging for it or by feeling a desire for it. He should know that he is already immortal and that so-called death is only a dream. According to the plan of God, man should have experienced growth from childhood and through youth to manhood, but should never have experienced death by old age or disease. Even if man becomes old, he should never die of disease or suffer painful death. In the drama of life and death, when beheld with divine understanding, there can be no pain in death, but only the showing or stopping of the motion picture of life at will without physical or mental pain. Origin of Pain The outward flowing force which struggles to keep all things in manifestation saw that without pain people would not create earthly desires to hold them here, so the illusion of pain was created, which is purely a mental phenomena. The pain of ill health and death creates the desire for health and life, and to have health and life the immortal image of God must again and again return on earth to complete its slow growth from ignorance to enlightenment. Satan is defeating his own purpose, for it is physical pain and sorrow which cause matter imprisoned souls to seek freedom in God. A child's pure soul feels very little pain. A doctor friend in a orthopedic hospital told me that children vie with each other to get their deformed limbs operated upon, whereas adults have to be coaxed for weeks, and at the time of their operation they are usually overcome with emotion and fear. Man has fortunately discovered anesthetics to neutralize pain. Originally man had great self-control and a mind which was unattached and impersonal, and so did not feel pain when the body was injured. He could behold his own body without pain even as one can witness an operation on another's body without becoming mentally excited or suffering physical pain. Although a mother feels terrible agony when her own son dies, she does not feel the same when hearing of the death of a stranger's son. So it is that man feels the agony of accident and disease in his own body, but not the suffering of others. This is only due to the proximity of continued attachment. The farmer's waterproof, fireproof, less sensitive child feels much less physical suffering than the sensitively brought up son of the rich. If you have no fear or nervous imagination, you will feel less pain. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness with the wild beasts of passion and the fierce mortal desires of pain and hunger for material kingdoms sent by cosmic Satan. Origin of Evil There are many causes which can be set forth as to the origin of evil. Some people say that it is due to man's own fault and that neither God nor any evil power, such as that of a conscious Satan, is responsible for all the evil in the world. Although evil is relative and is due to the lack of harmony with God's laws, if you hit a stone wall with your knuckles, the resulting undeniable evil of pain would not be created or willed by the wall, but would be due to your ignorance in trying to hurt a stone wall. Likewise, it can be said, God is the eternal stone wall of goodness, and anyone who is foolish enough to misuse his intelligence and try to act against the good is bound to produce the evil of pain and suffering. God is good. We were made in his image, endowed with the gift of free choice to tune in with his nature of goodness, peace, and immortality, and those who get out of tune with him by performing evil actions are bound to suffer. A little boy endowed with reason may enjoy perfect health and protection under the strict discipline of his mother, but when he grows up and says, Mother, I know I am safe under you care, 
but I wonder why you gave me the power of free choice if you are always to decide how I am to act. Mother dear, I want to choose for myself and find out in what lies my own good and what leads me to suffering. The mother replies, Son, it is right for you to demand for me the right to use your free choice. When you were helpless and your reason had not yet budded forth into full expression, I helped you and nurtured you through the maternal love which protects babies. Now, however, you are grown up. Your reason has opened your eyes, and you must depend upon your own free choice and judgment to guide you to do what will produce your well-being. Thus the youth ventures into the world unguarded, with a semi-developed reason, and the first thing that he does is to get into a fight and secure the resulting evil of a broken leg a black eye. In exactly the same way the Divine Mother protects each baby through the instinctive love of parents until grown up then the baby has to protect itself by the exercise of reason. If the baby uses the reason rightly, it becomes happy, but if reason is misused, then evil is precipitated through the misuse of reason. Many intellectualists claim that evil is more subjective than objective. This is not wholly true. It can be explained that most evil is due to the ignorance of man. For example, the habit of physical overindulgence, and his consequent evils of indiscretion, ill health and grip of temptation, does not arise until man, by an act of erroneous judgment, forgets himself and subjectively by repeated transgressions allows this consciousness to become a habit. All habits, good or bad, control and enslave the mind only after the will has allowed itself to be overcome by repeated good, or evil actions born of good or evil judgment, as the case may be. Thus it may be said, man's good judgment and his will acting under its influence produce all good, and man's ignorant or evil judgment and his will acting repeatedly under its influence is responsible for all evil. From this viewpoint good and evil are mostly subjective instead of originating in some objective power. It may be asked why some children are born with special tendencies of self-control and some with tendencies of weakness. Some intellectuals may point out that heredity is responsible for good or bad traits in a child. Then the question comes, why would an impartial God start one child with a good heredity and a good brain inclined only to good tendencies, and another child with a bad heredity and the brain of a moron inclined only to do evil under the compelling influence of evil physiological instincts? According to the law of reincarnation and the law of karma, or the law of cause and effect, which governs the actions of all persons, it is explained that the soul attracts to itself a good or bad heredity and a good or bad brain, according to prenatal habits formed during the period of the past incarnation preceding death in the last incarnation and rebirth in this life. Therefore, it may be said that the good or bad judgment of all incarnations, working through the law of cause and effect which governs all human actions, creates good or bad habits, and that good or bad habits create good or bad hereditary tendencies, and that thus all evil arises from wrong judgment. All this is very well said, namely, that evil is subjective, but it does not explain why millions of bacteria and virulent, invisible armies of germs move silently about the earth seeking, like devouring locusts, to destroy the crop of human lives. Why is it easy for the majority of people to be tempted materially? Why are they spiritually idle, and why do they do the very things that will hurt them? Why is there death by floods and cataclysms? Why do men murder each other in war? Why is there cannibalism in nature? Why does the baby salmon live on the flesh of its mother? Why does the big fish eat the little fish? Why does even the thoughts of wrong judgment and emotions of jealousy, revenge, greed, and selfishness arise at all in human mind which was made in the image of God? If man is the image of God, and God is good, then the logical deduction is that man could become nothing else but good. The world wars may have resulted from industrial selfishness, from nations fuming with national selfishness and greed for possession. But why was it not avoided by parliamentary discussions? Think of the joy in fishing. 
you deceive the fish by hooked food and the more the fish struggles for life, the more you enjoy it and say, my it is a game fish. Would you like to change places with the fish? Think of the Aztecs, who used to cut the hearts out of their prisoners of war, six or seven hundred at a time, in front of their idol gods. Think of all the burning of witches and martyrs under the zeal of the Christian faith. Think of the war of the Crusades, fought for the biblical teaching which preach only love for your enemies. Think of the numberless diseases which infest plants and animals who have no free choice and who consequently could not attract prenatal evils due to bad karma. The eternal warfare of animals preying on one another, and the battle of opposites in nature, distinctly show that there is an evil force which is employing germs, wrong judgment of men, and cannibalistic instincts, which are wrong vibrations resulting from the wrong actions of man, and breed temptation to do wrong in infinite ways by trying to destroy the efforts of the infinite good who is trying to express himself in infinite good ways. We think that if we're almighty we could create a much better world than this. We would banish from this earth cancer, accidents, weakness, revengefulness, anger, greed, murder, famine, leprosy, cannibalism, industrial greed resulting in depression, earthquakes, floods, bad weather, drought, death by pain, boredom, old age, despair, poisonous bacteria, tragedies of life, and so forth. We would create a world with a joyous struggle and not painful struggle, an ever new happy state of mind for all men entirely different from mental idleness and boredom. We would make the body with the qualities of asbestos, diseaseless, changeable according to the commandments of our will. We would have our bodies tailored in the workshop of materialization and self-rejuvenation. We would create a variety of occupations with a variety of actions, all leading to infinite, unending, ever new happiness. Good citizens would be materialized by will from the ether, even as God created the first man and woman, and would dematerialize ourselves in cosmic consciousness after we had successfully finished our earthly entertainment. Blind theologians and superstitious people made a dragon out of Satan, which had to be killed by the sword of the conquering knight. Modern intellectuals tried to explain Satan away as a merely subjective idea born of ignorance. Some modern spiritual denominations, beings unable to explain the existence of evil in the entirely good God, completely and blindly deny even the existence of evil. We find that Jesus, whose knowledge was born of intuition, distinctly spoke of conscious Satan who lured him to the wilderness and tempted him with the wild beasts of evil patterns arrayed side by side with the good patterns of God. This conscious force comes in the form of little temptations to the ordinary man. The existence of such evils is the reason Jesus prayed, Thy kingdom come, in order that man might use his independence and act rightly, and that he might substitute the kingdom of evil for the kingdom of God. Satan, like a fisherman, has cast a net of delusion around all mankind and is continually trying to drag man toward the slavery of delusion, death, and finitude. Satan tempts humanity by his baits of greed and promises of pleasure, and leads people to destruction and continuous painful reincarnations. He keeps souls, like fish, in the pond of finitude and spawns them with desires for his own destructive uses. For all the patterns of good created by God, Satan created corresponding patterns of psychological evils. God created wisdom, Satan ignorance. God created all good, Satan all evil. God created the senses of sight, smell, taste, hearing, and touch to be the servants of man, bringing happiness to him. Satan by temptation made man the slave of his senses and caused the resultant misery. The sense of hearing, smell, and sight can be overtaxed with very little ill effect. Very few people are foolish enough to strain their eyes so much that they become blind. No one can smell flowers or perfumes long enough to cause death. Very few people can make themselves deaf by continuously listening to good music. Of course, the sense of sight may be baited by physical beauty and result in a series of wrong judgments and misery. 
The sense of hearing may be misused and lost by too much practice of cannon shooting or other loud explosions. The sense of smell can be vitiated, but it is the most harmless of all of the five senses and can stand much abuse without retaliation. Think what dreadful consequences follow when the sense of taste or touch is overtaxed. How easy it is to overeat and hasten death by indigestion. How easy it is for most people to overindulge in physical temptation and indiscretion and bring upon themselves ill health, boredom, social and matrimonial disaster, jealousy, murder and so forth. God wanted man to procreate his species by materialization, but Satan, through misuse of his God-given power of free choice, created the physical urge and its infinite complications to keep man's mind away from the joy of God. If God created infinite bliss, Satan created the greatest of all temptations, that of the flesh. Is it wrong to have good children by the ordinary law of procreation? No, but remember that Satan's law of procreation and its misuse can be overcome only by moderation in marriage and by self-control and by the joyous contact with God in meditation and not by hypocritical renunciation. When the joy of God, felt in meditation with stillness of breath, remains continuously in the soul, then the physical temptation vanishes forever through contrast with this greater joy. Real freedom can be accomplished in no other way. The joy in God is more tempting than all temptations. Just as when opium is suddenly denied to an opium addict, he becomes sick or dies, so unless the laws of Satan, which have become second nature to man, are worked off gradually, man dies the death of ignorance. Attempted complete self-control by the sense-tortured individual develops hypocrisy, that is why St. Paul said, it is better to marry than to burn. Moderation in married life, supplemented by tasting of the infinite bliss of deep meditation and the unconditioned divine love in the soul, is a better way to freedom than the earthly way of reincarnation by physical procreation. The man who has completely attained divine bliss may not marry. If he does marry, as did Lahiri Mahesaya, my guru's guru, it is only to show people how the consciousness of God can tame temptation and how God's love can spiritualize conjugal love and how it can exist under all conditions of life. Since God's love is more tempting than temptation, one can love God even though he loves his wife. One can love his wife with the love of God and not love of flesh. To love your wife in a material way only is to invite Satan to dwell with you and lead you to boredom, destruction of your most wonderful love, and to separation. To love your wife with the pure love of God and to live with her a life of self-control by mental development and to create spiritual children is a noble way to live. To be drowned by material cares, weariness, overwork, greed for money, overindulgence in amusements, buying more things, and slaving for more money, and saving no time for God leads you to the misery kingdom of Satan. A happy, contented, simple, harmonious married life of self-control and meditation leads you to God. God created forgiveness, Satan created revenge. Likewise, God created calmness, fearlessness, unselfishness, spirit of brotherhood, peace, love, understanding, wisdom, and happiness, and for each of these Satan created its psychological opposite of restlessness, fear, greed, individual and material selfishness, war, anger, hate, murder, and jealousy instead of understanding, ignorance in place of wisdom, and sorrow to fight happiness. Since slavery was created to defeat the happiness and self-control, national selfishness, false sense of patriotism, industrial selfishness, and national pride were created by Satan to destroy the universal spirit of brotherhood, international understanding, and law of equality created by God. Conscience, the voice of God, always beckons you to do right. Temptation, the voice of Satan, coaxes you to do wrong. 
Remember that Satan has brought disease, cataclysms, famine, pain, death, strife, and imperfection in nature so that man may desire to have a perfect earth and return again and again to earth life, where Satan reigns, and never go back to spirit. Let us by perfect living in a spiritual united states of the world, make God's heaven from Satan's earth of imperfection. Let us help God's pattern to take the place of the evil designs of Satan. Belief in an objective Satan explains the origin of all evil, which cannot be explained by the individual or collective subjective ignorance of man. You are free so when you are tempted or angry or jealous or selfish or greedy or revengeful or restless, remember that Satan is asking you to come to his side. Remember that every time you are master of yourself, moderate, calm, understanding, unselfish, forgiving, and when you practice meditation, you are inviting God to help you. Remember above all that you are a free agent endowed with free will and that Satan can only influence you when you command yourself to yield to his temptations. Remember God can redeem you only when you act in accordance with his laws of right living in every way. Remember also that you are in the middle with Satan standing at your left with his kingdom of misery and God remaining at your right with his kingdom of happiness. It rests with you whether you will allow Satan to pull you to his side, or whether you will ask God to draw you to his side of eternal freedom. Remember, every time you are tempted to do wrong, it is not your subjective mind alone which is tempting you, but also objective Satan, and recognizing this, refuse to cooperate with him, thereby being destroyed. Satan can work as wrong subjective consciousness in man, or he can become the objective evil in nature. Many people think this conception of Satan teaches duality and not the conception of one God who alone exists in the cosmos. This is not true. In essence, in reality, there is nothing but spirit, the only substance in existence, the ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss. As the ocean, when it is calm, can exist without the storm and the waves, so the spirit, by withdrawing all waves of manifestation, can exist as the only one goodness, as the only one reality. But when the ocean is in movement we must acknowledge a second force, the storm, which divides the one ocean into many struggling, mutually destructive, big and small waves. God, in creating the cosmos, has to use the independent cosmic force of Satan's delusion to produce in us the delusion of finite substances. As the waves do not change or hurt the ocean, in spite of the fact big waves are destructive to small waves, so God, manifesting as finite imperfect waves of creation, is not affected or changed in essence, although finite objects are perpetually colliding and destroying one another. After all, the evil of delusion exits only in the form, not in the essence of the spirit. As long as there is creation, so long will there be the conception of imperfection, for the formal delusion which produces in the infinite substance the consciousness of finite phenomena is born of cosmic delusion. Spirit is perceived as the only reality, the only eternal substance existing, when one goes into deep samadhi oneness with spirit and sees the ocean of spirit without the waves of creation. After attaining this realization, one is justified in saying that there is neither subjective nor objective Satan, but only ever new, ever joyous spirit. However, as long as creation only is perceived, one has to acknowledge the appearance of duality. God and Satan are facts, even if the latter exists only in delusion and not in reality. If you are dreaming and you hit your dream head against a dream wall, you will have a dream pain. While dreaming, you cannot deny the resultant pain of the collision of a dream head with a dream conceived wall. In the same way, we are dreaming the delusion of the universe and cannot say that Satan or evil or pain, disease and matter do not exist. One who has wakened up in cosmic consciousness and forgotten the dream of cosmic delusion may say, Ah, nothing exists but pure eternal goodness, one spirit. While Jesus was striving to reach the final state of highest wisdom, the accumulated subjective and objective evil, 
born of delusive habits of incarnations, through memory of short-lived happiness born of contact with temporal finite things, began to tempt him and try to dissuade him from God. Jesus did not deny this evil. He recognized it and destroyed its binding force by the sword of wisdom, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, which means, Let delusion be left behind my soul racing toward the spirit. Do not deny subjective or objective evil while you are in delusion, but watch the destructive patterns of evil everywhere as temptation within you and as imperfection and strife in nature. Rally your patterns of goodness in your conscience and reason, and in the presence of God, as beauty in all nature. Strengthen your consciousness of goodness, and in his light drive away the darkness of evil. After successfully doing this say, nothing exists but the goodness of God. To the ordinary man, Satan appears as subjective ideas subtly luring him through prenatal and postnatal bad habits. To the highly advanced, Satan takes objective form and uses vibratory voices in his last attempt to dissuade the Godward fleeing master who tries to remain completely beyond the net of satanic delusion. Thus it was that when Satan saw Jesus nearing complete emancipation in God, he took an objective shape, talked to him, and promised him the temporal happiness which all his evil patterns of life could afford if Jesus would only forsake God. In the wilderness, when Jesus was enjoying the divine bliss contact of God, Satan used the wild beasts of passion, greed of possession, and so forth, to lure him away from the complete attainment of divine understanding. If Jesus had been God on earth, he could not have been tempted and would not have shown signs of mental struggle, as he did when he said, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He also said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Even after his crucifixion, in the astral state, Jesus had to purify himself of all vestiges of delusion. That is why he said to Mary, to whom he first appeared, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Jesus was freeing himself from all delusion, and when that was finished he attained complete self-mastery and could materialize his body at will and thus appear for forty days to his disciples. Chapter 4 Why Jesus Fasted How Christ Consciousness Descends into Human Consciousness And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being forty days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The consciousness of Jesus, the man, felt the limitation of the body and began to vibrate with the ghost-like, holy, intelligent, cosmic vibration as heard in meditation. This was the first attempt of the soul of Jesus to rise above his bodily attachment of incarnations. Jesus had been successful in transferring his consciousness from the circumference of the body to the boundary of all finite creation in the vibrating region. See figure X. The whole cosmos can be divided in halves. One portion is pervaded by the transcendental God, the Father, who is ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss, and beyond all the categories of time, space, and vibration. The other portion is the vibratory region of space and time which contains in its sphere all the planetary universes, Milky Way, stars, and our little family of solar systems. The earth is a part of the solar system, and the body of Jesus was a small speck of the earth. Jesus the man had his consciousness caged in the little body, a speck of earth space. Jesus the Christ consciousness, by the expanding power of love and the spreading power of meditation, had been able to extend his consciousness to the region of all vibratory space. This is what is meant by Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. 
his consciousness was expanded fully from the region of the body vibration to the region of all vibration as shown in figure X Jesus. The man, a speck of the earth, became Jesus, the Christ, with his consciousness pervading all finite vibration. Omnipresent spirit becomes buried in matter and vibration, just as the oil remains hidden in the olive and can be released again only through love and meditation. When the olive is squeezed, tiny drops of oil appear on its surface, so spirit tries to squeeze its way out of matter as the souls of gems, beautiful minerals, plants, men, and supermen. Spirit expresses itself as beauty, magnetic and chemical power in gems, as beauty and life in plants, as beauty, power, life, motion, and consciousness in animals, as comprehension and expanding power in man, and again returns to omnipresence in the superman. The gem expresses a part of spirit, the plant expresses a little more. The animal expresses spirit more than plant, for the animal can cover a greater portion of space by bodily movements. Man, by his self-consciousness, can comprehend the thoughts of other men and can project his mind into space and to the stars, at least by the power of imagination. The superman, by withdrawing life and energy from his body, can expand them and project them into all space, thus actually feeling the presence of all universes and every atom of the earth in his own consciousness. In the superman the lost omnipresence of spirit is bound in the soul by individualized spirit. To understand exactly what Jesus meant by being filled with the Holy Ghost, one must scientifically and metaphysically explode superstition and understand the true significance of his statements. That is why Jesus said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. Fear ye not therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Jesus, like the great yogis of India, not only could foretell the actions of people and the course of events from a distance through telepathic vibrations of thought, but he also knew about all the happenings on the earth's surface or within it or in any portion of space, in any planet of vibratory creation, through his omnipresent feeling. That is why Jesus foretold or felt the death of Lazarus in his own omnipresent Christ consciousness of omnipresence. A little ant's consciousness is limited by its little body. An elephant's consciousness is extended all over his big body. His consciousness is aware in all parts of his own body, so that ten people touching ten different parts of his body would awaken simultaneous awareness in him. Likewise, Christ consciousness is extended to the boundaries of all vibratory regions, as represented in figure X Jesus. The man's consciousness was at first extended only to the boundaries of his body. The body of man may not be as large as that of an elephant, but his consciousness, unlike the elephants, can cover the territories of stars and imagination. Christ, a superman God, by constantly meditation upon the finitely omnipresent vibrating ocean sound, as taught in the precept to given meditation technique or Holy Ghost vibration, felt his consciousness filled in every particle of space. First, Jesus, the man's consciousness, was bound by his body occupying a little speck of vibratory region on the earth. Second, by meditation and feeling cosmic vibration in every particle of vibratory space, Jesus, the man, became Jesus the Christ. Simply listening to the cosmic sound will not do. By Guru Preceptor given higher and higher meditation, one must learn to actually feel the sound in plants and stars or in any portion of space at will. In the Holy Ghost state the consciousness of Jesus had expanded from the body to all vibratory regions. This Holy Ghost state is the second state of high metaphysical development. This Holy Ghost state can be attained externally by extending the feeling of love to one's family, society, nation, all nations, all creatures and internally by expanding consciousness through semi-subconsciousness, soul consciousness, semi-superconsciousness, semi-Christ consciousness to Christ consciousness present in all vibratory regions. A Christ-like person must love all living creatures and actually feel his presence, 
in every portion of Earth a vibratory space semi-universally at the same time. He does not need to concentrate in order to know anything. He already knows all things because he feels all finite creation stars and all specks of space as the living cells of his own body. Once Lahiri Mahaseya, my preceptor's guru, was teaching the Hindu Bible or Bhagavad Gita to a group of his students in Banyars, India, and was talking of Kites the Chaitanya or his Christ consciousness in all finite vibratory creation, when suddenly he gasped and cried out. I am drowning in the bodies of many souls off the coast of Japan. Later the disciples read in the newspapers that a shipload of people were drowning near the coast of Japan at exactly the time when Lahiri Mahaseya felt and saw the shipwreck in his omnipresence. So it was with Jesus. By extending his consciousness through the different states of consciousness, he had arrived at the second Holy Ghost state. His time after Jesus, the man, became Jesus, the Christ, he had to go through a metaphysical and psychological test before he could reach the third and last state of extending his consciousness to the Spirit of God, the Father's vibrationless region, as shown in figure X. The devil, or conscious cosmic metaphysical Satan, through cosmic delusion and psychological temptations, began to tempt the Christ consciousness of Jesus by reminding him of the limited needs of the body, so that instead of living by his newly found cosmic energy, he might become mortal again by misusing his divine powers and changing atoms of stone to atoms of bread. Before Jesus attained the third and final state, in which he could behold himself as the transcendental, vibrationless God, the Father, and the Christ consciousness, in vibratory space, he was led by the ultimate spirit in the silence of the wilderness to be tested, to see if Christ consciousness had risen above all mortal memories of food and other small material temptations of the powers of miracles. Miracles are held in esteem by earthbound mortals, but they should not be loved or used by a superman to test the attention and love of God to the devotee. To test the love of God by invoking his miracles is to disturb the faith in him and his all-protecting power. That is why Jesus refused to convert the stones into bread, even though his body was hungry from the delusive human standpoint. Also that is why he refused to be tempted by cosmic Satan into jumping from the mountain top to show whether the angels would hold him or not. The Christ consciousness of Jesus found an adequate test in the temptations born of the memories of past mortal habits, and in the test of living by bread alone, and so forth, which was instigated through the cosmic delusion of the metaphysical Satan. Whether one believes in cosmic Satan or not, it can be easily understood that the Spirit, before giving the final transcendental, cosmic consciousness of God, the Father, to Jesus, wanted to see if his newly acquired Christ consciousness could rise above the temptations born of the memory of mortal habits. Jesus, in lifting himself from the Holy Ghost state of feeling all cosmic vibration in its universal Christ consciousness, found a matter word pull of cosmic delusion which began to remind him of confining, limiting, human habits of incarnations. Jesus successfully stood the test by saying, I have found the new source of living by God, the Father as the fountain of all life, and not by physical bread. In doing this, Jesus teaches mankind one of the greatest methods of actually knowing that the body live principally by God and secondarily by bread. Jesus said that the body does not live by the little condensed solidified energy of bread alone but by the word of the unlimited vibrating cosmic energy of God. Fasting and Meditation Deep meditation is possible only when all bodily functions are stilled. This is one reason why fasting is helpful in attaining a state of quiet and freedom from body consciousness. People who eat too much and never fast keep the life force in their bodies busy burning carbon and cleansing venous blood, and they thus overwork the heart and keep the five sense telephones forever active. When a long meditation of several days is desired, a fruit diet is to be recommended because it contains less carbon than ordinary varied diet. 
It also satisfies the bodily bad habit of continuous eating and is better for most people than complete fasting. Such partial fasting by a group of a people, accompanied by long meditation, can give a tremendous spiritual experience. This experiment should be undertaken only under the strict guidance of a wise preceptor or guru. Meditation is the method of connecting the life force with cosmic energy, and this can be accomplished only when all bodily functions are slowed up. Therefore, meditating when the stomach is full defeats the very purpose for which one meditates. With a full stomach, the heart nervous system and the five sense telephones are all busy digesting food, burning carbon and keeping up the circulation in the body. This keeps the subconscious mind restless and thus prevents it from becoming one-pointed and concentrated on God. On the other hand, to meditate when the stomach is empty is a good practice because the energy which runs the nervous system is not then busy with the bodily functions. When the body, lungs and diaphragm are still, the heart is calm. When the heart is calm, the current is switched off from the five sense telephones. Therefore, fasting in connection with meditation means the slowing up of activity in the muscles, heart circulation, diaphragm, and lungs by denying carbon and chemicals to the blood. Hence, fasting helps to draw the attention away from the body and its functions, and metaphysically it helps to open up the inner source of cosmic consciousness and cosmic energy by which the body really lives. Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Man's body battery is not sustained by sunshine, oxygen, and food alone, but by the word or vibrating current of cosmic energy which, by radioactive force, descends into the body and human will through the medulla, or mouth of God. Not to use the will, as some people teach, is to shut off all divine currents from the body. Man can be like a dry battery. He can live more and more by condensing cosmic energy into flesh instead of always receiving chemical atomic energy from food. In a book called Amonzil, about Teresa Newman, the peasant girl of Connor Sruth, Bavaria taken from an address by R.T. Rev. Joseph Schrems, D.D., Bishop of Cleveland, delivered Feb. 12, 1928, and reprinted from the Catholic Universe Bulletin, Cleveland, Ohio, 11th edition, we find striking facts about Teresa Newman's life relative to living by divine energy. 1. She possesses the wounds of the crucified Savior. The wounds remain always the same. They neither fester nor heal. 2. She goes through the Passion of Our Lord each Friday. 3. She repeats the Aramaic words spoken by Christ. Or she divines the innermost secrets of the heart. 5. She takes neither food nor drink. Has eaten no solid food since 1923, except water or a little fruit juice. But on Christmas Day of the year 1926 she ceased entirely taking any food or any drink, so that almost for two years now, this girl has neither eaten nor drunk anything except to receive Holy Communion every morning. Now, it may be that you will say, perhaps she takes food on the sly. Perhaps this is all deception. No. It is guaranteed. It is absolutely certified. The Episcopal government of the city of Radabin sent four hospital sisters who were placed under oath to watch her night and day. These sisters changed off in pairs and never left her presence. They stayed for fifteen days and deposed under oath that entire time not a drop of water or any liquid substance or a morsel of food passed her lips. In the verdict of all the doctors from the University of Berlin, from Prague, from Frankfurt, from Munich, doctors without any faith, was this, deception and fraud are absolutely out of the question in the case of Theresa Newman. She is not emaciated, despite lack of food since Christmas 1926, and is as healthy looking as anyone around you. On Fridays, she loses about eight pounds. Six hours after the vision of the passion is over, she is again back to her normal weight of 110 pounds. The greatest of all things in Teresa Newman's life was that she actually demonstrated what Jesus said. 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of mouth of God, and she did not become emaciated by fasting. To live by eating food is not a sin, but to live and think only of the physical means of sustaining life is to live in delusion. We must know that it is the power of God that digests food and changes it into blood and nourishment. It is God alone who sustains life. Teresa Newman showed that her divine will could replace the decayed bodily tissues by materializing electrons of energy into flesh. Many Hindu saints have demonstrated that life is possible without oxygen or food. Sadhu Haradas of India conducted an experiment under the observation of medical men and was buried several feet beneath the surface of the earth for forty days in the courtyard of a well-guarded palace and came back to life even though he was pronounced dead. These extreme examples are cited, not in order to make you aspire to become another Haradas or Teresa Newman, but simply to show that if such great control of the physical being is possible, it is also possible for a person living a normal life to so spiritualize his body that he can be free from physical suffering, and that he can actually know through experience that divine power is the real source of his life. Of course long fasting, that is, more than three days, is not necessary in order to demonstrate that you really live by divine power. You can also spiritualize the body or make it live on this higher plane by right eating at all times. Proper diet should be chosen and care should be taken never to overeat. When fasting, mental resistance and fear of losing weight should be put upon the spiritual purpose for which the fast is undertaken. During this time, you must feel alive with cosmic consciousness and the newly awakened life energy. Jesus discovered this new source of energy through fasting and meditation. He also found that he had conquered the race habit and the race idea of the necessity of living by physical food alone. The cosmic delusive force has led man to believe that he would die without physical food and the body consciousness. Jesus refused to convert the stone into bread because he knew that he lived by the power of the changeless infinite energy and not alone by the limited relative energy derived from physical food. During fasting, you should say to yourself and actually realize, I am learning to live by the power of God and not by physical means only. Everyone should test out this truth in his or her own life by fasting and meditation and become aware of God consciousness and cosmic energy. However, be sure to remember that long fasting should never be undertaken without the guidance and direction of a competent preceptor. It is good at all times, however, to fast one day a week, to choose the proper diet, to eat little at night, and to meditate regularly every day. Reincarnation Satan saw that the divine plan was for all finite creation, after a perfect existence, to go back to God, and knew that with the disappearance of all finite creation, his kingdom would be gone, so he determined to use his God-given power to create imperfect independent desires and finite creatures in order to make them come back to earth again and again through reincarnation. Satan created the consciousness of death through accident or fear, and thus started a desire in human beings for a perfect life on earth. This desire caused souls to reincarnate again and again in their vain hope of finding a perfect existence on earth, which can only be found in God. God is Almighty. He could destroy Satan, but if he used his physical miraculous force, he would subjugate Satan, but would not convince his immortal intelligence of his evil ways, so God is using love to convert Satan. As Satan is trying to keep human beings deluded by greed, anger, fear, desire, attachment, and delusion, so God is using the psychological counterparts of unselfishness, calmness, courage, satisfaction, unattached divine love, and wisdom to bring man to his divine kingdom. If there were no individual and industrial greed, selfishness, sex temptation, nor false ambitions, this earth would be free from physical and moral crimes and war. By these misfortunes, Satan is systematically fighting God's perfect plans of unselfishness, international cooperation, 
self-control, and true ambition, which includes the happiness of other people in one's own happiness, brotherhood, and so on. Living by God power. Why must God's children be hungry? The soul identified with the Satan desecrated human body feels hunger and in turning to the earth products for nourishment, remains earthbound. Thus the soul forgets that it can live like God by God's cosmic energy. Jesus, as he contacted God, found that hunger is a delusion connected with the law of change in the body and can be overcome gradually until one can live entirely by God's energy. Man should behold the soul as above hunger and the desire for food, for as long as the soul feels dependent upon food, it is earth-bound, and so long must it come back again and again to satisfy this flesh desire. This does not mean that the spiritual aspirant should stop eating, but it does mean that he should joyously eat to maintain the temple of God the body and not eat just to satisfy sense craving. Even when Jesus said that stones could be made into bread by changing the rate of electronic vibration, he realized that it would be foolish to remember and encourage his mortal habits when tempted by Satan, since he knew that he was immortal and could live by God power. Stones can be changed into bread when man understands how divine intelligence controls atoms and electrons. God's intelligence has divided vibrations into solids, liquids and gases, and is holding them in balance by mind, thermal and electrical laws. Man must understand how his intelligence controls the atoms of his body. When he learns that, he will find that his intelligence is a reflection of divine intelligence, which supports the life of his body. When he understands that, he knows that his body is not maintained by the physical law of bread only, but that it is sustained principally by God's cosmic energy. So Jesus controlled his mortal enemy of hunger by his divine memory of unconditioned spiritual existence, which is self-sustaining. Cosmic Satan, through past mortal memory, asked Jesus to use his divine power over atoms to change stones into bread. Satan wanted Jesus to forget his newly remembered divine state of unconditioned existence. So Satan worked through the mind of Jesus and said, Why don't you use your divine power to change stones into bread? If Jesus had done that, he would have misused his divine power and also would have again catered to the satanic psychology of physical hunger instead of living by cosmic energy. If Jesus had converted stones into bread, he would have had to depend again on bread for life. Of course, Jesus humanly ate bread even after this experience, but he did it as a God-man, and not as a deluded human being subject to physical hunger. Great souls, who attain the highest, do not use their miraculous power for themselves, but live in the common human way so that they may attract people to God by the higher miracles of love and devotion, and not by ostentatious physical miracles. By not yielding to Satan's temptation to turn stones into bread, Jesus conquered, and from then on it was at his option to live with or without food. Jesus found that a son of God should not test God, for that is to doubt him. God's power should not be used to satisfy the challenge of unbelievers, unless so commanded by God himself. For those who see the miracles of God, there is nothing left to disbelieve. It is those who believe in God's power without seeing, who deserve to behold the miracles of God. So Jesus answered within himself with a great vibratory force of thought to the metaphysical Satan, who was tempting him to transgress God's laws. The word said signifies vibrating thought and not speaking voice. Jesus quoted the scriptural truth, not theoretically, as so many theologians do, but after his own experience of finding the mystery and origin of life through a 40-day fast and by an intense inner meditative preparation. Man does not need to depend upon bread or solids, liquids and gases only sustaining life, but upon the vibrating cosmic energy proceeding from the metal of mouth of God into the human system. Evil on earth was not all created by man's wrong actions, evil karma, accumulated during many incarnations. 
Evil existed from the time the cosmic satanic force first misused the cosmic energy to create imperfect things and beings. Even when Adam and Eve were created, Satan foresaw that if they remained perfect on earth and were dematerialized and draw back into God, there would be nothing left for him to do and he would lose his power. So even in that early period, Satan has already turned against God and had created such patterns of imperfection as physical temptation to make Adam and Eve transgress the perfect laws and become earthbound through the creation of imperfect desires. Adam and Eve, by yielding to Satan's temptation of physical procreation, lost the power of immaculate creation by which they materialize their tendencies and energy into divine children, even as God had especially created them out of the ether. All creation is special in the beginning and physical creation is secondary, for male and female must first exist before physical creation is possible. From then on, the law of reincarnation became effective for the outworking of human desires on the earth plane by rebirth. Satan created this law because he wanted souls to be bound to the earth by earthly desires. Reincarnation originated principally from Satan trying to immortalize changeable flesh in order to keep creatures under his subjugation. Satan found, however, that flesh was subject to the law of change, which included the change of the state called death. Souls, being immortal, could not go back to God with the imperfect desires engendered on earth by Satan, so they had to return to earth, through reincarnation, to work out their material desires. In a way, Satan is helplessly acting as the tool of God in ultimately freeing souls from body and earth attachment. Reincarnation assures freedom, for it gives immortal souls time to work out their past desires. In that way Satan is deceived into thinking that souls will remain earthbound forever, whereas at the expiration of the incarnation of desires, they will be liberated. When a soul incarnates to work out its desires of past incarnations, Satan, fearing the freedom of that individual at the end of the working out of those desires, creates new desires in this incarnation by ingenious temptations, so that the soul may keep on reincarnating by weaving fresh nets of desires. Reincarnation, forced by earthly desires, is painful and wrought with suffering, and is the tool of Satan to keep souls earthbound and miserable. Death was to have been a conscious, happy transition from the chainful body to the changeless God. This was God's idea of death. Satan created the painful, dreadful, unconscious phenomena of death. To desire lasting happiness in the body causes unconsciousness and pain at the time of death. Satan made souls think death was a parting from the beautiful earth and as such that they should grieve and desire to come back. Souls fail to see, due to Satan's delusion, that death was to be a godly event, a promotion, a liberation from the toil-weary, imperfect earth life to the perfect, everlasting freedom in God. Man's Relation to Evil Man may be accused of misusing his reason, and by creating in harmony with God's laws, of giving birth to evil. However, we find that evil had already been created to delude man and influence his free choice against God's suggestions through his patterns of good. Greed, revengefulness, and sense temptation were all created to tempt man to miserable, evil ways by forsaking God's pattern of unselfishness, forgiveness, self-control, and so on. Man cannot be held responsible for being tempted. For even in his own body Satan created the terrible physical temptation, constantly urging him to morally transgress. Man is responsible, however, for not using his reason and will power to conquer his senses and know God's laws of happiness and self-control, and in transmuting life force into the creation of children of wisdom, or with utmost self-control, in the creation of spiritual physical children. Man did not create physical temptation or death-dealing bacteria or earthquakes or cataclysms or floods. Satan created them as counteracting imperfect patterns to destroy the perfect patterns of God, of creation by will, and of helpful bacteria of a solid, peaceful earth, 
free from earthquakes, cataclysms, and floods. God wanted man, after a perfect existence on earth, to go back to his immortal home of peace. Satan was the result of the desire of God to divide his sea of oneness into waves of finite creation by the storm of vibration, which resulted in the waves of manifestation and in the law of relativity. This power coming from God became independent and endowed with free choice. Later Satan, who embodies this power, beheld finite things, after a perfect existence, dissolving back into God, and feared the loss of his existence at the end of the creation of finite manifestation, so he rebelled against God and started to misuse his free choice by using God's cosmic energy to create patterns of imperfection. Satan was at first an archangel of God, and used cosmic energy to create perfect finite things, with astral lights turned inward on God. Later Satan became lightning falling from heaven, because he caused cosmic energy to be turned away from God, and kept it busy creating on the earth plane, revealing finite lights like the sun and the moon and the lightning which shows only finite things. Satan keeps man's sense bound, and does not allow him to reverse the searchlights of his senses Godward, and behold his glory and his wonders in the astral cosmos, where all things are indescribably beautiful. The battery of man's wisdom, intelligence, life, and body shall not live be sustained by bread outer material, solids, liquids, and so forth alone, but by every word unit of intelligent living vibration that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The cosmic energy or life energy, as it proceedeth out of medulla, through which mouth or opening, God breathes his breath of life cosmic energy into the soul, mind, and body battery of man. The batteries of man's wisdom, intelligence, life, and body in all futurity will not be kept alive by the outer agency of solids, liquids, gases, or by physical food only, but by the inner source of wisdom, power, and life energy, which recharge the soul, mind, and body batteries of man. It is foolish to think that bread alone sustains man. Man lives by wisdom, power, and energy, all of which come from God, through the finite opening of the medulla. The above is one of the greatest truths which Jesus ever revealed, namely, that future generations would learn to live by wisdom and cosmic energy and not by food only. The ordinary animal man thinks that his entire life depends upon steak, oxygen, water, and sunshine. He forgets that the body is like a battery, which cannot work with distilled water only when its electricity runs out. The death battery can live only when it is sent to a battery shop and recharged with electric current. Likewise oxygen, inflated into the lungs of a dead man and food stuffed into his stomach and his body exposed to sunshine, will not bring back life. It is the life force coming down from the medulla and distributed throughout the cells which changes food into energy. This energy derived from food reinforces the energy existing in the body. In this way the inner life energy is self-contained and alone can support the body. Still through generations of bad habits, it feels its complete dependence upon food and refuses to function without it. Just as extreme opium addicts die without opium, so to the food addict the life force refuses to stay in the body without food. The life force, constantly depending upon physical food, forgets its original continuous supply of cosmic energy. The time comes in the life of every individual when, no matter what food he eats, or how many breathing exercises or sun baths he takes, he says, no matter what I do, my health is failing. This shows that outside agencies, which support the body, are only indirect causes of energy, and are dependent upon the life force, which is the direct source of life. In suspended animation, Sadhu Haridas was buried several feet below the earth for forty days and lived without food, oxygen, or sunshine. When he was brought out he was pronounced dead, and yet, to the amazement of his attendant English and French physicians he came back to life. 
Of course the yogis know how to withdraw their consciousness into the spine and connect it with cosmic consciousness and thus keep all the subconscious thoughts recharged and active in the dream state of the soul. Without this internal activity of consciousness the body cells would decay. In suspended animation the cosmic consciousness works through the subconscious mind and shows to the body cells their complete dependence upon the divine cosmic consciousness. Just as ships can be controlled by a distant radio, so the cosmic consciousness of God keeps all thoughts and cells alive in the body by continually sending energy to them. During the suspended state of the body, unless the cell and thought radios are tuned in with cosmic consciousness or with the superconsciously charged subconscious, the cells and bodily functions will be destroyed because of the lack of a controlling intelligence. Human conscious intelligence, charged with God consciousness, is the supreme sustainer of the body. Without that no human body can live, so in the suspended states of the body, the superconsciously charged subconsciousness withdraws the life force from the organs and unites it with cosmic energy to electrify all the body cells and convert them into dry batteries. When the cells are electrified with this supercurrent, they cease to grow or to decay. This is what is meant by suspended animation. The life force and human consciousness cease their outward activity with the material world and temporarily suspend their slavery to oxygen, food and sunshine and learn to depend wholly upon the true body supporters, cosmic consciousness and cosmic energy. The yogis suspend the activity of change in the muscles, blood, nerve force, and all tissues and support the body by the changeless power of cosmic consciousness and cosmic energy. The body being a cluster of atomic, cellular, circulatory, muscular, astral, electrical motions, depends usually upon such motion for its existence, but when the animation is suspended in the right way, the body is charged by the cosmic source. If you gently touch the spring of a fine watch, it will stop, and when you shake the watch, it will run again. In the same way, when the heart is stopped by stilling the activity of thoughts, the animation of the body is suspended. While buried, the cold earth acts like a refrigerator, preserving the body from the work of heat. Besides, the inner life force creates a sort of coolness in all the cells, which serves to preserve them by direct current from cosmic consciousness and cosmic energy. In this state, the cells temporarily forget their bad habit as food addicts and live by the word or the vibration of cosmic consciousness and energy. To return to activity, the yogi takes his will and consciousness into the spine and brain. Then he puts in the switch of the will and the thoughts begin to stir. With the connecting of the switches of the thoughts, the life force begins to bring animation into the body again. Besides the above, it is a known fact each gram of flesh in the human body has enough energy in the electroprotonic center to run the electrical supply of the city of Chicago for two days. The life force in the ordinary human body usually derives power from the chemical energy in food. It does not know how to live on the electro energy stored in the protonic center in food atoms. In the state of suspended animation, some yogis, instead of drawing on cosmic energy by disintegrating atoms through the power of will, release the electro protonic heat to keep the body cells electrified like billions of dry batteries, recharging the body, mind, and soul batteries. Good electricity is extremely necessary in maintaining a battery. In the same way, the body battery needs to be inwardly charged with good thoughts, wisdom, and cosmic energy. Dietetics is not delusion. Distilled water and not any kind of water is necessary for the life of the battery. Also, good food, pure oxygen through proper breathing, sunshine, and less carbon-forming foods are necessary for the proper upkeep of this body battery. The body is a battery within batteries. The body battery is charged outwardly by good food, chemicals and so forth and inwardly by pure mind, pure soul, cosmic consciousness and life energy. Body battery is contained in the mind and soul batteries. 
The mind battery is charged by life energy, bodily chemicals from the outside, and inwardly it is charged by superconsciousness of the soul. A weak, dilapidated body weakens the mind, but a healthy body does not always mean a remarkable mind, unless it is charged with superconsciousness of the soul. Likewise, the soul battery is charged with a good mind, good life energy, and good chemical energy of the body from the outside, and inwardly the soul is charged by cosmic consciousness through the channel of the superconscious. In other words, remember that the more you daily meditate deeply and feel your joy increasing, the more your soul battery will be recharged with daily wisdom poured out from God. The more one meditates, keeps in the company of saints and intelligent, mentally powerful people, reads good books, introspects, does creative work in art, science, literature and business, the more one feels mentally powerful. Then last of all, it must be remembered that since the soul has descended into matter from spirit and made the imperfect body its playground, all the perfection of spirit and soul and mind must be centered in the body in order to enable the flesh-entangled soul to remember its vastness in spirit. A diseased body discourages the soul, due to the latter identifying itself with the former. A strong soul, which finds its joy in meditation on the order hand, can influence a disease-stricken body to manifest healing and perfection. The soul's battle for immortality, diseaselessness and everlasting happiness must be won and established in the body at least from the mental standpoint before the soul can disentangle its attachment from the mortal, imperfect condition of the body. Spiritual man, unless highly advanced, eating food injudiciously, would find the body standing in the way of spiritual realization. Also, a food fanatic will find the thought of the body hindering spiritual realization. Eat the right food and then forget that you live by food. Think that you are always living by cosmic consciousness, which changes the food into energy. You must realize that food alone cannot support the body, whereas in this state of suspended animation, the body can be sustained by the consciousness and subconsciousness in the brain and spine. No one can live without the inner intelligence of subconsciousness drawing energy from the protonic center of cells, or cosmic energy. When consciousness departs from the spine and brain in the suspended or dead body, death is instantaneous and decay starts. In the case of Teresa Newman, we find one of God's many miracles. She was slightly active, breathed, enjoyed sunshine, had her heart and circulatory system working, but she did not live by bread, water, and so forth. This was most unique. She demonstrated in this age the teaching of Jesus, namely, that the body does not have to live by bread alone, but that it can live by the vibrating energy of God, sent through the sunshine, oxygen, and the life force into the body. Of course, very few persons in the world have lived by sunshine and oxygen only. St. Teresa Newman lived by her will, drawing cosmic energy, and by the cosmic consciousness of Christ. St. Teresa Newman was sent by God to demonstrate that the future food of man will come through oxygen, sunshine, and etheric energy. To use oxygen and sunshine only along with cosmic energy on one hand is wonderful for the decay of the bodily tissues is rebuilt by food from oxygen, sunshine, and cosmic energy. On the other hand, Teresa Newman apparently had to depend a little upon mortal breath and sunshine. Yogis of India, in the suspended state, live only by cosmic energy and to not depend upon oxygen and sunshine. The suspended state is not the highest state, however. When a yogi can at will remain conscious and active without breath and sunshine and can live, then he is known to make the body live by God and the Word of God cosmic energy alone. Yogis who can do this are much higher than those who remain in the suspended state only. St. Teresa Newman's state was a higher state than the yog, is who remains subconsciously alive only in suspended animation, in that she consciously lived without eating and was active and breathing. There is an even higher state than this. 
Some yo is live consciously only through God and cosmic consciousness word of God. Jesus could do this. He ate only to be human. By the manifestation of cosmic consciousness during his forty days of fasting he attained this. Therefore, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Yogis, after attaining the above state, may not eat at all, or they may eat to remain human, and thus help out his drama of life. The spiritual aspirant, however, must eat rightly. He should eat less carbonized food and every little in the morning and evening, the times of meditation. Most kinds of meat and heavy food keep the life force busy working in the vital organs burning carbon, and therefore it is difficult to disengage the active life force from the senses and vital organs, and to reverse the current in attention toward God without retarding digestion and receiving opposition from the vital organs. Meditation after heavy meals in the early stages sets up a tug of war between the body consciousness and super consciousness. That is why fruits containing less carbon are better than most heavy meats like pork and beef since fruits having less carbon to burn do not use much life force and do not tax the nervous system, vital organs, kidneys and so on. The heavy meat eater will find the mind pulled down to the region of the senses during meditation. In the morning eat fruits, at noon eat a good meal whatever you want, at night fruits, milk and cooked vegetables. Fast once a week on orange juice and meditate. Fast three days consecutively on orange juice every month or every 45 days and meditate long and deeply two or three hours. This will not only give rest to the body and eliminate poisons, but it will teach you how to live more by cosmic consciousness and less by food. Concentrate during fasting. Don't mentally miss food or dwell on food. Rather feel that you are being charged by cosmic consciousness and cosmic energy and are learning that your life depends entirely upon it and that you are getting out of the habit of depending too much upon food. Psychological Satan of Ignorance then the devil taketh him up into the holy city, and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from hence. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for it is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever will I give it. If you therefore will fall down and worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. There are two meanings to the above message. The cosmic intelligent force, which turned away from God, threw its searchlight of consciousness upon matter to extol it, and to tempt man with its tinsel glory. Any man who turns his consciousness externally upon matter automatically finds his vision matter bound along with Satan's vision. To be a slave to the senses is to use the soul's searchlight of attention for worshipping the glory of changing, temporary, pleasure-yielding matter. To reverse the searchlight of attention upon the soul is to behold and enjoy the changeless, everlasting, joy-giving spirit. The first meaning is that the psychological Satan of ignorance took hold of the mind of Jesus while he was on the very height of the temple of meditation, situated in the holy city of his universal Christ consciousness. This means that the mind of Jesus, although it had reached the pinnacle of meditative intuition in his Christ state of consciousness, was still subject to the temptation of ignorant delusion. His past elusive habit of yielding to temptation, finding constant defeat in the sacred consciousness of Jesus, was making a last effort to dislodge his divine habit of right thinking and claim him as its own. 
The memory of his past elusive habit cast a tempting thought in his mind, and he was led to think, Since I have regained my lost high state of divine sonhood by deep meditation, it is safe for me to cast myself down into temptation because God will protect me through my guardian angels of spiritual conviction, intuitive experiences, and meditation-born wisdom. Even if I fall into temptation, the angels of spiritual thoughts will lift me up again to my highest state of consciousness and will prevent my strong foot of all power from dashing against the stone of misery making spiritual error. The better spiritual habit conquered, and Jesus replied by thought to temptation within himself. The highest wisdom as written in the great scriptures says, Attention must not stray from God, the Father, the Creator of all forms of consciousness, but that consciousness must remain identified with and concentrated upon God. It must not separate itself from Him and try to drag Him at her ward. All craving and desire in man should be transmuted and turned toward God, instead of allowing it to try to delude the God in man. Temptation is a delusive, compelling, conflicting, joy-expecting thought which should be used to pursue happiness making truth and not misery producing error. Although God is the creator of consciousness, still the vitiated consciousness in man turns away from him and tries to lure the soul to concentrate upon the temporary joy of the senses. When Jesus found this, he snubbed his temptation and told it not to be audacious enough to tempt the God in him. Again, the psychological temptation followed Jesus to his very high mountain-like state of self-realization and in a quick mental vision showed him all the power and temporary glory that material possessions could give him and thus lured him with the thought, I will give you all this power and wealth. Further, his psychological delusive habit made him feel that it had complete power over all temporarily glorified material things, and that it had power to give him enjoyment of material objects if only he would fall from his high state of self-control and happiness in spirit, down to the plane of sense enjoyment. A superman, even though he is fixed in a high state of consciousness by deep meditation, he is still subject to the temptations of his past prenatal and postnatal memories of sense enjoyments, which promise all kinds of quickly obtainable pleasures in place of the hard-earned, lasting joy of self-control in meditation. Jesus answered within himself, O oh, ye senses of smell, taste, and touch, you were made to be devoted to the everlasting joy of spirit, and to constantly act and serve in such a way that the joy of spirit would become a permanent habit of the soul. The sense of taste was not given to create greed and indigestion by overeating, but to joyously select the right food in order to help build the temple of God. To eat only for the pleasure of taste produces greed, slavery, indigestion, and death. To eat for the maintenance of the soul's body temple produces self-control, long life, health, and happiness. My senses were given to serve me, thought Jesus, and were not made for me to cater to their insatiable appetite. As a man cannot satisfy his hunger by feeding someone else, so also the soul cannot be happy by catering to the unnatural appetite of the senses. When the psychological delusive habit had finished tempting Jesus with memories of prenatal and postnatal material habits, the delusion of mortal habit departed, for a time at least, giving rise to the feeling of victory for the good habit. The departing of Satan for a season signifies the transcendental state of fixed self-control when the devotee rises above the state of struggle with evil. As soon as the mortal delusive habit disappeared, the angels of intuition, calmness, omniscience, and self-realization appeared in the consciousness of Jesus to serve him with lasting joy and happiness. Chapter 5 Jesus, the Lamb of God, and John, the Baptist, Spirit and Flesh. This is the record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? 
What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Esaias. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptize thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabar beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again the next day after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? The priests and Levites, with only ordinary spiritual perceptions, were naturally skeptical about the qualities of a Christ. Wise men, meeting a Christ-like man, would not ask him if he were Christ, because the wise by their own wisdom can recognize the qualities of a Christ-like man. It was the ignorant priests who asked John if he were the expected Christ. Human consciousness is circumscribed by the circumference of the body, but Christ consciousness is unlimited, stretched over the entire tract of eternity. Many people ignorantly worship the body of Jesus and forget to recognize the consciousness of the Christ which could encompass the entire cosmos with all the island universes, just as a cup can take up all the soup in a vessel. John, being a good saint in spite of his greatness, could not see that he had expressed Christ consciousness in his consciousness. If souls can be made in the image of transcendental God, the Father, they are automatically also made after the pattern of the Christ consciousness present in all creation. My contention is that everyone is a potential Christ, and all those who can make their concentration deep enough and broad enough can receive Christ within their own consciousness. John was a potential Christ, still, due to his identification with ignorance, he could not feel that in essence he had reached the state of Christ consciousness. Therefore, John spoke the truth and confessed that the potential Christ in him had not yet manifested in his outward human consciousness. That is why John confessed, I am not the Christ. John also denied that he was Elias, because as told before he could not remember his previous incarnation as Elias. John as Elias was the Guru preceptor of Jesus. Teachers are many, but there can be but one Guru. He is the vehicle which God uses to bring a prodigal son back to his mansion of freedom. Elias had been spiritually advanced in the earlier incarnation, but had somewhat fallen from his high consciousness during his incarnation as John. It was Jesus, John's disciple, who had advanced so greatly that he was able to remind his guru of his forgotten incarnation. John was humble because he had fallen somewhat spiritually, and he did not want to identify himself with the high state of his previous incarnation as Elias. He said, I am not Elias, in other words, I am not as highly developed in this incarnation as I was when Elias. He gave an evasive answer when he was asked, Who art thou that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make straight the way of the Lord, as saith the prophet Esaias. I am the voice or cosmic sound, crying or vibrating in the wilderness of silence. The wilderness signifies the consciousness of a saint where no green herbs of fresh material desires can grow. The saint makes his soul barren so that God may come in without resistance from the weeds and brambles of material desires. And as John heard the all-knowing cosmic sound within him in the wilderness of silence, he heard the intuitive wisdom command him silently, Make straight the way of the Lord. Manifest the Lord 
or the subjective Christ consciousness in all cosmic vibratory creation through the awakened intuitive feeling of a straight spine during the state of meditation. Though John denied that he was as developed as Elias, still he spoke of his inner spiritual state as having attained the knowledge of expanding omnipresent cosmic vibration. He also made it plain that he not only knew he had attained the cosmic vibratory state, but that he was meditating with a straight spine and trying to open up the spinal centers so that the locked out Christ consciousness could descend into his body. The word straight signifies also following the straight path of truth through which alone the soul can reach God. John told the priests in all spiritual subtleness that he was neither the body of Jesus nor Elias, but that he was the omnipresent cosmic vibration trying to feel Christ consciousness in his body. John also hinted to the ignorant mass of people that the only way by which a metaphysical, omnipresent Christ consciousness could be received is by means of a straight spine with awakened centers of consciousness. The populace was looking for Christ in a physical body, so John subtly told how he was welcoming Christ through a straight spine and said that anyone who wanted to know Christ must receive him in meditation with a straight spine and must follow the straight path of truth. Of course, the physical interpretation is that John cut down the bushes of people's ignorance and created a straight path of truth so that others might follow that path to receive the teachings of Jesus in attaining Christ consciousness. John was also explaining that just worshipping the body of Jesus was not the right way to know him. The Christ consciousness embodied could be felt only in the astrally awakened straight spine. John was educating the people in order that they might know the straight way by which the metaphysical Christ consciousness in the body of Jesus could be understood and intuitionally perceived. The prophet Esaias also knew that the subjective Lord of finite vibratory creation, or Christ consciousness, could be welcomed only through the awakened straight spine in meditation. The flow of life force through the spine and nerves causes man to perceive and appreciate sense objects only, but when the searchlights of the senses are reversed and thrown back on the spirit through the awakened spine, then Christ consciousness is revealed. All the yogis those who seek scientific union with God of India lay the utmost importance on keeping the spine straight during meditation and upon concentration on the point between the eyebrows. The idea is that when the attention is switched off from the senses it begins to withdraw the currents from the sense telephones and to reverse them towards the spiritual eye, situated between the two physical eyes and the medulla. The spiritual eye is a reflection of the medulla. As one switch throws light into the two lights of an automobile, so the medulla throws the current into the two physical eyes, but by making the eye single. In other words, concentrating on the point between the two eyes, one can see the medulla reflected as only one light. The pineal eye and the medulla eye are one and the same, reflected through the two outer eyes. By making the eyes single again, the diffused light of the two physical eyes is seen as one spiritual eye. Jesus said, If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Attention is the conductor of our life currents and consciousness. Those who greedily indulge too much in the pleasures of the senses of touch, smell, taste, sound, and sight find the searchlights of their consciousness and life force turned outward towards matter. But when, by self-control and meditation, the attention is focused on the point between the eyebrows and the spiritual sensorium, then the life force and consciousness steadily begin to throw a revealing light over the Christ consciousness omnipresent in all finite creation. Every spiritual aspirant should know that a bent spine during meditation offers real resistance to the process of reversing the life currents. A bent spine throws the vertebra out of alignment and pinches the nerves, making it impossible for the life force to reverse its direction and flow towards the spiritual eye and the medulla. John Esaias and yogis say that to receive Christ consciousness from Jesus or from a real yogi preceptor, more than a simple physical contact is necessary. 
One must know how to meditate with a straight spine, how to keep the attention switched off from the senses, and how to keep it fixed on the altar of the spiritual eye between the two eyes, where Christ consciousness can be received in all glory. The people sent by the Pharisees, in their ignorance, not understanding the depth of John's statement, asked again, Why baptize if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? This was a foolish question, because John had already told them that he had heard the cosmic voice, and that he had authority to baptize, but in his greatness he went on to say, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you, who ye know not. He it is, who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it, I am not worthy to unloose. John still realized his matter-wardness or attachment to the watery flesh. He was more conscious of the body than of the spirit, and so he thought, I have lots to overcome in order to purify my body before I can baptize my spirit. Since John's concentration was on purifying the body first, he taught the way of baptizing with water. It has been explained elsewhere that cleansing the body with water before a spiritual initiation is conducive to a receptive state of the mind, due to the calming and cooling effect of bathing. After the body is clean, the soul should be baptized by wisdom, magnetism, spiritual radiation, or holy ghost or holy silent, ghost-like vibratory emanations from the preceptor. John knew that he could bring a temporary spiritual influence into the body of his disciples, but that Jesus, with his cosmic aura, could baptize the souls of people with wisdom and with cosmic vibratory emanations. John speaks of Jesus as the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. A lamb is the symbol of innocence, humility, and loyalty. Jesus was innocent, pure, humble, and true to God in every way. His was not the arrogance or power of a tyrant trying to destroy evil. Evil never can be uprooted by evil. Murder can never be abolished by murder. Unless the desire to murder is torn from the heart, it will leave its roots in the hearts of men and go on growing. Evil can only be destroyed by good. Murderers should not be hanged, but should be reformed with wisdom. The thought of murder must be banished from all hearts before killing will leave the shores of this earth. If God, powerful as he is, punished man by physical means, man could not live on earth and exercise his independence of judgment, and thus learn by his own mistakes. Therefore God uses love, and like a lamb lets himself be butchered so that some day by the example of the humble resignation of the lamb to the butcher, he may awaken the higher sympathy and kindness in man. Therefore Jesus came as the Lamb of Spirituality, humble, loyal to God, ready to offer himself as a sacrifice before the Temple of Truth, so that by his supreme example of purity, humbleness, and meekness he might act as the greatest spiritual light to drive away the dark sins of the world. Darkness cannot be chased away by darkness. Sin cannot be dispelled by sin. Lying cannot be stopped by lying. Murder cannot be stopped by hanging. Revengefulness cannot be stopped by revengefulness. Darkness can be dispelled only by light. Sin can be dispelled by righteousness. Lying can be stopped by examples of truthfulness. Murder will cease by example of forgiveness and love, for the murderer's desire to commit murder can only be healed by forgiveness. Revengefulness can cease only by forgiveness. Jesus, Son of God, by his unique example of grand, humble, almighty godliness, has become the light of ages to show people the way out of darkness for all time. John predicted that Jesus would come after him, destined by God to work out his plan of showing people the path of redemption. John at first did not know that Jesus had come, so he continued to baptize with water in the way that he knew best how to do good to mankind. John spoke of the Christ consciousness, immanent in all vibratory cosmic energy, as symbolized in the dove-like spiritual eye, the star-marked opal blue light encased in a ring of golden ray. This light is symbolized by a dove because it brings perennial peace. 
The star represents the mouth of the dove and is the secret passage to cosmic consciousness. The blue and golden lights are the two wings of the dove. The blue represents the cosmic tunnel leading to the perception of the subjective Christ intelligence in all creation. The ring of light represents the objective cosmic energy, cosmic vibration, or the Holy Ghost. The spiritual eye is composed of the life-drawn like electron or the finest ultimate unit of intelligence and energy. It is finer than electrons, of which all matter and consciousness are composed. Each microcosmic life-drawn contains in miniature the essence of all the macrocosmic creation. The cosmos is made of the transcendental God, the Father, the consciousness beyond all creation, and God, the Son, the consciousness of the Father reflected in the womb of cosmic energy as the only begotten, only reflected Christ consciousness and the Holy Ghost or cosmic vibration. This cosmic vibration appears as the cosmic sound of all life drawns and cosmic energy. Microcosmically each life drawn, or the spiritual eye in man, is composed of the elements God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, or of transcendental cosmic consciousness, of Christ consciousness, and of cosmic energy. However, John said, I saw the Spirit descending from his abode of heavenly bliss in the form of a microcosmic spiritual eye and rest upon Jesus. The spiritual telescopic eye of Jesus was open through this, and he could perceive the macrocosmic manifestations of cosmic consciousness, Christ consciousness and cosmic energy. Ordinary man, through his physical eyes, sees only his body and a little portion of the earth at a time, but any man, like Jesus, can see the spiritual dove alight in him, i.e. behold through his telescopic spiritual eye the entire kingdom of cosmic energy and the consciousness existing in and beyond it. Spirit by cosmic vibration had instructed John to baptize people with water, and then the same Spirit showed John the mystery of baptism by Spirit. Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw it and bear record that this is the Son of God. Any man who can see his spiritual eye, not temporarily, but always, and who can see the omnipresent Spirit through it, can baptize people with the omnipresent, sacred cosmic magnetism Holy Ghost. Simply seeing the light or showing others the light of the spiritual eye is not enough as advanced students of precept to given Kriya, the highest art of realization can. One must be able to perceive the spirit through the spiritual eye. This is what is meant by the spirit remaining on Am. When we can do that we can summon the Almighty Spirit to envelop the disciple with the cosmic magnetism. Of course, the disciple must be advanced and deserving in order to be able to receive such a baptism in omniscience by his advanced Kiru preceptor who is saturated with cosmic consciousness. Chapter 6 Calling the Apostles, Jesus the Man and Jesus the Christ They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the meshes, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. Andrew, after staying with Jesus for a day, was so saturated with his spiritual magnetism that he understood who Jesus was. After a short acquaintance with Jesus, Andrew became filled with the vibration of Jesus the Christ. Christ consciousness cannot be intellectually inferred, but has to come through intuitional awareness. There is a difference between Jesus, the Son of Man, and Jesus, the Son of God. Significance of Christ Vibration The cosmic energy and cosmic consciousness enter the medulla oblongata as positive and negative currents, 
forming a series of attracting magnets. Each individual is a bundle of these magnets and attracts others according to their strength. Jesus was a Christ magnet empowered to attract all men as compared with the ordinary man who can attract very little. All the parts of the body which come in pairs, eyes, ears, big and little tongues, hands, feet, and so on, receive and radiate positive and negative currents and each pair forms a magnet with more or less power. The optical magnet can charm, enthrall, and draw people so strongly that they may feel the magnetism of one's soul through the eyes. Some highly developed people are able to spiritualize or heal a whole audience just by the magnetism of the eyes. The laying of the hands on sick people is done to send the healing X-rays of the hands into the body of the patient to electrocute the disease germs. There is no power greater than the life force flowing through the hands, provided it is made strong by an indomitable will. Man's strong will, which refuses to be discouraged by anything and which flows continually and energetically toward the accomplishment of an object, becomes divinely empowered. The strong will of man is divine will. The best way to know an individual is to reside with him in the same house. Two people living in the same room, even if they did not talk, would attract each other with their consciousness, nature, vitality, and so forth. Each would feel the silent emanation of the other's thoughts, life force, and the range and strength of his vital magnetism. Each man carries a telltale silent evidence of his own vibrations with him. All unbiased, spiritually sensitive souls can know people simply by looking into their eyes, or by merely coming in close contact with them and feeling their emanating vibrations. Worried, calm, timid, brave, cruel, wise, or godly people can be felt instantly even by people with little spiritual perception. People with ordinary perception can feel others only when within close range of their magnetism. Great minds, however, can feel one another from a distance, although perception is stronger if they have been closely associated for a while. Thus it was that Andrew's great soul, after remaining with Jesus for a day, felt his Christ magnetism and he was able to say to his brother Simon, We have found the Messiah. We find Christ defined in the Bible as the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. The definition is very deep and subtle. It means that the soul wave is usually encased in the physical body of 16 elements and in the astral and ideational bodies of 19 elements. It is corked in these bodies by ignorance and material desires and is unable to mingle with the ocean of spirit which surrounds it. With the change of the physical body, called death, the soul remains encased in the astral and ideational bodies and is still unable to loosen its life wave to join the ocean of spirit. It is possible by higher meditation for the soul to free itself from the physical and astral worlds and then to merge itself in the ocean of Christ consciousness. That is why in the above passage it is stated that this Christ consciousness can be experienced only by those souls who have seen the complete death or dissolution of their encaging physical, astral, and ideational bodies, and not by all who are merely physically dead. In the human consciousness the soul experiences itself as identified with the physical body name, titles, possessions, nationality, and so forth. In the subconscious state, the soul cognizes itself as the restless power of dreams or as the formless piece of deep sleep. In the superconscious state, the soul feels itself as undiluted, formless, ever new joy. In the state of Christ consciousness, the soul, emerging from its three dead bodies, feels the Christ intelligence in all creation as the conscious, supreme, princely intelligence guiding all other kingly powerful forces which govern the earth and all matter. Jesus the man could feel his consciousness, not only as residing in and governing the body, but he could also feel it as the Christ intelligence pervading all the space cells of his finite cosmic body. It is important to note the difference between Jesus the man and Jesus the Christ. Jesus was the name of the man. The Sanskrit origin of this name is found in the word Issa or Lord of Creation. 
mispronounced by travelers in many lands, and being used in many different languages, the word Jesus came to be used in place of Issa. The Spanish pronounce it Jesus. Different people, with voices influenced by different climates, pronounce the same words differently and give birth to different languages with different spellings. The word Calcutta is spelled differently by different races. The English spell and pronounce it Calcutta. The Bengalese pronounce it and spell it Calicutta. The Western Hindus pronounce and spell it Calicutta. Some Norwegians pronounce and spell the same word as Kolkita. This illustrates how the name Issa could be changed through the ages into Jesus. Originally names expressed a quality of an individual. Then they were handed down from father to son for generations. This complicated matters and later each individual had to have the name of his family and also a name signifying his individuality. This may be illustrated by my own name, which is a combination of yoga and ananda. Yoga means scientific union and ananda means bliss. The distinctive quality is the love of scientific union of the soul with God. For that reason, the name of yoga was given by my master. Ananda corresponds a family name, but in this case it belongs to the order of swamis and means those men who seek divine bliss. Jesus the Christ likewise has meaning. Jesus was the name given by the family signifying a divine child, or Lord of creation, and the name Christ was given later and signified the Christ consciousness which was manifest in the body of Jesus. Strangely enough, the family of Jesus, seeing the miraculous signs which attended his birth, named him Lord of Creation or Issa and later, due to changes in pronunciation, called him Jesus. Sanskrit name Kitasha Chaitanya or Christ Consciousness, and the name of one of the greatest prophets of India, Christina, who lived about 1500 BC, show that the word Christ is very ancient word meaning the unchangeable consciousness present in every atom of matter and in every speck of finite creation. The Hindu prophet was called Jadava the Christina. Jadava was the family name Christina the spiritual name. Jesus the Christ signifies that the body of Jesus was the vehicle in which the Christ consciousness or universal intelligence present in everything was manifest. People through different ages have sought the Messiah or the Christ who could turn their attention from the soul's consciousness of little portions of the matter world such as country, society and family to the omnipresence of Christ consciousness. Throughout the ages when the souls of people instead of being identified with Christ consciousness became entangled in individual, family, social and national consciousness, they became limited producing many miseries. Blind attachment of family property and so on leads to selfishness, quarrelsomeness, delusion of permanent possession, inharmony, worries and the like. So-called blind patriotism produces commercial greed, desire of wresting the possessions of others from them, and terrible wars. After souls suffer by repeatedly passing through family, social, and national troubles in different incarnations, they automatically desire to be released from misery and long to find emancipation through a Christ-like Savior. The Bhagavad Gita says that self-liberated souls are used again and again as vehicles of God and are sent on earth to express the Christ consciousness in order to help release matter entangled souls. God never created himself into a human being subject to the weakness of flesh and mental limitations. If God manufactured Jesus Christ as his Son, already complete and perfect, then the temptations of Jesus by Satan and his victory were nothing but divine acting. Christ, who was already above death and temptations, could not have needed any mental strength to overcome them. Hence, Jesus, as a perfect Son of God, could not be an example for us. Jesus was a liberated soul, one of the greatest that ever came on earth. He had struggled through many incarnations in order to come to that Christ state, and it was during the Christ state in which he could feel his consciousness in every atomic cell of his great body of all matter that he could act as the savior of mankind. It is only in this state that any soul is able to feel its perfect identity with God.
Jesus himself said that all those who received him in other words were mentally advanced enough and spiritually transparent enough to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. In the words of Andrew we first find the differentiation between Jesus and Christ. And when Jesus beheld him Simon Peter he said, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas which is by interpretation a stone. Jesus saw Simon Peter and predicted that his spiritual life would be strong as a stone. The day following Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. When great masters, like Jesus, come on earth, they bring with them their advanced disciples in order to give them the higher teaching and to test their spirituality on the psychological battlefield of the earth. So Jesus, knowing his previous guru preceptor and disciple relationship with Philip, calmly said, Follow me. This was a command to Philip, for Jesus recognized his spiritual responsibility as a preceptor toward Philip as his disciple. Jesus indicated that Philip should tune his instinct-guided reason and will power with the higher wisdom-guided reason and will power of Jesus because that was the only way Philip could free himself from mortal delusion and overcome the compelling temptation of flesh. Delusion and prenatal bad habits may completely overpower the reason and will power of disciple during crucial tests when the delusive dictates of his own reason seem to him to be virtuous and true. In this state the disciple should never trust to his own decisions about new undertakings of his life. Vice wears the cloak of virtuous reason to lure him away from the spiritual path. At that time the foresight of the preceptor should be consulted and his advice should be followed obediently by the disciple, even though his own befogged reason may rebel and tell him to do otherwise. In the delusive state the best undertakings may end in a disaster for Satan, the universal metaphysical tempter, tries by every means to take the virtuous man from the spiritual path. Now Philip was a Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael saith unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith unto him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Philip quotes the intuitive revelations of Moses and the prophets about the coming of Jesus the Christ. This raises the question, are the happenings on this earth and earthly human affairs all predestined? We do not think so, but if not, how could Moses and the prophets foretell the coming of Christ? We think it was this way. Moses, by his intuitive foresight, was able to trace the law of cause and effect which governs human life. He knew also of the law of God which sends self-emancipated, Christ-like souls onto the earth at different ages, when the people of the earth become burdened with sin. God uses the vehicles of Christ-like souls to inspire sorrow-laden mortal beings with the courage to seek salvation. Nathaniel was a plain-spoken, sincere man, and he knew the sin-laden state of Nazareth, and naturally he expressed doubt that such a place could ever produce a savior. Philip was practical, and without argument tried to bring Nathaniel into the transmuting personal magnetism of Jesus Christ. Philip knew that Christ, by his very look and his magnetic life force, could electrocute the seeds of bad habits and doubts that had formed grooves in the brain of Nathaniel. Jesus gave Nathaniel a soul-penetrating look which scorched out his ignorance and took an intuitive photograph of his life. That is why Jesus said, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. Behold a soul which is free from satanic insincerity. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and saith unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael was astonished to hear Jesus analyze him so correctly, and he wanted to know how it was done. So Jesus said, Before Philip called thee, I saw thee. This seeing was not by the superficial eye, but it was the intuitive photograph of the soul taken on the sensitive perception of Jesus, who was omniscient and versed in the art of telepathy. 
omnipresent God would never be born on earth as a human being, for God in his greatness could never completely identify himself with the limitations of temptation, mortality, and so forth a human existence. Unless God could forget himself in a human incarnation, he could never in reality struggle with the limitations of human nature and make himself a spiritual example to us. If Jesus was already God and came as God, his trials and sorrows, struggles, victory over Satan and crucifixion were but divine acting. In the case, Jesus acted out the preordained divine part of his life without being touched by it, just as an actor plays a part on the stage without being inwardly identified with it. Such a divinely manufactured Jesus could never inspire faith in weak human beings so that they could conquer evil, but a God-man Jesus, who struggled to the highest spiritual freedom, could be a universal human example, and that would save God from being accused of the partiality of making one soul the son of God and all other souls the sons of temptation and weakness. God uses only about to be perfect souls to serve as examples and teachers to deluded humans. It has occurred sometimes that perfect angels of God have consciously come on earth to show people how they should behave by leading exemplary lives. Even the highest and all-powerful saints express their natures in the human body through humility, meekness, forgiveness, undying love, and unselfishness, instead of through miraculous physical forces. In evil submerged human life the tendency is to suppress wrong by physical force. When the human limitation vanishes for man, then he uses only the superior, nobler forces of love, instead of machine guns and revengefulness, to right the wrongs in individual and collective life. Even if great saints are tortured or ridiculed on earth, they behave divinely, using only the highest and noblest moral methods to conquer evil. Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Jesus said to Nathanael, I saw thee under the fig tree, in other words I saw thy soul under the nerve branches of the cerebrospinal tree. Jesus, by his spiritual eye, saw Nathanael's soul resting under the astral nervous system fig tree. Man's body is an upturned tree with roots of hair and cranial nerves at the base of the trunk of the spinal tree of life, shooting out branches of the nervous system. Any spiritual adept looking into another soul deeply can see the soul and its astral nervous system. Spiritual souls have a refined astral nervous system. Material souls have the poor figs of material desires vibrating on the branches of their astral nervous system. The above explains how Jesus saw Nathanael under the fig tree. Nathanael might have been under a real fig tree and Jesus could have seen him there, but here Jesus speaks of seeing Nathanael, not with physical eyes, but with the telescopic spiritual eye which can reveal the remotely situated fig tree of the astral nervous system in the kingdom of the unseen. Nathanael could feel the astral body of Jesus entering into his. That is why in an instant he said, Thou art the Son of God. A son of man is attracted to one body, and is unconsciously ejected only at the time of death, but a son of God, like Jesus, feels his omnipresent consciousness existing in his great body of all matter. Jesus, although apparently existing and working through one body, was not limited by it, but could transfer his consciousness into any other body and feel its sensations, perceptions and thoughts and emotions. Jesus, through his omniscience, could simultaneously feel his own body or any group of bodies at the same time. That is why he said, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing and one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? Jesus, being one with the father, had the same omniscient consciousness that his father had. Therefore Nathanael, feeling the consciousness of Jesus transferred within himself, 
felt himself divinely transmuted and acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God and the King of Israel. The first title is the divine title and is of tremendous significance. Nathaniel spoke of Jesus as the Son of God and owner of the universe and being such, he was also the greatest power king in Israel, which lay somewhere on this little pill of earth situated in God's kingdom of the universe. Jesus answered and said, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Jesus was pleased to find Nathanael respond to his spiritual vibrations. Nathanael's belief in the words of Jesus was the result of the vibratory experience which Nathanael received from Jesus. Many people do not believe even after they feel a truth, so Jesus said unto Nathanael, As you believe in me just receiving my vibrations, you will see greater things, greater miracles than these, in other words, than these miracles of my sending to you astral and thought vibrations. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Verily, I say unto you, Afterwards you shall see the astral region through the opening of the telescopic spiritual eye, and you shall see the luminous astral bodies ascending out of the dead physical bodies into the astral kingdom. Also you shall behold many astral bodies descending into the physical bodies of newly conceived babies. Son of man signifies the physical body. In Genesis, God created the firmament. He called the firmament heaven, and he divided the waters from the waters. Space is the pearly gate of heaven, which hides the finer forces of waters, and the waters gross elements under the firmament gathered together and the dry land appeared. The gross elements lie on the outward boundary of space. Different races conceive of heaven according to their racial habits of thought. Certain sects believe that heaven is filled with large-eyed damsels, fine food, and so forth, even as the fish who live in water might conceive of human beings living on earth as a heaven of celestial fishes, all swimming in water. Just as this is absurd, so most human beings talk of heaven as a place where cool breezes blow evermore, where weather is not violent, where all kinds of fruits can be found, and where winged angels move. We can easily see the idea that angels were given wings because of the human desire to be like the birds, freely flying where they choose. Modern man may picture angels using airplanes moving at the rate of 4,000 miles an hour, Yet, when we think how fast light and electricity move, the flight of airplanes seems like the movement of an ox cart. The time will come when man will learn to change the atomic vibrations of his gross body and make them into an astral force. It is then that he will be able to shoot along with the astral light rays at the rate of 500 million miles per second, even faster than material light. When man learns astral traveling, he will find that he can travel faster than light, but when man learns the full mystery of mind, he will be able to travel faster than any force, material light or astral. If he wished to be in the sun or the moon or the fastest star, he could be there instantly. Jesus speaks of the opening of heaven. This is possible in two ways. 1. By losing limitations of the physical eyes which see nothing but the gross vibrations of matter through years of practice and looking into and penetrating the spiritual eye until it is possible to see into the astral heaven. 2. By having the vibrations of space and other finer walls of lights removed through the command of the ultimate intelligence, then man can see the luminous astral kingdom hidden behind the firmament. In the astral kingdom everything is light. There is astral land, astral sea, astral air, astral skies, astral darkness and light and astral gardens and beings, all made of the different vibrations of light. They may be compared to different kinds of fish which have to live in differently vibrating spheres. It is difficult for astral beings living in grosser vibrations to go into the subtle astral vibratory sphere where finer astral bodies live. We have astral gardens and flowers planted on the soil of the ether. They surpass any human description. Here the flowers glow like Chinese star shells, 
ever growing and ever changing, and ever adapting themselves to the fancy of the astral beings and disappearing when they are not wanted. They come back again with new colors and fragrance when desired again. Here the astral beings drink many hued lights from living fountains falling from the bosom of astral mountains. Here millions of miles of deep and wide astral oceans heave with azure, opal, green, silver, gold, blood red, yellow and aquamarine lights. Diamond-colored waves dance in perpetual rhythm of beauty. Astral beings swim here and use all their subtle senses as we use them in the dreamland. The only difference is that there is more beauty and perfection in the astral world than on the earth. The earth is so full of decay and destruction. In the astral world the havoc done by an astral earthquake could be remedied by mere willing. Of course this astral kingdom decays slowly and is a billion times older and longer lived than earth has been or is going to be. In astral kingdom there is only spiritual marriage and children, are created by the immaculate method of condensing the positive or negative thoughts and will and feeling tendencies of parents into the form of a male or female child. The positive thought producing a male child, the negative thought producing a female child. In the astral world there is birth and death. Souls promoted from the earth are born in the astral kingdom, and when they leave at the end of their good karma, they go back to the earth, or to similar inhabited planets and other island universes. Some souls who developed in the astral kingdom do not die there, but consciously lift themselves into the omnipresent bosom of God and become one with God. Jesus had gone beyond the astral world, so he said, I and my Father are one. Souls who consciously spiritually develop on earth, and who can retain their consciousness during the transition of death, can come into the astral land and consciously develop until final freedom in God is attained. Then the karma-compelled journey of reincarnations toward the earth is stopped. In the astral land souls do not use imperfect, limited, mortal intelligence and senses. There they use various grades of semi-developed intuition and highly developed intelligence. The astral land is conspicuous for the absence of books, for the astral beings can concentrate upon anything and know about its nature through the instantaneous knowledge-producing power of intuition. Here in astral land we find highly developed saints and also ordinary beings with only semi-developed intuitions. It is only after becoming one with God that a soul does not have to read books or concentrate upon anything in order to know it by intuition. When a soul becomes one with God, that soul's intuition, being identified with spirit, already knows all and sees all without trying to know anything, even by the effort of intuition. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, beheld the two brothers casting a net to catch fish in the sea. And Jesus, turning toward them, told them what he thought about fishing, and that he wanted them to learn about fishing for souls. All masters teach in parables, and Jesus thought, like a Hindu master thought, when he said, O Divine Mother, passing by the sea of my consciousness, I behold my ego catching the small bony fishes of material objects, such as name and fame. Bless me so that I may see, instead, the way to catch with my net of devotion, the large fishes of divine truth seeking souls swimming in the sea of my unruffled consciousness. It is common to catch fish in the sea for one's own paltry self but to catch truth-seeking souls in the net of heavenly devotion in order to present them to God is a great achievement. To catch fish and eat them may help to appease physical hunger, but it is not so good for the fish. Catch souls in the net of one's own truth conviction and bring them to God brings harm to no one. On the contrary, it brings the divine blessing for the soul fisherman, and it also eventually liberates the fishers of souls. Blessed are those who fish for souls, for that is the highest spiritual activity on earth. To seek one's own salvation, 
and not benefit others by it is extreme selfishness. But to seek salvation for yourself so that ultimate freedom may be shared with others is divine. To try to bring salvation to others without first having it yourself is impossible. You can give only what you have and nothing else. In order to give spiritual power, you must first acquire the power yourself. God loves to see a son consciously seek him, but he is extremely pleased when he finds that son exhorting another son to come unto him. When a spirit bound, truant soul inspires another spiritual fugitive to return to God, that is considered the highest human duty. In all the churches in the world ministers should not concentrate upon catching only materially rich souls and bringing them into the fold to be devoured by the tiger of church dogma. All religious teachers should seek to convert souls, not for their money, nor for the purpose of swelling the number of church members, but only for bringing them to the all-freeing presence of God. The commercial spiritual teacher uses his students to further his own ends, while the true spiritual teacher uses the student's attention to bring him unto God. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther thence, he saw James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants, and went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for they taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. The Sabbath day is meant to be a time of rest and repose. It is the seventh day, or day of rest, following six days of hard material activity. God is supposed to have worked out his creation in six days, and on the seventh day to have taken rest. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Of course in Genesis the seven days were not solar days but consisted of several cycles. It seems that creation took much time and everything was evolved under the direction of the active intelligence of God. When most of creation had come into being, the directly active intelligence of God became inactive or indirectly active and when most of the desires of God to create were accomplished, His will and intelligence had to take a rest. Hence there is a rest period in creative activity, when very little creation of new planets and so forth goes on. So it looks as if the universe in which we are situated has a kindred vibration with us. If rest is needed after activity, each human being should have a Sabbath. Observance of the Sabbath day does not signify the hypocritical denial of such activities as dancing or transacting business only, but it signifies the willing cessation of all activities which scatter and divert the mind. People should willingly stay away from diversion and material entertainments on the Sabbath day. Forced to see a picture like the Kings of Kings concerning Jesus on the Sabbath day is spiritually stimulating instead of degrading. On the other hand, if too many materially interesting diversions are kept alive on Sabbath days, the minds of people will be running riot in that direction. The idea is that a rest on the seventh day must be willingly cultivated so that the soul may recharge itself with calmness, introspection, and creative thinking to adopt the best actions for an all-round existence during the coming week. A Sabbath well spent in silence, meditation, and creative thinking affords the soul reinforcement with harmony, peace, and mental and physical strength with which to use the discrimination to develop, not only physically, but mentally and spiritually, in the best possible way. The man who works seven days a week lets his soul become governed by mechanical activity. Such a person forgets to govern his activity by free will, discrimination, and peace. He easily becomes a physical wreck and mental wreck and loses spiritual happiness. Activity and calmness must both be cultivated and fostered in order to produce peace and happiness during the periods of activity as well as during those of silence. The Sabbath day must be used for the most part in real spiritual activity 
which helps the soul to be recharged by the greatest power and wisdom of God. Spend the Sabbath by attending morning services for one hour and then spending the rest of the day eating, idling and sleeping will not do. The real observance of the Sabbath consists in spending it in seclusion, fasting and meditation. The reader may say that this is impossible in modern times. Well, I can say in reply, you might just as well say that it is impossible to be peaceful in modern times. In order to be peaceful and God intoxicated, you must pay the price. You must give the time necessary to the cultivation of peace. The one reason why the modern generation is so restless is because children are allowed to go to the movies and indulge in all kinds of restless activities following the short, uninteresting Sunday school classes in the morning. The members in every home, both adults and children, should observe one day a week of complete silence, as Mahatma Gandhi, one of the world's greatest spiritual and active reformers of the day did. The Sabbath can be made most interesting by complete ecstatic communion with God. There is no happiness greater than joy contact of God and deep meditation. To keep children or yourself away from the movies and other distractions just because it is the Sabbath is not enough but to merge yourself and your children in the greater happiness of God ecstasy by meditation constitutes your real observation of the Sabbath. Jesus was always filled with the Spirit, hence to him every day was a Sabbath day. He did not need an extra deep communion with God only on Sunday. For God was with him always and he preferred to share his ecstatic joy with others on that day. Jesus observed Sunday Sun's Day, or Wisdom's Day by teaching people that they should pass the Sabbath with the authoritative presence of God or otherwise. They were told to meditate on God until they could transmit their divinely saturated consciousness to others. So Jesus entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and spoke with God's saturated conviction of the truth in his work. Words are like bullets, but they can be effective only if they are charged with the gunpowder of spiritual conviction. If you try to sell a thing, or an idea, or a belief in which you do not wholly believe in yourself, your words, no matter how clever, will lack luster and be wanting in the ammunition of the proper zeal born of conviction. To sell something for the purpose of rendering material or spiritual service is good. The wages and compensation for rendering such service, when used mostly for rendering further spiritual service to all men, is really spiritually admirable. A person who uses his hard-earned wages for spreading God's work is a much better man than the one who pockets all free will offerings and collections given to him for his material pleasures, under the pretext of not charging anything for spiritual services. It is better to have a definite charge for books and lessons, and to spend the income therefrom in propagating God's cause than for the teacher to use all the free will offerings for himself. Jesus was absorbed with God and tried to sell his conviction of him to others. However, Jesus did not preach like the scribes with empty words, but when he spoke his words were filled with the cosmic energy of God. The words of Jesus were filled with the wisdom conviction born of cosmic consciousness. His words vibrated with the authority of God's wisdom. His sermons bore the seal of God's assurance. This is a hint to all ministers of the gospel. It is not enough to commit to memory the words of the scriptures and to stand on a soapbox to preach. One should digest the truth contained in the words of all Bibles and then preach with power and conviction. Few people listen to soapbox orators, and those who do forget what they have heard, but when God speaks through a soul, then mountains of doubts are removed from the minds of his listeners. Face-to-face -face realization of truth gives one intuitive conviction and true vision and understanding. True wisdom gives power, for knowledge is the energy that moves the cosmic factory. Wisdom produces power over all things and power declares the absolute authority of infallible truth. Jesus, unlike the scribes, spoke, not with the authority of fanaticism or imagination, but with the authority born of self-realization of God and a knowledge of all his mysteries. And it came to pass when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, 
for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. When he was come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And it came to pass that, as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Throngs pressed upon Jesus as he stood by Lake Genesaret. He saw two ships anchored while the fishermen had gone out to wash their nets. He boarded one ship to ask Simon to move the ship a little way from the shore, but he sat down and taught the people from the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. Jesus told Simon to go into the deep sea and cast his net. He wanted to demonstrate to Simon the abundance in God and to show that even the fish obeyed the divine command. Besides this, Jesus wanted Simon to go deep into the oceanic hearts of people and catch their souls in the net of wisdom, and bring them unto God, and make them immortal. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net brake. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished and all that were with him at the draft of the fishes which they had taken. And so was also James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. Simon did as he was told by Jesus even though he had no luck in hauling fishes after a whole night's toil. So many fishes filled Simon's net that it broke. The partners from the other ship, James and John, were called to help with the catch. They came and filled both ships so that they began to sink. At this sign of the power of Jesus, Simon Peter fell down at the feet of Jesus, repenting of his sins. James, John, and all the others were astonished at the hull of fishes. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Though Jesus advocated fishing for food, as the people's lives depended upon the seafood, still he brought out a great truth in the miracle of hauling fish which he performed. He told Simon Peter to learn how to cast the net of wisdom and to take the soul fishes roaming in the poison waters of delusion and let them loose in the immortalizing sea of God wisdom. The question might come to the mind of the ordinary reader. Why did Jesus ask Simon to be a teacher when he had not undergone even the rudimentary spiritual teachings? This is because Jesus had taught Simon in a previous incarnation, and even though Simon didn't know it, Jesus could see Simon's spiritual attainments in the astral marking in his brain, so he asked Simon to catch deluded men, prodigal children of God, and to bring them back to the ever-freeing mansion of God. Only the spirit-baptized and ecstasy-baptized person can spiritually baptize another soul and bring him to the doors of God and ecstatic heaven. Catching souls by advertisements, just to fill the church, and then stuffing them with hackneyed teachings is not enough. One must be in ecstasy with God during preaching, and then be must cast the net of his blissful perception over his listeners. In this way real souls will be hauled into the everlasting nectar sea of God perception. And as Jesus passed forth from thence he saw a man named Matthew, a publican named Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, Follow me. In these words we hear the intuitive command of Jesus when, at the sight of Matthew, he recognized one whom he had known in many past incarnations. Great masters, such as Jesus, often bring with them into embodiment great disciples to help them in the enactment of the divine drama on earth. Jesus knew that Matthew had been born as a publican, the son of Alphaeus, in order that God might be glorified. Even though Matthew was a publican, his inner consciousness, which had been acquired in a previous incarnation, remained unchanged. Jesus showed that the divine son Matthew was high in the path of spirit even though he was a publican. 
Jesus knew Matthew as a divine son in spite of his lowly birth and occupation and called him with a firm, confident voice which echoed with the recognition of past incarnations. Physical scientists expose nature's truth, but spiritual masters, by their actions, reveal the nature of the drama of reincarnation which governs human lives. Think what it means that out of the multitude of people surrounding him, Jesus glimpsed the publican, Matthew, whom he had not seen before in that particular body, and immediately commanded, Follow me. And Matthew followed, not because of a hypnotic spell, but because he too felt the call of past recognition. And he left all, rose up, and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And it came to pass that, as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they murmured against his disciples, saying, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? Matthew left all and followed Jesus and gave him the customary feast. Most spiritual activities are attended by feasts. All people, Christians, Hindus, Jews, all have feasts in connection with religious ceremonies. Even though feasts are distractions at such times, they are necessary when the disciples of a master gather from far and near. If the disciples would eat elsewhere and come to the master for meditation only without the digression of feasting, it would be better. The sole doctor, Jesus, ate, drank, and associated with the spiritually sick publicans and sinners who needed him, while the hypocritical Pharisees and scribes, who were accustomed to associating with the rich and the outwardly devout Orthodox people, criticized and asked why Jesus associated with sinners. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick, I come not call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. As healthy people do not require a physician, so spiritually virtuous people, who are able to redeem themselves by their own good actions, do not require the help of a spiritual doctor. Jesus realized that he had been appointed by the Heavenly Father as the spiritual doctor to cure ignorance-stricken souls, and he, therefore, associated with sinners and publicans who might benefit by his presence. Jesus did not care to redeem the righteous who could redeem themselves, but he came into the world to save those who suffered and sinned. Righteous people are the ones who act properly and ideally in the various situations in life which call for righteous actions. Such actions are those which are performed with the satisfaction of the inner consciousness. Righteous people need no guide because their spiritual sense or conscience keeps them on the right path and prevents them from wandering into the jungles of ignorance. Sinners are those who misuse their God-given reason to do that which is wrong. By the repetition of wrong actions, evil habits are developed. Sinners are guided into the labyrinthine ways of inextricable error, and thus they suffer constantly. They need to be guided by Christ-like, spiritual doctors, until they are able to control themselves by their own salvaged conscience. People who repeat evil actions usually begin to like evil ways in spite of the suffering involved. Therefore, sinners must first be reasoned with so that their paralyzed reason may be brought back to life. Once the reason is awakened, repentance usually follows, for then people are sorry for their evil actions and want to be free from their evil habits. By convincing the heart of the folly and misery involved in evil actions, the sinner is called upon to awaken himself and make a dash for spiritual liberty. Without understanding the nature of sorrow producing sinful actions, the sinner can never repent. Repentance is the forerunner of spiritual liberty. Ordinarily, sinners without repentance do not make an effort to liberate themselves spiritually. Jesus knew that all he could do for the sinner was to awaken his spiritual reason and thus make him sorry for his evil actions and thereby ultimately cause him to use his free will to choose righteousness in preference to evil. To be able to awaken repentance in a sinner is to show him the way by which he can make the effort to redeem himself. The sinner cannot redeem himself until he is convinced of the error of his evil ways. 
Therefore, he must repent when he sees the folly of his evil actions, and must use his free will to repeat good karma actions, and thus redeem himself by his own good actions. Great doctors of souls can inspire metaphysical truants to retrace their footsteps Godward, but the actual walking back to the divine home must be done by the error-stricken souls themselves. Great spiritual teachers never claim to forgive sinners, but they expect to awaken the sinners to the point where they will make an effort to become spiritually emancipated. If sins could be forgiven by human beings, then one person could relieve another from feeling the effects of swallowing poison through self-created error. However, the effects of evil action can be neutralized by the effect of good actions. No one can prevent other people from reaping the effects of their evil actions, but if they themselves become sufficiently awakened, they will be able to free themselves from evil by their own efforts. Repentance for evil action already performed is a forerunner to the effort required to attain freedom from evil. Also the sincere and continuous effort to free oneself from evil is the forerunner to real spiritual freedom. Chapter 7 Jesus' Relationship with the Apostles And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, and they come and say unto him, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast often and make prayers, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can ye make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. Just as the bride does not fast while she is with the bridegroom, so also the disciples did not need to fast or to discipline themselves while they were with their master, who was the extreme example of discipline. The very presence of the master Jesus among his disciples was sufficient help for them through the exchange of spiritual vibrations. Fasting at times is necessary for the health of the body and consequently for the purity of the mind. Fasting makes the soul feel free from its bodily bondage. However, Jesus was spirit, and all of the people who were fortunate enough to contact him automatically felt the spiritual freedom emanating directly from him without having to create that freedom by the mere abstinence of food. Jesus emphasized the fact that the disciples need not create spiritual freedom by fasting, since he could inspire them with spiritual vibrations directly from his limitless store of spiritual power. However, Jesus did not ignore the value and necessity of fasting and its spiritual influence on the minds of men, and so he said that the time would come when he would be taken away and they would then have to fast and discipline the body in order to bring it nearer to the spirit. And he spake also a parable unto them, No man also soweth a piece of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse, and the peace that was taken out of the new agreeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish, but new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith the old is better. No one should be so foolish as to patch an old garment with new material, for the new strong piece will pull away more of the worn-out material and thus make the rent in the old garment bigger than before. Furthermore, the new material will not match the old cloth. Jesus meant also that the new inspiration emanating directly from his spirit did not fit in with the old-fashioned stereotyped ways of spiritual living. He was living in truth, and in a dynamic new way he was emancipating the new spirit of the disciples who understood him. He realized that his new spirit was of little use for mending the custom-worn, dilapidated, antediluvian, dogmatic habits of the people in general. His new inspiration and new ways of living truth would not harmonize with the old dogmatic theological living. Jesus went on to explain that, as new wine should not be put into old bottles lest the new wine burst the old bottles, so new, powerful inspiration could not very well be put into dogma-worn minds without exploding old beliefs or causing mental rebellion. 
His new inspirations ought to be housed in newly enthusiastic and powerful souls in order to produce a good and harmonious effect. No man, having drunk the wine of old dogma, could have a taste for new truths. He would say, Ah, I know it all. The old rules of the forefathers, no matter how bad, were good enough for them, so they are good enough for me. Through force of habit, he would prefer the old ways of dogmatic living to new habits of spiritual emancipation. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. No man putteth a piece of new cloth into an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Neither do men put new wine into old bottles, else the bottles break, and the wine runneth out, and the bottles perish. But they put new wine into new bottles, and both are preserved. Can the disciples living in the divine consciousness or bride chamber of their master, the divine bridegroom, mourn or undergo physical discipline? What Jesus means is that he and his disciples were so wrapped in the consciousness of God they did not have to fast in order to forget the daily contact with food and thus revive God consciousness. Fasting not only does good to the body, but if properly done impresses the consciousness with the knowledge that the body is not dependent on food alone but on the Spirit of God. Those who fast and meditate realize they are in tune with God and do not have to depend on food only for sustenance. Theresa Newman of Konarstruth, Germany, who was in the ecstasy of God, did not eat at all. Jesus says, When the bridegroom his great spiritual personality will be withdrawn into heaven, the disciples would partially lose that spiritual contact and would have to fast and in order to be free from bodily attachment and to revive the consciousness of God. As it is foolish to put a new piece of cloth in an old garment or new wine in an old bottle, so it would be foolish for my disciples, filled with the nectar of new thoughts, to follow old mechanical rules. And as new wines with expanding power should not be but into worn-out bottles, so my disciples, intoxicated with the wine of divine wisdom, should not be following age-old popular superstitions or hard and fast rules of conduct. As new wine should be kept in new bottles, so my disciples, intoxicated with the wine of new wisdom and bliss, will live in bottles or atmospheres of new living. As new wine will split open an old bottle, so my God-intoxicated disciples could not very well maintain themselves bottled up in atmosphere of mechanical spiritual living, but being God-intoxicated by following the spirit of new rules, they have not to observe any mechanical spiritual discipline in their lives. They are already experiencing that for which the rules were made, therefore, there is no need for them to observe those old rules for they are now above them. But Jesus pointed out that the disciples would go through strict discipline when the atmosphere of his spiritual personality would be withdrawn from them into God. Chapter 8 Jesus ordains the apostles to preach, heal, and cast out devils. And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose twelve, whom also he named apostles. And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sickness, and to cast out devils. Before Jesus chose his twelve disciples, he went on a mountain top to pray and commune with God. He was so deeply engrossed in his union and joy with God that he did not notice the passing of the night. Mountain tops and caves are always sanctioned by the masters as quiet places for meditation. The pure oxygen on mountain tops helps the practice of breathing exercises calculated to burn the carbon on the system, quiet the heart and switch off the life current from the five sense telephones so that the sensations cannot bother the brain and attention directed toward God. Mountains also take the vision of man from the surrounding confinement of houses to the vast limitless sky which is the physical embodiment of the infinite. Ordinary souls pray with their minds concentrated on the clock, 
But Jesus prayed with his mind concentrated in the infinite bliss of spirit and not on time. Choosing the Twelve The choosing of twelve from his disciples by Jesus has a very significant meaning. In India each great master who attains God consciousness has two kinds of people who come to him for spiritual training. Those married or unmarried, who come for general training, are called students or in Sanskrit, shishyas, but those students who dedicate their entire lives to God-realization and who are ordained to propagate the teaching of the Master to the world through the example of their spiritual development are called disciples, apostles, or chelas. As children keep the family name and endeavor to add to its prestige in the world, so disciples are the spiritual children of Master. When the ordinary father brings forth a son in the world, the child inherits the family traits, good or bad. Even if a child happens to turn out a criminal, the father has to put up with him. The father of a family usually has no choice as to the kind of children he is going to bring on earth, unless he knows the spiritual art of propagation by which he can bring forth a soul from the astral world to come and be born in his family by an act of his super will power and meditation. Masters, on the other hand, have this advantage, that they can select disciples from a vast number of people and implant in them the seed of their spiritual vitality so that they can perpetuate the Master's spiritual life. In the case of Jesus, he not only selected a particular group as his disciples but he selected souls that he knew in a previous incarnation. Jesus selected his disciples for three reasons. 1. Because these disciples had not reached the final state like him, and therefore he wanted to make them perfect. 2. After helping the disciples to reach the final state of emancipation, Jesus wanted them to be apostles or model disciples who could be pioneers to propagate the message of Christhood to the masses through ideal living. That is why Jesus on seeing Simon told him, Follow me, and he followed. Last of all, Jesus knew according to the plan of the Heavenly Father, he had to have twelve disciples to carry out his message to the world. The coming of Judas distinctly shows that a disciple has independence to work against the will of God. God, by his omniscient knowledge, can find out how souls are going to act in using their will power, whether they will use it properly or misuse it. Jesus knew the law of cause and effect and the evil karma of Judas so he could predict the betrayal of Judas. It must be clearly understood that Judas was not ordained by God to betray Jesus, but that Judas was to act wrongly according to the lawful effects of his prenatal actions, and that he thus would be the cause of the betrayal of Christ, and of his test on the cross. Even though Judas was in an indirect test case for the victory of Jesus over the flesh, still it was not fated for Judas to become what he chose to become due solely to his own evil propensities and league with Satan or ignorance. Jesus knew that he was the pioneer of a great movement to uplift mankind, so he chose twelve disciples to be apostles who could preach the truth by example and who could heal physical sickness due to disease of the body, mental sickness due to psychological errors of the mind, and soul sickness due to inner ignorance, and to cast out devils or dislodge metaphysical ignorance lodged in the three bodies of man, and also free souls from the possession of evil agents. In the modern world preaching theology or imaginations about truth by preachers versed in theory is quite the vogue. There are few real preachers who live the life left in the world, especially teachers who are in tune with God and who know how to heal physical, mental and soul sickness by God's power and who can cast out Satan's satellites present in the body of each man. Those that are real preachers are in tune with God and can heal the sickness of true devotees by invoking the unlimited power of God. Medicine Suggestion All these are indirect mediums of physical or mental cure. True devotees know that God is the supreme cure of all sickness. Therefore those that are really in tune with God ought to be able to heal the spiritually sick by removing ignorance from their souls and to heal the psychologically sick by removing anger, greed, bad habits, and so forth from their mentalities and to heal bodies by divine suggestion, divine will power or injection of cosmic energy by the command of will. Many great teachers, 
not only show their disciples the way of physical and mental healing of others by the system of dietetics and methods of concentration, but they teach the highest technique of meditation to cure spiritual sickness and drive away ignorance from the minds of disciples and true seekers. It must be thoroughly understood that intellectual preaching through the power of a good memory is far different from spiritual preaching through example. Last of all, casting out devils is not an old superstition. The art of casting out devils and healing the spiritually sick has almost passed away from the ministers of Christianity of the various religions of the world. The subtle knowledge of casting out devils has been forgotten due to the lack of God-tuned apostles who know the workings of the good and evil forces that are in the world. Satan was an archangel of God who was given the power to create all creatures as perfect images of God, that in perfection his creation and creatures, after a perfect existence, were to go back to God. But Satan found out that if all creation and creatures went back to God he would lose the exercise of his own individual powers. So he began to misuse the freedom of will that God had entrusted to him. Ever since Satan has implanted in man anger, fear, greed, hate, revengefulness in place of calmness, bravery, self-control, love and forgiveness, which are divine qualities. We find from the beginning or birth, a child is influenced not only by good traits of love and kindness, but by a host of mischief-making traits. God could certainly not start out a child in life with evil traits. These traits the child brings from bad habits of previous incarnations, bad habits that were created under the influence of the evil qualities implanted in the child by Satan. As God's light is present in every being as the soul, so Satan is also present in every man as ignorance, and has distinct regions of himself, called evil spirits. Because God is present in every being as soul, and Satan as an evil spirit, so each individual is influenced both by the soul and its good qualities, and by Satan and his evil qualities. All good qualities in a being come from God and his reflection in the soul, all evil qualities come from Satan and his reflection, the devil who works in each being through his evil tendencies. It must be remembered that each soul is independent and free to act according to the good influences of the soul in God and soulful qualities, or to act under the influence of Satan's evil qualities and Satan's reflections, the devils which possess the being of man. The evil reflection of Satan in each man constantly urges him to do wrong through prenatal tendencies and the false lure of evil temptations. God tries to influence a being through conscience and soul peace found in meditation. The great masters like Jesus can transmit their light of spirituality into a dark soul and thereby dislodge the specific evil spirit which is possessing it. All human beings do not do evil only through the influence of their prenatal or postnatal bad habits, but also because they are consciously pushed by the evil residing in the brain. The evil entity not only tempts a soul through evil qualities but also through his evil habits and tendencies. When the evil entity is dislodged from the brain by higher meditations and the help of the Guru Preceptor, then a soul really becomes free. Jesus healed Mary Magdalene from several visitations of the evil forces which were trying to influence her to follow the path of false pleasure. Jesus once commanded the entities to take leave of sick souls and to enter into the body of pigs who then perished in the sea. No amount of skin-deep liberal thinking can explain away these works of Jesus of casting out the devils. Because most modern theologians do not know anything about healing or casting out devils, that does not mean that the physical and mental and spiritual healing of man is impossible or that casting out of devils is superstition. Great masters, of course, prefer healing the ignorance in man by the Christ contact. Great souls can heal the ignorance in truth-seeking people by transmitting their spiritual power. By higher concentration and meditation and by the contact of God, souls can actually dislodge the originator of evil, Satan and his entities, from the sacred sanctum of the inner body temples. 
great saints after illumination have declared how the spirit entity of evil takes shape and leaves the body permanently after highest spiritual attainment. When the evil entity leaves a man, he becomes not only absolutely impervious to evil but cannot see evil in anything anymore. He sees God alone everywhere. If one follows the technique of self-realization and develops himself with the help of the preceptor guru, then he will find the evil entity or devil leaving him. Such people who are entirely free from evil can show others how to be likewise free. So casting out devils, the originators and pioneers of evil working through evil tendencies in man, should be cast out from ignorance haunted souls. Every true preacher ought to know how he can heal ignorant souls, cast out their evil entities and open up the latent heaven within. The author has seen how his teacher cast out devils from other beings and healed so-called incurable sickness and preached through his exemplary living. An evil entity can be thrown out by constantly looking into the eyes of a stricken individual, using steady, silent will power, continuously, inwardly commanding the evil entity to leave. The evil entity will depart provided the will of the healer to get the evil force out is stronger than the latter's will to remain. Casting out devils is a real metaphysical way of freeing a soul forever from the influences of evil entities who have carried on their misery dealing work through incarnations in a soul who has chosen to misuse his reason. One great revealing feature is this, that every soul must remember that although God speaks to him through conscience, and although evil speaks to him through evil tendencies and evil qualities implanted within, still he is a free agent free to act under the influence of God's direction through conscience or evil directions through wrong habits. It should be borne in mind that when a soul acts according to the influence of conscience or good qualities only then does he create good tendencies and good habits which automatically draw him toward God. Whenever an individual acts evilly under the influence of evil habits or evil qualities, then automatically he is drawn toward Satan ignorance and satanic ways. Good and evil actions can be chosen by a soul but after he has acted in a good way or bad way he has no free choice as to consequences. If he acts in a good way he must receive a good result and if he acts in an evil way he must receive an evil result. This explanation of good and evil clearly points out that man is not responsible for being tempted to do evil under the influence of anger, greed, or fear implanted in him by Satan, but he is responsible if he chooses to act according to the temptations of the evil forces. Such temptations appear in man as evil impulses and inner promptings to go wrong. If a man sits in a room full of light, beholding beautiful things, to him light exists. If another man sits in the same room with eyes closed, to him self-created darkness exists. So if a third person in the room asks them both, please tell us if it is light or dark in the room, the answer would be that the first man sees light because he has his eyes opened, while the second man would say that it is dark because he has his eyes closed. Similarly in this universe there are two kinds of people. One kind have their eyes of wisdom open, and the second kind have their spiritual eyes closed. If anyone asks these two kinds of people whether there is good and evil, those that have their spiritual eyes of wisdom open will see God and God existing alone. And those that have their spiritual eyes closed will see Satan and evil existing everywhere. The above examples point out that man is responsible for harboring evil. But it must be remembered that a man may keep his eyes open being asked to do so by another man and similarly he may close his eyes being asked to do so. In this sense, devotees are those souls who obey the wishes of God to keep the eyes of wisdom open and behold only good, and evil persons are those who listen to the voice of evil and keep their eyes of spirituality closed, thus beholding the darkness of misery, sickness, and evil. The truth is that God or man is not the creator of evil but that this satanic force who used to be an archangel of God, being turned away from God, 
misused his willpower to create evil as a counterpart of all the good that God has created. It is for this reason that we find in each man opposite qualities, good created by God, evil created by the devil, love created by God, hate created by Satan, kindness created by God, selfishness created by Satan, intoxication of divine ecstasy created by God, and intoxication of evil created by Satan. So casting out devils, is one of the greatest metaphysical arts known by the masters to teach a soul how to be free forever from the innate influences of evil entities by consciously establishing God. And he came down with them, and stood in the plain in the company of his disciples, and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem, and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him, and to be healed of their diseases and they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. And Jesus in divine glory, with his twelve disciples, stood in the plains before a great multitude of people. Many came to be healed of unclean spirits and were healed. The whole multitude tried to touch him, for virtue or life force went out from the body of Jesus and burned out the bacteria and the sick. This all healing energy was roused in the diseased individuals by their faith and reinforced with cosmic energy coming from the body of Jesus. The faith of the sick caused Jesus to send the all healing energy out of his body and reinforce the healing energy present there in the body of the diseased individual. The energy in the body Jesus and the energy in the body of the persons healed both came from the cosmic energy of God. This energy is finer than X-rays and has the power to destroy not only physical germs but mental bacteria of evil tendencies and the soul bacteria of ignorance. Chapter 9 Jesus Exhorts the Apostles to Follow God Consciousness and another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury their dead. Follow my living spirit and everlasting life-giving teachings, and let the spiritually dead bury your physically dead father. Since you are my disciple and have acknowledged God as your father, you need not bury the dead body of your father which can be buried by so many spiritually dead people. Jesus had elsewhere quoted the divine injunction, Honor thy father and mother, so he was not here teaching disrespect from a son to his father. Jesus said, Let the dead bury their dead, to his disciple only because the disciple had changed his family relation and had been trained to be conscious of his real divine relation with Christ and humanity. Jesus was trying to remind the disciple, when he wanted to bury his father, that it was more important for him to be one with God by being in tune with his Christ consciousness than to waste time in the delusion that the burial of the Father was necessary, when there were so many spiritually dead people ready to bury the useless dead body of the disciple's father. In India it is the custom for the son to cremate his father or mother. He is the first one to put the fire in the funeral pyre where the dead relative lies. But a Swami who leaves his personal family and becomes identified with God's universal family is not allowed to cremate any of his dead relatives because in this cosmic motion picture of the world he no longer identifies himself with only one single little family. A Swami thinks that as he belongs to God's family and does not cremate the dead of all families, why should he cremate the dead who belong only to the family into which he was born? Of course, spiritually, it is not a sin for a Swami to cremate his own relatives, for even the founder of the Swami order, Swami Shankara, went against the letter of the rule of his order and cremated his own mother. In that case, Swami Shankara was not attached to his mother, but because there was no one else to cremate her at the time of death, he came to perform that duty. It is said that Swami Shankara produced divine fire to consume the body of his mother. A Swami is not prevented from cremating any of his dead relatives if there is no one else to do so, 
but he is taught not to identify himself with the family in which he was born nor to follow its traditional rules, since he alters his consciousness from being a family member and becomes a member of the universal family. Jesus was also teaching his disciple to consider God first and to spend every moment in God contact, rather than put God contact and meditation in the second place even when it was necessary to bury one's dead father. The Heavenly Father is the giver of the earthly father, and therefore the greatest honor and attention should be given to the Heavenly Father at all times. Jesus especially asked his disciple to follow him in preference to burying his father because he was a disciple who has changed his family relation and had entered into relationship with Jesus and his divine family of the cosmos. It is also significant to note how Jesus emphasized that the physically dead are dead and the spiritually dead are also dead but do not know it. Jesus emphasized that the spiritually dead were greater objects of pity than the physically dead, for the physically dead having lost their earthly lives could not awaken themselves to the teachings of Christ or truth, but the spiritually dead could hardly be pardoned for deliberately making themselves dead to the life-giving, emancipating teachings of Christ. Jesus also assured the disciple that by following him, who held the keys to the mysteries of life and death, the disciple could do greater service to the soul of his dead father by his spiritual goodwill than he could by merely burying his physical frame. Chapter 10 The First Miracle, Changing the Water into Wine And the third day there was a marriage in Khan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Jesus addressed his mother as woman because he saw only the divine spirit as his real mother and father, and his earthly mother as only a human being. Woman, I can have nothing to do with thee, even though thou art my mother, until the right time comes for me to be directed by the divine power to act and manifest his glory. Jesus did not perform the miracle of turning the water into wine just to accommodate his mother or to show his divine powers, but he performed the miracle in obedience to God's direction. At the proper time, before people who have the possibility of spiritual awakening, miracles are sometimes performed by saints in order to bring people unto God. Saints usually prefer to draw people by the love of God and not by miracles. That is why they seldom show their power. Miracles draw curiosity seekers, while the love of God draws highly developed souls. For that reason Jesus did not want to perform miracles until he was commanded by God to do so at the right time. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. At divine intuitional suggestion, Jesus asked the servants to fill the water pots so that he could declare the glory of God by changing the water into wine. Besides, he had the pots filled with water before their eyes in order that they might see it and know that it became wine through divine power and not through magic. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. The above sentence distinctly shows that the miracle of Jesus was not meant for the gaze of curiosity seekers, but was meant to enhance the faith of the disciples in God's power over all things. Wine and the human body are equally made of electrons. It is the different rate of vibration of these electrons that constitutes the endless variety of material forms. Jesus, being omnipresent in God, 
knew the metaphysical relation of matter to divine will. He demonstrated that one form of matter could be changed into another form, not only by chemical processes, but by the universal power of mind. This miracle testifies to the fact that all matter is controlled by the one unifying and balancing power of divine intelligence and will. By reacting to this divine intelligence, Jesus changed the arrangement of electrons and protons in the water and thus turned them into wine, which has a different specific gravity from water. The law of causation of all material forms can be traced to the activity of electrons, but beyond that the sources of the law of cause and effect is lost. Scientists do not know why electrons and protons rearrange themselves into different forms and create different kinds of matter. Herein lies room for a divine intelligence, says the scientist, inasmuch as it must be that power which commands the subtle electronic and protonic bricks and directs them to arrange themselves in different combinations, thus creating different substances. Chapter 11. Jesus Purging the Temple, Driving Out Material Vibrations After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers' money, and overthrew the tables, and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Jesus was not suffering from anger while he was using the whip or cords to drive the money changers from the temple. It was not the little cord, but the personality, the divine vibration and the colossal spiritual force behind it which frightened away the money changers. Great prophets, though they are internally free from anger, may use the semblance of anger to admonish and correct those who respond more to fear vibrations than to love vibrations. Jesus, who tells you to love enemies, shows by the above action that the divine saint also has power behind his meekness. No one dared to resist his spiritual power and determination, as was shown by the fact that a whole group of able-bodied manichangers fled before the power of a single meek man. Jesus said that the house of God should be free from the contradictory vibrations of material thoughts involved in buying and selling. He only meant that according to the laws of concentration we should center our minds upon one thing at a time. While in the house of God, we should concentrate upon him, and there should be nothing there to awaken material thoughts. He meant that buying and selling should be carried on in the mark and not in the temple. There is a spiritual lesson in the above act of Jesus. Temple of mind during prayer should not be a place where the thoughts of material gain persist. Many people during prayer carry in the background of their minds the thought of buying and selling of material things and the profit thereof. Jesus says this is disastrous because it brings neither God nor prosperity. During meditation, as often as the money changers of material thoughts come to your mind, so often should you make a scourge of calmness, formed out of the gathered will power, acquired throughout life, and drive out the restless material thoughts from your temple. In the foregoing passages, it looks as if such a great Son of God as Jesus should not have become angry and made a scourge of cords with which to hit the money kangers. In this action of Jesus it looks as if he contradicted his own saying, But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek turn to him the other also. Jesus used the cord more or less to scare these grow-up ignorant children of God as brethren, and to send them away so that they could not desecrate the house of God. He meant that merchandise in the house of prayer was a distraction, just as an altar and preaching in the shop would be a distraction. Jesus in this act tried to show people that they should concentrate on one thing at a time. In the house of business they should think of selling articles. In the house of God they should think of him. Besides, Jesus, with his little cord, didn't hurt anyone, nor was he actually angry internally. 
He put on a show of anger to frighten the big, naughty children who were trading in God's house. If Jesus had been really angry, he would have used his divine powers to destroy these desecrators of God's temple. This is well illustrated by an old Hindu story. Once upon a time, long, long ago, a venomous, vicious serpent used to live in a hole in the hill on the outskirts of a village. A hermit of great miraculous power also made his home in this village. Many of the villagers' children, who ventured to play around the hill, were attacked by this vicious serpent and stung to death. The serpent extremely resented any noise around its dwelling. The villagers tried their utmost to kill the serpent but met with no success. Failing in this, the villagers went in a body to their local hermit and asked him to find a remedy to prevent the death-dealing work of the serpent. Yielding to the legitimate prayers of the villagers, the hermit went near the hole in the hill where the serpent resided and by his spiritual powers summoned the serpent to appear in his presence. The master hermit scolded the serpent for stinging the villagers' children to death and instructed him never to bite again but to practice loving his enemies. The hermit left the village for a year on a pilgrimage, and as he was returning to the village by way of the hill he thought, let me see how my friend the serpent is behaving. As he approached the hole in the hill, he found the serpent lying in front of the hole half dead with several stitches in his back. The hermit said, Hello Mr. Serpent, what's all this? The serpent dolefully whispered, Master, this is the result of practicing your teaching. Whenever I came out of my hole in quest of food and minded my own business, the village boys noticed my docility and refusal to attack them, and then they threw small stones at me, and when they found me running away from them, they made it their business to throw big stones at me with the object of killing me. Master, I dodged many times, but also got badly hurt many times, and now I am lying here with several stitches in my back because I have been trying to love my enemies. Then the village hermit looked at him and said rebukingly, Fool, I told you not to sting to death, but why didn't you hiss and scare them away? This story illustrates that a person, although meek and spiritual, should not be spineless or without common sense and allow himself to be made into a dormat. When provoked or unnecessarily attacked, the spiritual man should try to scare his enemies away by a show of anger or strength, but without getting really angry internally. However, one should never hiss, even with a show of anger, if he has the tendency to bite or to materially injure anybody. That is what Jesus did. He hissed at the Munichangers and scared them away, but did not injure them or become really angry himself. Instead, he tried to put sense into them, so that they would not incur bad karma results of evil action by blasphemy against the temple of God. Jesus said, Take these material things away, for they spread material vibrations and evoke material thoughts. In the temple of God people should think only of possessing the imperishable infinite, but if material articles are sold in the temple, they arouse in the spiritual novice, thoughts of greed and desire for possessing perishable material things and distract him from God. Jesus knew the law of vibration, which is that each object or person throws out a magnetic vibration, thus producing specific thoughts. The vibration of a candle in the church throws out the symbolical thought of unruffled peace or of the light of wisdom, whereas oxen in the church remind one of the slaughterhouse or of farm labor and so forth. Jesus signified that the church should be so equipped that it would emanate only spiritual vibrations. Jesus distinctly advises that churches should be places of worship and not places for the sale of material thought arousing objects. It is all right to sell Bibles or books in the temples if they are sold with a spirit of rendering continuous spiritual service. Using the proceeds from the sale of spiritual books in order to print more spiritual books, or using the money for some other spiritual purpose is all right. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The disciples corroborated the words of Jesus with scriptural sayings, which intimate that the material zeal or vibration swallows up the spiritual vibration of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, 
seeing that thou dost these things. Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews wanted a divine proof that he was of God, since Jesus took upon himself the responsibility of driving the Munichangers from the temple. In other words, the Jews meant that it was illegal for Jesus to drive away the Munichangers unless he had divine authority greater than human laws to do so. It is beautiful to see that Jesus accepted this challenge in a peculiar divine way. He did not employ a new miracle to convince the Jews of his greatness. He simply told them what was going to happen. Jesus was not in a hurry to convince his enemies. He only said this to demonstrate the wish and work of God in his life. Jesus thought that no other proof of his divinity could be greater than the telling about a future event in which God was to perform the miracle of miracles by rebuilding his crucified body after three days. Human nature is composed of three qualities, namely good, evil, and activating qualities. The soul of man has three dresses, the ideational, astral, and physical, just as we put on an undergarment, a suit, and an overcoat. The soul of man can only be liberated from the bondage of mortal karma and limitation when it rises above the desires of the physical, astral, and spiritual bodies. It takes three distinct efforts for the soul to leave the physical, astral, and ideational bodies. Some people take years and many incarnations to accomplish this, but Jesus knew, advanced as he was, that he would be able to liberate his soul from the limitations of three bodies by three distinct efforts in three days, and would be able to unite it with the unlimited power of the Spirit. It is only when souls, by desirelessness, are free of the limitations of these three bodies that they are not compelled to remain in the astral or to reincarnate in the physical. It is then that they are imbued with the power of God to recreate any dead body, even as he can. Jesus knew that once he was out of the three bodies, he would demonstrate his oneness with the Father and his powers by recreating his crucified body as no one could accept his heavenly Father. There is a story that the East Indian saint, Kabir, told his Hindu and Mohammedan disciples that he would never die, and yet, when he lay in his coffin dead, the first thing his Hindu and Mohammedan disciples did was to doubt the truth of his saying about his deathlessness, and they began to fight with one another. The Hindus wanted to cremate his dead body and the Mohammedans instead upon entombing it. At last they fought so hard that their master Kabir could not keep still any longer and he broke the after death, paramount vow of silence, and rose up in his coffin and rebuked his disciples. Look you dreamt that I was dead. Lo, I am even living in the body. Since I told you not to fight about anything, and then you quarreled about my dead dream body, I will convert it into the same divine cosmic dream from which it came. Saying this and blessing them, he said, Whatever is left in the coffin, half of that bury and half of it cremate. When the disciples lifted the coffin lid, they found that their master had dematerialized the body and left in its stead a few golden flowers. The Hindus cremated half of these flowers and the Mohammedans buried the remaining half. It is said from an authoritative source that our great guru preceptor Shayama Charan Lahiri Mahaseya of India consciously left his body when his life work was finished and that he appeared again in the flesh in three places. Great saints of India, who have lived knowing and contacting God in their lives, have been known to raise their bodies after death both before and after the time of Christ. It is reported that some saints, like our greatest Guru Babaji, never experience the so-called human death, but keep their bodies for centuries and through eternity, enjoying communion as the infinite God and as the specific finite body. One can see the ocean without the waves, or one can see the ocean as the ocean in the waves. Likewise, some souls see God without the finite body or any delusive waves of creation, and yet others may behold God as the infinite become the finite, or the body. In the latter case, the soul beholds God become the wave of one or more souls. Babaji, the great guru, experiences himself not apart from God, but perceives that he has become Babaji, you and me, in all manifestation. In the ultimate experience, one does not lose his soul or individuality. 
one only expands it and finds that God has become one's soul. The little soul wave, tossed by the storm of dark ignorance, finds itself isolated from the ocean of spirit, but when the sunshine of highest wisdom comes, the little soul wave finds that the ocean of spirit has become the soul wavelet. Chapter 12 How to Be Born Again in Christ Lifting the Kundalini Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture, and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name, when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. There was a man of the Pharisees, named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night, and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, He must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. The Jews misinterpreted the saying of Jesus about raising the temple in three days. Naturally they wondered how Jesus could rebuild the temple of Jerusalem in three days if it were destroyed, when it took forty-six years to build it the first time. His raising the body after death was much more wonderful than rebuilding a broken temple in three days would have been. At the Passover many believed in Jesus because of his miracles, but Jesus did not count upon man's testimony for the spread of his message. He went on preaching his gospel, being impelled by his infinite force. Nicodemus visited Jesus secretly in the night, for he was afraid of social criticism. Yet it took a lot of courage, faith, and sincere curiosity for him to seek Jesus. Upon meeting, Jesus declared that only divine beings who had actual God contact could work the super laws which govern the inner life of all beings and things. Jesus in his answer to Nicodemus in the following way, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, suggests the way in which we can contact God and the way in which Jesus contacted God. Jesus meant that only super beings who contact God can perform miracles, and that anyone can contact God and can perform miracles if he is born a second time. In the Hindu scriptures the newly born child is called Kayastha, which means body bound. The two physical eyes in the child are given by its physical parents to look into alluring matter, but when the child grows older, and at the age of seven, or later, is initiated, his spiritual eye is opened by his spiritual father, or preceptor. Through the help of his preceptor, the initiate can use this telescopic eye to see spirit, and then he is called Dwija, or the twice-born, or the Brahman, or the one who knows Brahma or spirit. Alas, even in India this initiation from the body consciousness to the spiritual consciousness has become just a formal ceremony performed by the priests, who only baptize in water, but great Hindu masters baptize the body and spirit. John the Baptist also said that he baptized with water, but that Jesus was to baptize with spirit. Jesus meant that the ordinary consciousness is tied to the flesh, and that through the two physical eyes and senses, with their limited powers of perception, man can see only into the tiny playhouse of this earth. When a person is flying in an airplane, he sees no walls but only the vastness of limitless space and free skies, 
but if he is suddenly locked up in a little cage surrounded by walls he loses sight of all the vision of vast space. Likewise, when man's soul is thrown out of the vast eternal spirit into the little bodily cage, he beholds nothing but the limitations of matter and the little earth experiences. So Jesus said with the modern scientists that we can see and know as much as our limited power of the senses allow. Just as by a two-inch telescope, the details of the distant stars cannot be seen, so Jesus said that man cannot know anything about the astral world by using only the limited power of his senses. Scientists tell us that if the powers of the senses were expanded, the earth would look much more beautiful and would be full of colors and blinding lights of glow-worm-like atoms. Jesus said that after man's soul is born in water or protoplasm, and then by self-development is born again through the awakening of the sixth sense, intuition, and the opening of the spiritual eye, his illumined soul goes out of the body and can then enter into the kingdom of God. Just as by a 200-inch telescope, a man can enter into the vast region of star-peopled space, so by developing the intuitional sense through meditation he can enter the kingdom of God and behold the birthplace of thoughts, stars, and souls. Jesus meant that body-bound souls can see nothing but limited matter through the small outer windows of their senses. It is only when soul opens the inner window of oneness with the Spirit by meditation that he can enter into the perception of the vastness of omnipresent Spirit. Jesus said that the body born of flesh has the limitations of the flesh, whereas the soul born of the Spirit has potentially limitless powers. The ordinary man knows himself as so many pounds of flesh. Such a person, being born of flesh, sees nothing but flesh or matter in and around him, but when by meditation the soul's mind is transferred from the body to the invisible powerful presence of the soul, then it realizes its oneness with the eternal spirit and not with the limited body. Jesus said, as the Hindu masters have said, that man has to be born in body and in spirit in order to know God. Nicodemus could not see how a soul could be born twice, so asked Jesus if he meant that old men could reincarnate in their mother's bodies and become young again. Jesus was not talking of reincarnation, that is, of a second birth after one birth and death. He was explaining how a soul in one life could be born entangled in the flesh and sense limitations, and then by meditation could acquire a new birth in cosmic consciousness. The matter-bound soul, lifted into the spirit by God contact, is born a second time in spirit. Here the body remains the same, only the soul's consciousness, instead of roaming on the material plane, enters into the eternally joyous kingdom of the spirit. Jesus was describing a metaphysical law of noumena substance or cause and phenomena the appearances of substances or effect when he compared the spirit and the souls emerging from it with the visible wind and its presence declared by its sound. Just as the source of the wind is hidden and is known by its sound, so the spirit substance is invisible hidden beyond the grasp of human senses and the birth of souls from the spirit is the visible phenomena. By the sound the invisible wind is known. By the birth of intelligent souls, the invisible spirit is manifest. Jesus was only stating that as it is difficult to find the source of the wind, so it is difficult to find the spirit's source from which all things come. Jesus said that all souls born of spirit are known by their existence, but very few know all about the spirit's source from which they come. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Jesus told Nicodemus that it took more than being a master of the house of Israel to know the mysteries of life. Nicodemus was informed by Jesus that the spiritual things which he was describing were known only by intuitive experience. Zeek that we do know means something deeper than the knowledge derived through the senses of understanding. Human knowledge percolates through the senses, understanding, and intuition. The senses are limited in their powers, so is understanding, which depends upon the senses for its data. If the senses light, the conclusion drawn by the understanding on that data is also incorrect. If you see in the distance a white cloth that looks like a ghost, you conclude that there is a ghost, but coming nearer to the object you discover the error of your conclusion. The senses and understanding are the outer doors through which knowledge of the noumena, or the eternal substance, percolates into the soul. The senses and understanding are deluded because they do not know or see the real nature of all created things. Jesus, with his intuition, knew the real nature of the cosmos and of life, so he said authoritatively, We do know. Jesus regretted that Nicodemus doubted the intuitional experiences of the Christ state, and he said to Nicodemus, if I tell you about matters pertaining to human souls who are visibly present on earth, and how they can enter into the kingdom of God, and you believe not, then how can you believe me if I tell you about happenings in heaven or the astral realm, which are completely hidden from the ordinary human gaze? Jesus went on to say that no man can ascend to heaven except the one who came down from heaven. A man is composed of a soul in the three ideational, astral, and spiritual bodies. Just as the little threads of flame coming through the holes of a gas burner are all individualized flames coming out of the one flame under the burner plate, so also souls are individualized spirit. The one flame of spirit lies under all things and comes out through each human soul and through every living thing. The threads of flame first come out of one big flame, and when the light is put out they go back to the same flame. To do that the little flames have to come out of the big flame. This illustrates what Jesus said about souls ascending and descending from heaven. The spirit projects the desire, then the soul projects the idea of the body, then the idea becomes energy or astral body, and the astral body becomes condensed into the physical body. It has been described before that heaven is behind space, hiding the limitations of the senses. This heavenly region is the abode of all astral forces and angels. Thus Jesus said that no physical body could get back into the astral kingdom which did not in the first place come out of the astral plane. In other words, all men were first created as souls with astral bodies in the heavenly astral kingdom. From there they were projected into matter as men with physical bodies. Then the logical conclusion is that all supermen who conquered material desires and were promoted back to heaven were originally in heaven and had fallen from there through earthbound desires. Jesus spoke of a very strange truth when he said, Even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Jesus often used the phrase, Son of Man whenever he referred to his own or to any physical body. So Jesus said that the Son of Man, his own physical body, could exist in the finer astral kingdom as well as on the earth. The highest Hindu yoga scripture tells how some is have power to appear in two places at the same time in two similar bodies. It is said that some yogis never die but carry their bodies into the spirit and never lose their personality or individuality. 
Just as the ocean and the wave can exist together, so some saints with their bodies are said to exist externally in God without ever melting the bodily form in the cosmic ocean. Other saints are said to become one with the spirit and dissolve the bodily wave in the spiritual ocean. Such saints only materialize their bodies when they want to come on earth to bring back deluded souls unto God. Jesus spoke of his body which dwelt simultaneously in the astral and the physical worlds because he was conscious of both his physical body and astral body. Ordinary souls behold their bodies roaming only on the earth, but advanced souls, like Jesus, can see their souls simultaneously present in the physical and in the astral kingdoms. This is also proven by the fact that, although Jesus experienced death as the Son of Man, or physical body, still he was conscious of the astral kingdom all the time, and after death he raised his physical body and took it back to heaven. The soul is encased in the idea body of 34 ideas. The soul is encased in the idea body through delusion. This idea body through desires is tied to the astral body, and the astral body is fitted in all details to the finest mechanisms of the physical body. The astral body is tied to the physical body in the brain and in the six plexuses. The last tie which binds the astral body to the physical body is the attachment emanating through a coiled knot at the base of the spine, called by Hindu saints, the Kundalini or serpent force. Jesus spoke of this serpent being lifted by Moses in the wilderness, that is, Moses in the wilderness of silence, by deep meditation, learned the art of relaxing or of consciously withdrawing the astral body from the physical body by first doing away with bodily attachment, and then by reversing the astral current from the senses to the spine, Godward, through the coiled passage at the base of the spine. Unless one knows how to open this coiled knot of astral and physical power at the base of the spine, one cannot enter into the astral kingdom. Jesus said that each son of man, or each bodily consciousness, must be lifted from the plane of the senses to the astral kingdom by reversing the life force through the serpent-like coil passage at the base of the spine. Every time you meditate deeply, you automatically reverse the life force and consciousness from matter to God. This helps to loosen the astral and physical knot at the base of the spine. You people know about this kundalini and often confuse it with sex force. That is why so many ignorant teachers make a mystery about it and frighten their gullible disciples by telling them that it is dangerous to awaken this life force kundalini. It takes years of meditation under the guidance of a competent teacher cure before one can dream of releasing the astral from its bondage to the physical by awakening the kundalini. Chapter 13 The Only Begotten Son, The Christ Intelligence and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Moses and Jesus himself, along with the Hindu yogis, knew the secret of scientific spiritual life. That is why they unanimously said that all physically minded people must know the art of lifting up the serpent force in order to accomplish the first retracing of the inward steps toward the spirit. Jesus said that whosoever believes in the doctrine of lifting the bodily consciousness son of man from the physical to the astral body reversing the life force through the coiled passage at the base of the spine, will not perish that is, be subject to mortal changes of life and death but will gradually acquire the changeless eternal state. Jesus emphasized here that his disciples were people who would believe in his spirit as manifested in him as son of man, or physical body, would know the art of lifting the serpent force in the silence and would see the path to eternal life. But Jesus realized that his physical body was to remain on the earth plane for a little while only, so he said that in his absence people would be able to find God. This confusion between Son of Man, Son of God, and Only Begotten Son has created much bigotry in the followers of Christianity, 
who never want to acknowledge the human element in Jesus and that Jesus was a God-man who evolved and became God himself. If Jesus were God himself from the beginning, then his life and his struggles before crucifixion and the cross were nothing but divine acting. However, a superman Jesus, who by spiritual discipline became God himself through his efforts, stirs more hope of salvation in the human heart than a God-manufactured Jesus. No doubt a God made Jesus could conquer temptation, and while on the cross could say, Father, forgive them, for they know what they do, but how could this be expected of a human being of manifold frailties? Before and after the coming and passing of Jesus, sons of God existed. Jesus never set a limit to time. He himself said, All those who received him to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. As the sunlight shines equally on the diamond and on the charcoal, so also God sheds his light equally on the diamond and the charcoal mentalities. The difference is that the believing diamond mentalities receive and reflect the rays of God more than the doubting charcoal mentalities. So all souls who by meditation become pure and transparent will be able to receive and reflect God and be called sons of God. Each soul who leaves delusion and becomes one with God is termed a son of God. Jesus was the big brother, beloved of God, who was sent on earth to redeem desire deluded brothers and to urge them to become like him. Potentially, we are all sons of God, only we have to manifest that by self-discipline, even as Jesus did. Not the body of Jesus, but the consciousness within it was one with the only begotten Son or only reflection of God, the Father in creation. Jesus said that when his body, Son of Man, was gone from the earth, people could still find salvation by believing and knowing the only begotten Son of God. To fully understand the meaning of the expression the only begotten Son, one should read again the earlier chapters of this book for only a short summary can be given here. Spirit is unmanifested, absolute, ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new joy. When he projects creation, he becomes three, one God, the Father, two, the only begotten Son, and three, the Holy Ghost. God, the Father, is the spirit and intelligence which remains indirectly active beyond creation cosmic vibration. The transcendental God, the Father, has only one reflected, directly active intelligence or the only begotten Son working in the Holy Ghost or in creative vibratory matter Virgin Mary. The consciousness in the body of Jesus was not confined to the physical, but was identified with the only begotten intelligence of God, the Father in all creation. Just as the waves change on the bosom of the changeless ocean, so all vibratory waves of creation dance and change on the bosom of this only begotten Christ intelligence. Jesus the man was one with the only reflected, only begotten Christ intelligence in all matter. He referred to this changeless, only begotten Christ consciousness within himself and in the hearts of all true souls of all ages. Jesus said that all good souls, who lift their physical consciousness son of man consciousness to the astral plane and become one with the only begotten Christ intelligence in all creation, will know eternal life. Souls on the material plane perish, or witness the change of life and death, just as men watching ocean waves see the constant change on the surface of the ocean. But souls who concentrate upon the only begotten, only reflected changeless ocean of Christ intelligence do not perceive change any more than would a man who concentrates upon the ocean itself see any change, though the waves come and go. It is this only reflected Christ intelligence in all matter which is the Savior of all. Souls tuning in with this universal Christ consciousness can release their consciousness encased in the body and plunge it into the vastness of the ocean of omnipresence. This Christ intelligence is the only reflected intelligence existing between God and matter, through which all matter formed individuals, irrespective of different castes and creeds, must pass in order to reach God. This only reflected Christ intelligence in all matter is the only Savior of all mankind throughout all ages. Jesus never referred to his Son of Man consciousness or to his body as the only Savior throughout all time. 
people like Abraham and others were saved even before Jesus was born. It is a metaphysical error to speak of the body of Jesus as the only Savior or only begotten Son. God did not reflect his pure Christ intelligence in all matter in order to let it act like an eternal detective to punish man. This Christ intelligence is in the bosom of every soul, whether sinful or virtuous, waiting with infinite patience for it to wake up in meditation and be redeemed through him. The person who believes in this Christ intelligence Savior is not tortured by error, but the person who laughs at this thought is condemned to remain steeped in ignorance and to suffer until wakes up. Unbelievers remain body-bound and do not desire to seek the only path of salvation through the Christ intelligence. Chapter 14 Healing Spiritual Healing The Woman of Samaria Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sechar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, asketh drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. It is evident that Jesus, like all great prophets, reincarnated at the same time as his great disciples of past lives. Jesus brought along with him his twelve disciples. They had qualified themselves in past incarnations and so were fit to be close disciples of Jesus in his inner circle. As has been shown in a previous chapter, John the Baptist was the guru preceptor of Jesus in a former incarnation and he acknowledged him as such by saying, This is the way of all righteousness, meaning that the ultimate path of righteousness can only be found by following the directions of the guru, or the vehicle chosen by God to bring the devotee disciples to his kingdom. When one has spasmodic desires to know God, he meets spiritual teachers, but when one wholeheartedly wishes to know the Almighty, God chooses the spirituality and intelligence of a human guru to bring the devotee unto him. Jesus knew the difference between disciples of a past incarnation and those who came to him for the first time for enlightenment. However, the betrayal by Judas shows that even close disciples of a great master like Jesus are by no means completely perfect. That is why the Guru Preceptor has to come back on earth voluntarily until all his disciples become liberated. The soul of the Guru Preceptor and the soul of the disciple enter into an everlasting covenant of friendship that they will come back on earth for one another until both souls are finally redeemed. Sometimes the real Guru Preceptor, instead of coming on earth, appears in vision to redeem the disciple. It appears that Jesus purposely planned to go to Samaria and sat on Jacob's well and knowingly asked the low-caste woman of Samaria to give him a drink. This Samaritan woman was a morally lost disciple of some past incarnation whom Jesus came to redeem. Her truthfulness when admitting the fact that she had no husband because she had five shows the genuine quality of her soul. Her degradation was temporary and lay like a clay crust over the hidden glow of her pure truth-loving soul. We see that the people in the time of Jesus differentiated between the high-caste Jews and the low-caste Samaritans. All castes originate in the vocations which people follow. In India those who worshipped God or the clergy were called Brahmins. The soldiers were called Kshatriyas, the businessmen Baisiyas, the laborers such as sweepers and so forth were called Sudras or Kaasthas. The first three castes intermarried and ate together, but had nothing to do with the last caste because of their filthy mode of living. This caste division became rigid in time, and instead of being based on quality and vocation, began to be based on heredity. This permanently excluded an educated spiritual sudra, no matter how great he was from socially mingling with Brahmins, 
no matter how spiritually degenerated they were. A son of Brahman claimed to be a Brahman even though he never worshipped God, and even though he led the life of a Sudra low caste individual. A son of a soldier claimed to be a Kshatriya, even though he never saw a weapon. This brought the downfall of India, for when the soldiers lost out in battle against foreign aggressors, the Brahmins and Bayesias refused to fight. Real caste should be elastic and should be governed by the principal vocation of an individual. This caste rigidity, in spite of its manifold evils, protected the Aryan stock from getting mixed with all kinds of foreign races. Intermarriage between people of equal culture is productive of some good according to the law of eugenics. A Brahmin when he fights should be called a soldier or Kshatriya, and a soldier when he adopts the vocation of preaching should be called Brahmin. Likewise, a man of low caste when he becomes illumined should be called Brahmin. There is an esoteric significance about the four castes which consists in the four states of consciousness of a devotee who aspires to know God. When he remains identified with his body or engrossed in flesh pleasures, he is called Kayastha Kayasthetamana Jasya, one whose mind is settled on the flesh. When the devotee begins to cultivate his mind or starts the business of acquiring spiritual wealth, he is called Bazia or businessman. All individuals who principally carry on the spiritual business of self-improvement are called Bazias. In the third state, the devotee fights with the senses for spiritual victory and is then said to have reached the Kshatriya state. Any individual who passes his life warring with temptation is called Kshatriya, or spiritual soldier. Last of all, when the devotee knows Brahman or spirit, he is said to be in the Brahman state. Any individual who remains identified with the Supreme Spirit should be called Brahman. You see, the above spiritual caste system does not prevent any low caste or any individual from being called a Brahman if he qualitatively proves himself to be one but the hereditary caste system is selfish and unjust and uses heredity to broadcast evil and division, and thus should be abolished. Jesus knew no artificial race barrier as the woman of Samaria understood it, and therefore he asked her for a drink. He also asked her for a drink in order to get acquainted with her when the disciples were gone, so that he could give her the everlasting elixir of life without disturbance. Jesus hinted to the woman of Samaria when he said, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee that God had gifted her in previous incarnations with the greatest of all gifts, a divine Savior Guru who had followed her to this life to redeem her. Jesus was trying to awaken the dormant memory of the past in his fallen disciple. Thus Jesus meant that if she knew that her Guru of the past was asking for the drink, she would, instead, have asked him for the living water of God's contact. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep, from whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and saith unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman of Samaria steeped in ignorance, could not yet understand what Jesus meant by living water, hence her foolish question, From whence, then haste thou the living water? Jesus, to elucidate what he meant by living water, said in effect that, Whosoever drinks of the material water will live by material food only and will die with that consciousness. He will have to reincarnate again due to the presence of material desires accompanying the soul after death. To die depending upon material water and food will bring the soul back to the earth again because of a latent thirst for material things in the heart. Jesus said that whosoever drinks of the fountain of eternal bliss in God will have all the thirst of desires of all his incarnations quenched forever. Such God-drinking souls, finding the everlasting well of bliss within themselves, are never thirsty for the satisfaction of mortal desires or mortal life. Mortal desires promise happiness and then always give sorrow instead. 
The soul cannot find its lost happiness in material things, though it seeks comfort in them. The soul, losing its contact with God bliss, tries to satisfy itself by pseudo-sense pleasures. The soul of even the most worldly person is inwardly conscious of its lost supernal bliss, and that is why it can never remain satisfied for long with temporary sense pleasures only, no matter how alluring they may be. The worldly man goes on searching for his lost happiness in God by flying from one sense pleasure to another. At last, when he suffers from satiety, he begins to seek God bliss within where alone it can be found. If one loses a diamond and tries to satisfy himself with little pieces of broken glass, shining with sunlight, he is bound to be disillusioned. He cannot find the diamond in the pile of broken glass. He is seeking in the wrong place and so can never be happy unless he seeks in the right place and finds the diamond. In the same way, the soul tries to find its happiness in the momentarily glittering sense pleasures, but when it has enough of sense happiness, it becomes disgusted and tries to find peace and joy in the soul. This is the supreme reason why people should seek happiness in God, and not in material things. It is foolish to expect true happiness from material things, for they are powerless to give it, and yet many millions of people die of broken hearts trying vainly to find the comfort in material things which God alone can impart in the temple of meditation. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus saith unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that saidst thou truly. After hearing about the water of everlasting life, the woman of Samaria became desirous of getting it, for she wanted to quench her mortal thirst forever. Jesus wanted to test the character of his fallen disciple, the woman of Samaria. He wanted to find out the degree of her degradation, so he asked her to call her husband, and when Jesus heard her say that she had no husband, he was pleased. In sincerity, prevarication, and treachery toward a guru preceptor are the greatest sins, for these are deliberate transgressions and, as such, are greater evils than flesh transgressions, which are to a considerable extent due to instinctive compulsion. Some souls, due to such transgressions in a past life, are born with a compelling inclination, which overrules almost all sense of shame, church threats, moral sense, social discomfiture, or efforts toward self-control. Such souls can be helped if they sincerely confess their faults, that is, let their spiritual doctor diagnose their moral disease and give mental and moral strength and advice, which, if followed, will remedy the malady. The disciple who practices insincerity toward his guru preceptor not only hides moral disease, but refuses the healing help of the master. In this way an error-stricken disciple makes his moral transgression grow upon him. To hide the moral disease from the spiritual doctor is extremely dangerous to spiritual health. Jesus openly manifested his omniscient knowledge by saying to his former fallen disciple, Thou hast had five husbands. This mental miracle was performed to convince a fallen disciple who, in a former incarnation, had already shown her faithfulness to the Master. A Master very seldom attracts a new soul by a mental miracle other than by the expression of the love of God, but everything is right in its own place. The woman of Samaria witnessed this omniscient power of Jesus because she confessed to a Master, and the master, out of compassion, let her know that what she told him was in safe hands. This is the reason why Jesus spoke out and proved to her that he already knew what she told him and that he was satisfied with her veracity and that she had passed the test of true discipleship. No matter how sinful a disciple is, he can be saved if he is sincere and loyal to his master. This display of a miracle was not performed by Jesus in order to satisfy the mental curiosity of a stranger, but to lift a fallen disciple. Thus the witnessing of the miracle had a salutary effect on the woman of Samaria. 
the inner Jerusalem. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Thus the woman of Samaria was convinced that Jesus was a prophet of the God, and then she asked him if Jerusalem or the mountains where her forefathers worshipped was the right place to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain, nor yet at Jerusalem, worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Herein Jesus spoke of the inner Jerusalem of self-realization, the sacred mountain of meditation, where true souls, devout devotees of God, worship him in the temple of true spiritual communion. Though the quiet top of mountains and holy places, sanctified by the presence of masters, are also fit places of worship, yet they are of no use to restless, materially-minded people. Many worldly people have built temples on hilltops and lived in places of pilgrimage only to make those places dens of matter worship. That is why Jesus said that true worshippers find God in the temple of omnipresence and worship him not in the imaginary communion of silence, but in the true communion of spiritual perception. Millions of people today worship God in temples and churches and in holy cities without ever knowing him. The reason is obvious. God can only be found in the temple of true intuition, the tabernacle of deep meditation. Jesus distinctly spoke of the difference between the theological priestly ceremonious worship God and the saintly way of worshiping God in the temple of intuition. A gorgeous temple worth millions of dollars could not lure God by its display of wealth although it might draw an audience of aristocratic people who love to worship God in the comfort of flesh on cushioned velvet seats. The omnipresent God, who lives in the temple of the cosmos, with the star-decked dome of eternity, illumined by suns and moons, cannot be lured into the pride-created atomic church of man. In fact, Thousands of ministers are so engrossed by church property and the church business of keeping the religious customers together that they forget to meditate and thus establish the church of God within themselves. To worship God on mountains or in holy places is useless unless one really finds him in the spirit. Though God is manifest everywhere, he is in essence present behind the veil of nature. The devotee has to lift the veil of nature and see God first that way. After that, the devotee can see God behind nature. So Jesus said that most people do not know what they worship, but that true devotees, who worship God in the temple of meditation, truly commune with his omnipresent spirit, and therefore they know what he is and where he can be communed with. Jesus also said, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit signifies the unmanifested absolute present in the darkless dark and the lightless light. In the unmanifested absolute even the categories of space, time, and dimension are non-existent. There abides only ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new, blissful spirit. The word yod means the manifested, transcendental being beyond creation, but existing in relation to creation. When creation is dissolved into God, then this God becomes spirit, the unmanifested absolute. Jesus said that as long as a devotee is conscious of manifested creation and of the delusive things, such as mountains and holy cities, and has the desire to meditate in them, he has not yet attained the ultimate state of enlightenment, and that true worshippers are the reflections of God, the father of material creation. God manifested as the guiding intelligence of creation is the spirit in the unmanifested state when creation is dissolved. Man being a reflection of God is a reflection of the unmanifested spirit. Hence, a true worshiper, if he wants to know the truth about God and himself, 
must know that God and his soul are reflections of the unmanifested absolute. That is, the spirit being unmanifested absolute wants all his true devotees to know that they are its emanations. A devotee, unless he knows that the father of creation, or God, can exist in the absolute unmanifested state as pure ever-conscious bliss, without the shadows of imperfect creation, does not know the whole truth about nominal substance, but is deluded by phenomena, or by the appearance of truth in creation. All devotees who worship God as the manifested intelligence of creation are gradually taught by Him to worship Him as the unmanifested absolute or spirit. That is why Jesus said, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is divine intelligence in creation. Spirit is divine intelligence with creation dissolved in him. Hence any devotee who can only see God as the father of creation of nature, mountains and so forth is still in delusion. The true devotee must learn that God is spirit unmanifested absolute and must understand the truth about him as being the ever-existent, ever-conscious, ever-new bliss without the delusion of a material cosmos. It is then that the devotee finds emancipation and becomes one with the Spirit. To truly worship God is to worship Him in nature and beyond nature, to worship the substance and the delusive phenomena in it, to worship the ocean of God and its delusive waves of creation. Since the waves of creation in appearance, not in essence, distort the ocean of creation God, the true vision of God lies in the perception of the spirit ocean without the waves of creation. To see as unmanifested spirit and the only existing substance, truth, without experiencing the delusion of matter or phenomena. It is only by worshipping God and nature, and then by worshipping God, as unmanifested spirit that the devotee reaches the final state of emancipation, from which there is no fall. Hence, worshippers who see God as spirit and the only true substance existing, become emancipated. Under the sunlight, you may close your eyes and create a darkness of your own and live and move in it. When you open your eyes, darkness is no more. So the consciousness of matter is due to our closing the eye of wisdom. When the wisdom eye is opened, the consciousness of relativity of the pleasure, good and evil and so forth, disappear, and the spirit as ever-existing, ever-conscious, ever-new joy is perceived as the only existent substance. Then all creation, with all the attending evils, are found to be created by ignorance and all darkness and fears are created by closing the eyes and not by the absence of the light, which always knocks at the closed gates of the eyes to get in. Modern ministers should learn to worship God in the temple of supercommunion or samadhi, where the cosmos, like the shadow of darkness, appears non-existent with the opening of the eye of wisdom before the light of the only existing spirit. The woman said unto him, I know that the meshes cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, and went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come, see a man, which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city, and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Therefore said the disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. When the woman of Samaria said, I know that the meshes cometh, and so on, she had unconsciously received the telepathic message of God and Christ's presence as to who Jesus was. Most of the time, great saints purposely remain hidden, and unless they choose someone to know of their greatness, they cannot be recognized even by people intimately mixing with them. In this case, God wanted to declare the glory of Jesus through the woman of Samaria, 
who was being made a test case of the spiritual healing of souls. This woman of Samaria, who had had five husbands, was healed of her evil life through the spiritual healing of Jesus. Jesus confirms and thereby reinforces her telepathic message by letting her know the truth about himself. Three kinds of healing. The body is infected with bacteria, poison and accidents which involve physical suffering. To free man from bodily ailments constitutes physical healing. The mind of man is infected with fear, worries, melancholia, psychological nervousness, greed, anger, temptation and jealousy which cause mental suffering. The healing of psychological diseases is called mental healing. The soul of man is haunted by ignorance which produces mental, physical and all kinds of suffering. Ignorance creates in harmony between mind and body, God and soul, and in addition creates every other trouble. Jesus knew the relation between mind and body, and God and soul. That is why he controlled the atomic structure of his bodily cells, and that is why he carried out his saying, Destroy this body, and in three days I will rebuild it again. In fact, ignorance produces in man the consciousness of the body. Divine souls who have healed themselves of ignorance, behold the body as a dream of God or frozen mind of divinity. Body and mind, being the image of God, can reflect perpetual youth and everlasting peace. Not to know this is to be spiritually ignorant and to be subject to all kinds of physical and mental elements. If you close your eyes and enter a palatial room, you see darkness instead of the presence of beautiful things in the room. When you open your eyes and remove darkness, you forget the existence of self-created gloom and behold only light and the beautiful things in the room. So also when the eyes of wisdom are closed, you are submerged in the gloom of ignorance, witnessing physical and mental agonies. But when you open the eyes of knowledge by meditation, you behold the presence of God's light and all the beautiful experiences of lasting youth everlasting peace, immortality, and so forth. The world has yet to discover the highest human achievement, which Jesus and the great saints are enjoying even today, and have been enjoying ever since they freed themselves from mortal ignorance, and they will enjoy that celestial blessedness to the end of endlessness. It must be noted that physical suffering does not always bring mental agony if the mind is strong. Martyrs have smilingly been burned at the stake, but mental suffering usually brings physical suffering. When the soul is sick, the body and mind are automatically subject to physical and mental suffering. Therefore, ignorance is the greatest of all suffering and must be removed. Healing of the soul is the greatest good. The greatest of all healing which Jesus wanted to perform was the healing of souls. Everyone, by holding to the after-effects of meditation, and by steadily looking into the eyes of recipient souls and strongly wishing them to be healed of mortal ignorance, can bring God into the lives of men, but one must be healed in his own soul first before he can aspire to heal others. That is why Jesus spoke of becoming the fishers of men. That means the art of fishing souls out of the sea of ignorance by catching them in the net of wisdom and bringing them to the table of God's immortality. The one purpose that Jesus had in declaring himself as Christ to the woman of Samaria was that he wanted her to know that he had the all-healing Christ consciousness in him, that he was omniscient and knew of her morally sick soul, and that he could heal her. Jesus could not be accused of self-laudation, nor of revealing his power of mind reading. He had one object in view in his talking thus to the woman of Samaria, and that was to heal her soul and that is why he did not wait to be introduced to her but saw her alone. Jesus, considerate as he was, did not want to embarrass the woman before his disciples by telling her that she had had five husbands. God has given to each soul the right to hide his thoughts and to fight his battles in secret instead of before others' curiosity and prying, which would cause sarcasm and hatred. If there were not invisible walls between our thoughts, we could do nothing and think nothing in peace, nor would we have the right to receive our own knocks and score our own victories. We get little inklings of the thoughts of others and the expressions of their faces and eyes. 
that makes our lives all the more mysterious and interesting. So many times we jump at conclusions about the thoughts of others and make horrible blunders, and many times we learn to read their thoughts correctly. Our blunders in such psychological reading teaches us to be cautions and prevents self-sufficiency, which arises from our correct reading of the thoughts of others. The disciples marvel when Jesus talked to such a common woman, yet the pure vibrations of Jesus could not bring any criticism from the disciples. That is why nobody asked, Why talkest thou with her? The woman of Samaria was so overwhelmed with the soul-healing power of Jesus that in her divine joy, she told of all her moral blemishes and the wonderful soul healing which she received from Jesus. She being healed also became the first messenger to declare Jesus the Christ. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. The mind of Jesus was filled with Christ consciousness and the soul healing that he had accomplished in the woman of Samaria. So he laughed at the idea of supplying the body with food when he knew that he was a soul, and the only meat it eternally nourished itself on was the blessedness and eternal wisdom of God. Jesus was trying to heal his disciples of the delusion of ignorance, which caused them to think that he had to eat in order to live. Jesus said once before, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, He told me all that ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. The above paragraph shows the way a prophet like Jesus Christ became known to the public. The one real way by which a saint should become known is by the testimony from the lips of benefited students. Many people believed in Jesus because of the testimony of the woman of Samaria. Honest, true testimonials of students as to their master's real qualities may not to be of any spiritual benefit to him, but they enable him to become known so that through his power of wisdom he can serve the people, if he wants to serve, and if the spiritually needy want to receive his help. A flower needs no advertisement, and yet, its fragrance experienced by a few may be told to those who did not experience its sweetness. The fragrance blossom of a spiritual man hiding in a cave, selfishly enjoying God alone, is born to blush and die unseen, without benefiting others with the solace of acquired wisdom. Consciously developed spiritual souls, no matter how they love seclusion, never act like the inert beautiful blossom which dies in an unknown nook without making anybody happy with its sweetness. Great saints who experience the intoxicating joy of God contact always love to share their divine happiness with others and demonstrate their spiritual healing powers to worthy souls. This serves a double purpose. The worthy souls are benefited, and when they feel better, they sincerely tell of their teacher's ability to serve and to heal. The teacher should advertise through example and not merely by words, or by both example and advice. If it is right to advertise chewing gum, it is better to advertise real wisdom and thoughts which people can chew mentally and assimilate for their highest spiritual nourishment. It is only deplorable when commercial teachers, without practicing what they preach, try to impart their knowledge to others and glaringly advertise it with only one end in view, that of making money. To advertise untruth is harmful, but to draw the attention of people to a usable, beneficial, spiritual truth or to a good teacher is admirable. A flower even advertises by its fragrance, calling people to come near and bathe in its fountain of sweetness. So, a spiritual man draws eager souls to himself by the perfume of his own qualities. The woman of Samaria told of the telepathic power of Jesus, which he demonstrated to her, not for the sake of satisfying her curiosity, but for the purpose of lifting her from the pitfalls of error. A spiritual teacher of high standing only demonstrates the power of the mind, 
in order to glorify God, not himself. He turns the attention of his students not to the delusive desire of acquiring miracles, but to God alone. In the course of planting the seed of God wisdom in a soul, a mastermind is entirely guided by God as to whether he shall draw the student to truth by the demonstration of miracle or by the pure magnetic power of undiluted God devotion. Those teachers who demonstrate miracles without consulting God usually love to advertise their own little power and thus fall away from concentrating upon the mightiest miracle of all miracles, God. Jesus, actuated by divine will, tried to uplift the woman of Samaria by the demonstration of a miracle. Most people are attracted to a teacher through the testimonial of benefited students, but there are others who have the keen perception to recognize and believe in a teacher by tuning in with his emanating spiritual vibrations. There were others who believed in Jesus, not through the testimony of the woman of Samaria, but after they heard him and felt his spiritual vibrations within them. It is all right to believe in the testimony of a student about a teacher or a truth, but it is better for real students to satisfy their own hearts by trying out the truth, or by contacting the teacher, and thus place their convictions on the indestructible foundation of wisdom, and not on the shaky basis of doubt. Telepathy Many people may wonder how Jesus knew about the woman of Samaria's life history. Did Jesus read her thoughts from her subconscious, conscious, or superconscious mind? If a person holds the mirror of his mind absolutely still, free from the oscillations of restless thoughts, he can reflect within him the thoughts which pass through the consciousness of another person. This is only possible when one is versed in the art of remaining without thinking as long as he wants to. When this attained then on the virgin, unexposed plate of his mind, he can photograph any thought that is present in the conscious mind of another individual. It entails greater mental power to know the buried subconscious thought experiences of others. Subconscious thoughts usually do not remain in the conscious mind, but are hidden behind its doors. By consciously projecting the subconscious mind of one person into the subconscious mind of another person, one can know the tabloid of thought experiences hidden there. It is possible to do this when one can go into his own subconscious mind by concentrating and can feel the experiences hidden there without being intruded upon by the thoughts of the conscious mind. In the third still greater way, a master mind who has control of his all-seeing eye of deepest concentration can transfer his consciousness to the deepest region of bliss of the superconscious mind. The superconscious mind hides behind the restlessness of conscious life and the fanciful dream state of subconscious life, and knows everything, not by reason or sense perception, but by the direct all-knowing power of God-given intuition. This intuitive power can be developed by learning the step-by-step -step methods of self-realization and by deepest meditation. When this superconscious intuition is developed, it can instantly feel all that is going on in the consciousness of another individual, all that is lying hidden in his subconscious mind, and all his prenatal experiences of former incarnations. Jesus had this usable, controlled power of superconscious intuition, with which he instantly knew everything that lay hidden in the conscious, subconscious, and superconscious mind of the woman of Samaria. Faith, the healing power of thought. Jesus heals the son of the nobleman of Capernaum. Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman, whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him, and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way, thy son live. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him, and told him, saying, Thy son live. 
Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son live, and himself believed in his whole house. Before Jesus healed the son of the nobleman, he observed the general mentality of the people, in that they never believed in God until they saw signs and wondrous miracles. In a way, Jesus was telling the nobleman, whose son was at the point of death in Capernaum, that it was not his custom to perform miracles in order to make people believe in God. Jesus preferred those people who loved God as a result of their own innate reasoning and perfect accord, rather than those who were compelled to believe in God as a result of the awe and fear they felt at the display of miracles. In other words, Almighty God prefers to have His children use their own free will and reason to love Him, rather than be led to love Him through the force of His miraculous powers. Jesus wanted the nobleman of Capernaum to believe in Him without the performance of the miraculous healing of His Son. However, when the Father insisted through true faith, Jesus at last said, Go thy way, thy son live. After this, the nobleman believed, or rather sensed, the vibratory healing power of Jesus and went home. On his return home, the nobleman was greeted by his servant, who happily announced to him that his son had been living since day before at the seventh hour. In absent healing, the word of healing has to be spoken by the healer. If songs can float through the ether, ready to be caught out of the ether by a radio, so it is that broadcasted healing vibrations can be picked up by sensitive soul radios. How the law of healing operates. In this healing it must be remembered that the nobleman's son became well immediately when Jesus spoke, that is, when Jesus set in motion his will impregnated healing soul force in the ether. Jesus broadcasted the God-given healing vibrations and they were received by the nobleman who relayed them to his son, just as songs, broadcasted at 7 a.m. from Los Angeles, reached New York at exactly the same time. This happens because sound is carried by infinitely fast-moving omnipresent electrons in the ether. If sound waves can be carried through the ether, then sounds impregnated with healing soul force can also be transmitted through the ether. Ordinary songs and speeches received through the radio produce some mental effect upon the listener, but words impregnated with soul force remain in the ether, ever ready to work. Jesus impregnated his utterance with his almighty healing power. Ordinary songs and thoughts transmitted over the radio give only momentary inspiration, but the words of Jesus, Thy Son liveth, contained in them the all-accomplishing, invisible healing power. As the energy in the body can be directed by the will to move any part of the body, so also by omnipresent divine will, any atomic changes can be initiated in any body, in anything, and at any place, no matter how far distant. God had a reason for creating the cosmos, then He willed it, and light or energy came. Then He willed that the light become flesh and earth. Hence the universe, being a product of divine mind, can be changed by divine mind at any time. Matter, although it has dimensions, is not different from thought, for material objects are nothing but the frozen thought of God. Hence the body and the life in it are dream products of God's will and thought. The dream cosmos with the earth and the living beings on it are sustained by God's concentrated thought. If he should dissolve his dream, the universe with all things in it would melt away like a dream. If the cosmos is made of the frozen thought of God, then the human body is also made and sustained by the same divine thought. Hence, God's thought, being the creator of the thought body, can create changes in it through the power of divine will. Jesus realized that, since God brought the body of the son of the nobleman into existence through his thought, so also his almighty power could produce the desired change in it. God's will and thought created all things, and those people who are in tune with God's will and thought can produce any desired changes in matter or in human bodies instantaneously, merely by concentrated thought. The nobleman thought that his son was sick, but Jesus thought differently, and so the son recovered. 
Jesus was able to displace the dream of sickness in the sun by a dream of health because he knew that the entire cosmos was made of the tissue of dreams. Ultimately, all disease is found to be psychological, so a strong mind, fostering thoughts of health and perfection, can displace a stubborn thought of illness in another person. Most people cannot heal themselves because their own thoughts are poisoned by the habit of thinking of chronic sickness. It is strange that the people who are always well never seem to believe that they can become sick, but if they happen to become sick after having enjoyed 50 years of good health, and are then unable to keep well for three months, they believe that they can never get well again. Right at this time, if a strong mind can revive the will of the patient who is paralyzed with sickness, then he himself can change his thought and energy, and thus heal himself. No one can heal us except through the hidden power of our own thoughts. Thought is the brain of the cells and units of life force present in every particle of bodily tissue. Hence, a disease thought upsets the entire government of the life force in the cells, whereas the thought of health corrects any disorder in the cellular system. It must be remembered that I am speaking of the concentrated divine thought which can heal and not of the fanciful thought of imaginary people. In order to move divine thought, the ordinary man must know the relation of thought, life force and body without denying the existence of the body thought. The body is the frozen energy of God. Nevertheless, man cannot realize this until he knows that thought is frozen into energy and energy is frozen into the body of man. Many people try to explain away the body delusion. First, it must be realized that the body is made of invisible electrons and that electrons are made of the invisible thought of God. Instead of saying that the body does not exist, one should say, the body is not what we think it is. It is not anything but the frozen thought and energy of God, and cannot be gained by fanatic fancy, or by strong orthodox belief, but only by tuning in with God and by waking up his consciousness, to find that the cosmos is nothing but his frozen dream. Possession, the man possessed by an unclean devil. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil and cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and heard him not. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they came out. The human body and mind are subject to various kinds of diseases. Jesus, as the true minister of self-realization, not only knew how to preach and win people away from satanic ignorance and bring them into divine vibrations, but he knew how to heal them of various kinds of maladies. While preaching in the synagogue, a place where people usually go for their souls to be healed by the salve of inspiring sermons, Jesus found a man possessed by an unclean devil. Forthwith Jesus started to heal the stricken man. In modern times people would laugh at the idea of anybody being possessed by an unclean devil. Devils seem to be plentiful in the days of superstition and candlelight, but now in the electrical age, the devils seem to be scared away. However, psychiatrists can tell of the many cases of mental obsessions by fixed ideas, but very few know that many people suffer from actual possession by unclean devils. Why should it be considered so amazing, when devils and devilish souls exist right on this side of life, that they may exist also on the other side of life? If souls are immortal, then according to the law of cause and effect, it is logical to expect that when a devilish soul sheds the mortal coil and passes through the door of the mortal change called death, into the other side of life, he continues to be a devil and does not become an angel. Only an angelic soul who has been on earth can continue to be so after crossing the gulf of death and entering the finer atmosphere of heaven. Unclean devils are those souls who were murderers, robbers, and other criminals on earth, and who did not cleanse themselves of their evil propensities before death. Even the greatest sinner, 
if he cleans his subconscious mind and memory by contacting the superconsciousness in meditation before death, does not go into a sphere beyond death as a wicked soul who has not purged itself of its evil and spiritually unsanitary tendencies. As a good boy turned to evil ways can be called as devil, so a soul gone wrong becomes devilish in its behavior. Such wicked souls after they die pass through many strange experiences. As people of calm disposition usually have deep soothing sleep, so good souls, when they sleep the sleep of death, experience as soothing death sleep, free from the nightmares of evil visions. But when people of evil disturbed disposition die, according to the law of cause and effect, they experience, during the great death sleep, only horrible nightmares of evil. As people walk in sleep or cry out during a bad dream so during the sleep after death, unclean souls can move about in the ether crying out for relief. Most of these tramp souls begin to move about during the sleep of death and try to get hold of some passive bodily vehicle through which to express their agony and wicked tendencies. As a sleepwalker does many strange things so these subtle sleepwalkers of the astral land perform many strange antics. By means of intuitive feelings they try to possess vacant, ignorant minds. They can never infest brains occupied with intelligent thinking or people with strong will power or vibrations of spiritual perception. That is why the minds of spiritually advanced people cannot be occupied by devilish souls, but these people can invoke saintly souls by use of the proper technique of astral intuition. One must learn the right technique from one's guru. Evil souls invade vacant, passive minds without invitation. Beware of dwelling long in absent-mindedness, and never try to invoke disembodied souls by remaining in a passive state if you do not know the right technique. If you know what you are doing and keep your mind entrenched and barbed-wired by high spiritual vibrations, no evil, unclean spirits can get in. The word spirit should only be used in connection with the unmanifested absolute, and it is a crime to use it in connection with disembodied souls. However, the word spirit as used commonly signifies physically disembodied souls. It must be remembered that there is a lot of difference between the conditions of a soul acting under a hypnotic spell and the obsession of a subconscious idea or auto-suggestion. Men and women, under the influence of hypnosis or strong obsession of the subconscious mind, can be made to play the part of either a noble or a devilish soul. Real obsession is not an idea introduced by a hypnotist or by the subconscious mind which infests a soul, but it is due to the actual presence of a soul who has cast off its physical garment. One human body usually cannot reside of another, except in the case of a mother carrying a child, but a passive soul can be occupied by an active, disembodied soul. It is true that like attracts like. So this sinful man in the synagogue, due to the attraction of his own wrong vibration, drew unto himself an unclean spirit. Jesus, possessing cosmic consciousness, could feel exactly what was going on within the body of the obsessed man. And the unclean soul, being in touch with the astral world, knew that the Christ consciousness in Jesus was the Lord of all creation, which pervaded all forms of life, and therefore it has control over all life. So this disembodied, unclean, devilish soul could see Jesus and through its intuition could feel the power of Jesus. Disembodied souls have only the sixth sense of intuition but in a developed state, they can use it alone to perform the functions of vision, audition, smell, taste, touch and so forth. But the unclean, wicked soul saw Jesus through the eyes of the obsessed man and used his voice to cry loudly, Let us alone! Let us have the freedom to do anything we please, good or evil. The evil spirit was afraid that Jesus, with his Christ consciousness, having control over all life, would stop him from having an unauthorized, forced occupation of the obsessed man's mind. This wicked soul kept the soul of the obsessed man in a state of suspension, neutrality, and subhypnosis so that the instruments of consciousness, senses, brain, and body, could be used without interruption. 
as tramps steal rides and unlocked automobiles left by the wayside and ruin them, so also tramp souls steal rides by entering the bodies of passive souls, and usually wreck the brain engines. Jesus, fearing the advent of insanity in the obsessed man, if the unclean devil remain too long by his life-controlling will power spoke, hold thy peace and come out of him. That is, stop the devilish work of wrecking obsessed brains. Hold on to the inner peace of the soul hidden behind the veil of self-created past evil propensities and do right again by coming out of the body which you have forcibly and unethically occupied. In obsession by unclean devils or disembodied souls who are bent upon forcibly occupying passive souls on earth, great mischief is done to the brain, mind, and sense organs of the obsessed individual. During obsession, an individual may or may not be unconscious, just as a person under hypnosis may manifest the unconsciousness of sleep or the superficially normal state of the conscious mind. In modern times many people think that the idea of obsession is a myth. It is not so. There are many simple-minded and absent-minded people who, due to their mental emptiness, invite the advent of unscrupulous souls within their bodies. Many real cases of obsession are spoken of as brain derangement or as a state of hallucination or as spells of hysteria. On the other hand, many cases of hysteria and fits have been erroneously described as spirit obsession by hysterical, credulous spiritualists. Only spiritual experts can distinguish cases of true spirit obsession because by their psychic powers they are able to behold the astral bodies of the invisible visitors lying side by side with the astral bodies of the persons obsessed. If you find a haunted individual who shows symptoms the same as in the above-mentioned test, then remember by strong concentration and willpower, you too can dislodge the evil spirit. By the constant whisper of Alm in the right ear of the individual, the evil spirit is bound to leave. In object cases of spirit possession, which do not yield to the influence of the above methods, the power of a master in the path of self-realization must be sought. The only way a layman can detect a case of spirit possession is by analyzing the different states of paroxysm and of wild behavior which an obsessed person is subject to. The evil spirit obsessed person usually displays unusual physical strength, bloodshot eyes, uncanny expression, and general lack of normal behavior. The utterance of holy names and especially am 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 into the ear of obsessed individuals usually brings forth a quick, frightened reply from the obsessed individual like, I am going, don't utter that holy word, which indicates spirit obsession. So Jesus, being in touch with the cosmic vibration, Aum sound which is continuously roaring throughout the universe, commanded, with an Aum impregnated voice, the devil to come out of the body of the obsessed individual. The devil, unwilling to obey Jesus, fought against the powerful vibration and thus created convulsions in the body of the obsessed man. Cosmic vibration, like a powerful current, was vibrating in the obsessed individual, trying to dislodge and shake out the intruding evil astral spirit. After causing some bodily convulsions, at last it came out of the body violently, leaving the man limp and shaken but not hurt. As has been said before, the tramp evil spirit could have wrecked the brain engine of the obsessed man, but it was not able to do so due to the intervention of the divine policeman, the all-powerful Jesus Christ. So the evil spirit came out without causing any physical injury. The people who beheld this miracle of the unclean spirits obeying Jesus Christ were extremely astonished and believed in his divine authority. Even as Jesus was the perfect image of God, we also are potentially perfect manifestations of the Spirit of God. When we become aware of this, we also can perform the miracles that Christ performed. Possession, Jesus casts out legion of devils into the swine. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarens, which is over against Galilee. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. 
When he saw Jesus he cried out and fell down before him and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and in fetters, and he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Such madmen are also to be found in present times in the lunatic asylums, locked up in padded cells. All lunacy is not due to derangement of brains. Sometimes brains are possessed by evil spirits who can be exercised or driven out by men like Christ. When this lunatic saw Jesus coming, the evil spirit in him recognized Christ and in fear implored him not to dispossess it. To this Jesus said, O thou disembodied soul and reflection of spirit filled with unclean evil karma, you should give up your unlawful possession of this man's body, you have converted him into a lunatic. It has been explained before that a tramp soul is usually a disembodied soul of a murderer or a man who has committed suicide. Because of his disregard for life his own karma condemns him to an existence like a nightmare in the astral world. These souls, not finding much desired rebirth, often possess demented minds with bad karma. Masters who can distinguish between spirit possession and ordinary brain derangement have the power to consciously command these tramp souls to depart from the human bodies they unlawfully possess. Meaning of Deep And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion, because many devils were entered into him. And they besought him that he would not command them to go oyuti into the deep. Jesus, being omnipotent, knew everything that was going on in the astral world where millions of good and bad souls remain after death. The evil souls are all controlled by Satan and they all have distinctive features and names. That is why Jesus asked the name of the Spirit. The leader of the spirits replied that his name was Legion, that is, many devils which signified that many wicked disembodied souls were crowding and disordering the one mental house of this madman. As many thoughts can remain in one mind, and various moods and various personalities can be displayed by the same actor, so various disembodied spirits, being subtle, can occupy and possess the same mind and the same body. Just as many people can live crowded in a room, so many disembodied souls can possess the same brain crowding it. These disembodied souls, being in the astral world, consciously knew the influence of Jesus Christ's consciousness in the astral world. They knew the power of Jesus over the evil spirits, so they begged him that they should not be commanded to roam again without the consciousness of physical bodies into the deep ocean of black space where they were tormented and choked with their own visions of a nightmare existence without a light to guide them. These disembodied souls crowding the brain of the individual were highly delighted and ran riot, enjoying the sensations of sound, light, taste, smell, touch and the perceptions of a world full of definitive objects through the brain of this possessed individual. That is why the disembodied spirits were afraid of being denied a further ride in the fleshly motor car racing through a land of physical sensations and sceneries and of being thrown back into the Hades and nightmare of dark subconscious existence. That is what is meant by the word deep, and there was there an herd of many swine feeding on the mountain, and they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Then went the devils out of the man, and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Since Jesus Christ, by his divine power, was compelling the unclean spirits to leave the body of the madman, therefore they wished to enjoy the lesser sensibilities in the bodies of a nearby herd of swine. These wicked disembodied spirits preferred a transition from the feeling of human sensations to the feeling of animal sensations in the animal bodies, rather than suddenly be whirled back into the dark subconscious state of eternal space, where they were condemned to stay by the evil karma of their past lives. Jesus permitted them to do so. The unclean spirits then left the brain of the possessed individual and entered the bodies of the whole herd of swine who, being possessed by these unclean disembodied spirits, began to act like maniacs and ran violently into the lake. 
These evil spirits with great difficulty had found one wicked individual as their suitable medium, and had crowded into his brain and tortured him by making him do things he did not want to do. They ran riot with his body, and did not care what happened to it so long as they could enjoy life through its sensations. In trying to work out all their violent emotions through one brain they deranged it. Being denied by Jesus this much desired, yet crowded dwelling place of one brain, the disembodied spirits through the help of Jesus temporarily went to feel the joys of animal existence in the bodies of a herd of swine. When the disembodied spirits entered into the bodies of swine, the animal brains became deranged. The evil spirits within them were so excited with animal pleasure that they did not know what they were doing and ran violently into the water and were drowned. The unclean spirits with the souls of the swine were driven back into the regions of dark space where wicked souls live with souls that have come out of animal bodies. The Gadarens reject Jesus. When they that fed them saw what was done, they fled, and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they went out to see what was done, and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They also which saw it told them by what means he that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country of the Gadarens round about besought him to depart from them, for they were taken with great fear, and he went up into the ship and returned back again. It was foolish of these ignorant people to be afraid of Jesus and not afraid of their own ignorance. Had they realized the all-redeeming power of Jesus, instead of being afraid of him they would have asked him how they could be free from being possessed by the devil of devils, ignorance. Even in modern times many educated people, seeing some master in ecstasy with God, with his body in a state of suspended animation, foolishly feel afraid of him as one who is under the influence of witchcraft or black magic, and who may be teaching the art of unconsciousness or possession by disembodied spirits or who may be practicing self-hypnotism. Similar uncomprehending fears about Jesus were felt by the ignorant Gadarens two thousand years ago. It must be remembered one has to die in order to separate his soul from his body. In ordinary death a soul is separated from its body, so that the soul cannot re-enter its own body again. But a master teaches how to conquer death by consciously taking the soul out of the body at will, and putting the soul back into the body again. By this process, instead of going out in ecstasy into the after-death state, and not being able to come back, a soul learns that the body is his material dwelling place. He can remain there as long as he wants, and after living in it enough he can quit it at will without suffering physical pain or mental pain due to attachment, and go to his omnipresent home in God. But the ordinary person does not know that he lives in the body as a prisoner of his own past karma. Due to his long residence in the bodily prison, vulnerable to its accidents and death, he grows to like it, and when his karmic term of bodily confinement is over and he is commanded to depart from the body by the compulsion of disease, the individual hates to leave the prison house of the body. Most people do not know why they come into the body or why they go out of it. The yogis say that since the bodily confinement is due to the karmic term the soul should learn of its oneness with spirit and by meditation get himself paroled from the dictates of karma and have the power to go in and out of the bodily prison as he wants to by getting hold of the key of the mystery of life and death by yogic meditation and the art of self-realization. So no sane individual should foolishly fear a master or condemn his all-emancipating technique of meditation even as the men of Gadara were foolishly afraid of Jesus and instead of asking salvation from him commanded him to depart from their shores. Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way, and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. It is remarkable to note how Jesus was without ego. 
He did not speak of his own powers of healing but of the divine power which manifested through him. He believed that the demonstration of divine power needed publicity through a living example that other afflicted souls might seek help from the unlimited divine power. When publicity is used for material gain it yields material results. Publicity is useful to broadcast divine demonstrations for the guidance of afflicted souls, but self-laudation is pernicious and repugnant to the spiritual man. Laying on of hands, Jesus rebukes the fever in Simon's wife's mother. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. And Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever, and anon they tell him of her, and they besought him for her. And he stood over her, and rebuked the fever, and he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she arose and ministered unto them. And at even, when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers diseases brought them unto him, and them that were possessed with devils, and he laid his hands on every one of them, and healed them, and all the city was gathered together at the door. All disease germs have a dormant intelligence and are directed by the misguided archangel of God, Satan. All evil has some intelligence, for it works itself into the minds of the people through false reasoning. Vice takes the cloak of virtue and fools the gatekeeper of reason, and thus enters the forbidden sanctum of virtue. Fever is caused by the evil actions of man, as well as by disease which is intelligently controlled by Satan. Whenever a person transgresses physically, mentally, or spiritually, a portal for a specific disease is opened according to the nature of the transgression to enter the body. Jesus knew all the evil forces which create havoc in people and was able, through his all-powerful cosmic consciousness, to talk in the language of the fever and command it to get out of the body of the stricken woman. That is what is meant by Jesus rebuking the fever. The rebuking of the fever signifies that diseases are due to the lack of proper operation of the conscious forces which govern the body, and are also due to the evil forces which consciously allow the evil of disease to spread in the body. Some diseases are brought about by physical transgressions against the laws of health, but disease germs are also created by an evil force which tries to destroy the beautiful creation of God, the human body. When the actions of an individual become very bad, evil vibrations are generated, attracting disease germs, which are the agencies of evil. Jesus could see the evil force which was responsible for the introduction of fever into the body of Simon's wife's mother, and thus he rebuked it away and restored the harmony of health. Jesus commanded the predominating evil force to depart from the body of the stricken woman, thus reinstating the conscious astral forces which govern normal health. Jesus exercised his supreme healing power to heal everyone who came to him. He could heal all those who came unto him at that time because all of them had power of recipiency and faith. Faith is the soil and the power of God flowing through the healer is the seed. True healing requires the true soil of faith in the patient and the powerful seed of healing in the healer or God. Jesus could not heal everybody in the place where he was born because, even powerful as he was, he could not sprout the seed of his healing power on the rocky soil of disbelieving minds. In healing, the power of the healer, great or small, is limited as compared to the unlimited healing power of God. Hence, all healers, instead of commanding their own powers in healing, should invoke the unlimited divine power of healing to flow through them and work certain healing. Man's power may fail, but God's power can never fail. Even though God has unlimited healing power, and though our Father does not want to see us suffer from disease, yet He cannot heal us until we open the gates of our own willingness to be healed. God has given us free choice unlike the animals, and by misusing it we can keep God out of our lives. By using it properly, we can allow God to heal us. In order to be sure of God's healing power, one must know and feel Him deeply in meditation daily. 
When sure of the divine communion, one should completely absorb oneself in God preceding every healing which one tries to perform. When administering divine healing, the healer must act as a perfect medium in order to let God's unlimited power flow through without obstruction. Egotism and loud declaration and self-laudation, such as I healed her and so forth, should be strictly avoided both in speech and mind, in order to let the all-knowing God perform the healing. About the laying on of hands, a great many explanations are necessary. The body is surrounded by intelligent cosmic energy, and this energy recharges the original vitality of the body when it becomes depleted due to hard work. Food is the distilled water of the body battery, but the inner life of the body battery depends upon the cosmic energy which is drawn into the body through the mouth of the metal at antenna or by the tuning power of the human will. All the energy derived from the cosmos through the ether and the energy derived from food becomes concentrated in the head and is poured into the entire body battery through the six subdynamos in the spine. The brain and the six centers in the cerebrospinal axis send energy into the hands, feet, eyes, lungs, heart, liver, spleen, and all body parts. So from each body part, namely eyes, hands, feet, heart, navel, nose, mouth, and every projection from the body, there emanates current. Since we use our eyes and hands constantly, they radiate more nerve current than other parts. The right side of the body is a positive pole and the left side is a negative pole. The right side is stronger than the left side because more attention is paid to it and more use and more exercise develop it. The left side, by use and attention, can be developed into the positive pole as is shown in left-handed people. However, this life force passing through the hands is more or less powerful according to the power of the will. Masters like Jesus who have infinite control of their will can radiate the all-creative healing ray through any organ, especially through hands, feet or eyes. Simply laying on the positive and negative poles of the hands, which carry energy from the body battery, does not heal. It is the power flowing through the hands which is the real cause of healing. This life force creates, integrates, disintegrates, crystallizes, metabolizes, and produces the complex body out of the cells. This life force is intelligent but is out of control in weak, ego-identified minds. Those who have identified themselves with their souls know that the intelligent soul controls the intelligent creative life force. One who knows his soul knows how to work miracles through the master of life and death the life force by sending it down through the hands like a healing x-ray to burn out disease germs in any stricken person. Spirit of Jesus had control over cosmic energy. He commanded his will to connect cosmic energy with the energy in his brain and send it down through his hands in ever-flowing, germ-burning rays to the body of the diseased person. Forgiveness of Sins and devils also came out of many, crying out and saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. And he, rebuking them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias, the prophet, saying, Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed and Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. As has been said before, Satan, the cosmic evil intelligence, has his satellites and those souls who have lost in the moral and spiritual battle. Satan works through such lost souls on earth while they are living and also through those souls that are roaming in the astral world. As evil possessed souls do mischief on earth, so these Satan-obsessed astral souls do all kinds of mischief in the astral world as well as in the physical world. They launch themselves into evil souls through their evil vibrations. They intelligently possess and punish earthly evil souls according to the term of astral punishment which arises from specific transgressions in worldly life. 
Jesus, being omniscient, knew how Satan and his evil forces worked in torturing human souls. That is why, when Jesus commanded the spirits in the possessed bodies to depart, they knew who Jesus was. In regard to the prophecy of the prophet Esaias, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses, there is an important explanation. Powerful souls like Jesus could only wipe away the effects of evil in an individual according to the law of cause and effect, which governs karma action. If anyone, through wrong eating, is carrying a load of poison in his body, a counteracting medicine can destroy the virus in the system. So Jesus, by his powerful consciousness, could counteract the evils acquired and accumulated in soul, but no one, not even Jesus, can break the law of cause and effect created by God, but Jesus could stop the impending result of an evil action by astrally taking the result of the evil action upon himself, and thus sparing the person guilty of the evil action. You will ask now how that can be. Well, if you angered John, and he suddenly raised his hand to beat you, and I suddenly came between his fist and you, then you would be spared the hurt and I, being stronger, might not be affected at all by the fistic display of John. So also, when an evil action was perpetrated by Peter, according to the law of cause and effect he had to suffer, but if a powerful soul like Jesus wanted to save Peter, he could deflect the havoc caused by the evil action and work it out and spend its evil force within himself. Some saints have been known to actually take into their own bodies the diseases of wicked persons, and thus cause the sufferers to be relieved. This does not mean that every healer has to suffer if he wants to heal someone by spiritual law. Only extraordinary Christ-like healers can take on the sufferings of others resulting from mental disease and soul sickness and work them out in their own bodies. The sins of the disciples and many other souls according to the law of cause and effect were powerful enough to deal death to the evil doers, so Jesus took their sins upon himself and let his body be crucified. But this crucifixion could not touch Jesus, for he had said long before his physical death, Destroy this temple and I shall build it again in three days. Jesus prayed in the morning and went to a solitary place for prayer. This shows the way people in general should learn to pray. There is a time for everything. We eat three times a day at certain hours. This nourishes the perishable body. People work eight hours or more a day to make money to maintain themselves and others who are dependent upon them. In childhood, eight hours a day plus a few hours at home are spent in nourishing the mind. Mental education gives each individual at least the common sense by which he knows what methods to adopt in order to uniformly perform all the physical, mental, and spiritual duties calculated to bring real happiness. That education is fruitless which makes an individual one-sided, either intellectually or spiritually. No duty should be performed by starving out other duties. One-sidedness brings unhappiness. Those who follow health laws usually enjoy good health, but if one spends all day long in the pursuit of health and neglects to be prosperous or spiritual, he will encounter the miseries arising from poverty and ignorance. Of course, if you are naturally healthy and rich due to an inheritance, you should spend all of your time in cultivating your spiritual life. Also, the rich do not realize their spiritual poverty and as a result foolishly spend their unique opportunity in indulging in the most insecure happiness of the senses. The rich should spend their time exclusively with God. That does not mean that one has to be rich before being spiritual or before knowing God. Anyone who performs the highest duty of knowing God automatically has performed all other lesser duties, for God, once attained, makes one rich with imperishable life and eternal riches. So it is right to seek God first by ignoring everything else. Only, it is disastrous to seek prosperity at the cost of health or to seek health by entirely forgetting to strive to be prosperous. Since God is the source of all power, it is all right to seek Him first by ignoring all other duties for, with God, health and prosperity are added, 
but with the acquirement of health and prosperity alone, God cannot be attained. Besides, the prosperity gained by human effort is perishable, whereas the prosperity which comes after the attainment of God is imperishable. Man should use the proper time and the proper place for performing his different duties. Just as sleep is performed in a quiet bedroom from six to eight hours, and as business is carried on in an atmosphere of business from eight to ten hours, and just as intellectual studies are carried on in the morning or at night in a quiet library, so meditation or contact of God should be performed in a quiet, solitary place at early dawn or late in the evening before retiring for an hour longer. In the depth of the night, or in the early morning, or at any time if in a solitary place, the results of peace realized from meditation are easily obtained due to lack of noise and lack of wrong vibrations of restless people working around you. Restless thoughts silently pass through the body of the meditating individual and keep his released energy rushing toward the senses instead of toward God. However, if a person makes a super effort of will, he can concentrate in spite of all noise. To meditate on quiet occasions and in solitary places, if available, is very helpful to the beginner. On holidays at least, instead of wasting time with restless people, walk to a quiet, lonely place and meditate there. By deeply meditating on the infinite, and once the infinite is contacted, no outward disturbance can bother the soul. As the nighttime is used for sleep and the daytime for business, so spiritual development is best cultivated during the earliest hour of dawn, from 5 to 8 a.m. any time during that period, from 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. to meditate any time during these periods is very beneficial. All the laws of attraction and repulsion which govern the body are more harmonious during the above periods and thus help an individual to withdraw the life force from the sense telephones of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. This frees the attention from all sense disturbances and allows it to march toward God without interruption. All men seek for these signifies that Jesus was sought by the spiritually hungry souls of his day. Just as the fragrance of flowers draws the bees, so souls like Jesus, who are fragrant with God, automatically draw spiritually hungry souls unto themselves. Forgiveness of Sins, Healing the Leper And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, behold, there came a man full of leprosy to him, beseeching him and kneeling down to him, worshipped him and fell on his face and besought him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will, be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. A leper worshipped Jesus and prayed to be healed. I will, spoken by Jesus, signifies the human will tuned in with God's all-powerful will. Jesus, by the word I, did not refer to the limited human ego, but he referred to his soul as unified with the spirit. Human will is circumscribed by the body. It can do anything to the body. It can keep the body well or plunge it into the abyss, destroying it. The human will, by application, can work changes in the world in a limited way. But when the human will identifies itself with God's will in ecstatic meditation, then it becomes God's omnipresent will, able to work in all the channels of force and the avenues of power which govern the universe. It is then that the devotee, with his magnified will, can work any change in his extended cosmic body of the universe, even as a man can will to work through all the nerves and muscles of his own body. Jesus, being one with the omnipresent Father in cosmic energy, felt his presence in the body of the leper. And with his omnipresent will, which controlled cosmic energy, he willed the energy in the leper to change the leprous body into a healthy body. The human body is condensed energy, and the will of Jesus, being in control of all omnipresent energy, could affect the change from a leprous condensed energy, or leprous body, to a perfect condensed energy, or perfect body. 
He willed cosmic energy to clean out all imperfections and to rearrange the life vibrations and create atomic changes into a perfect body. The leper was healed and Jesus said to him, See thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing those things which Moses commanded, for a testimony unto them. Jesus told the leper not to waste time telling everybody about the divine healing, but to tell only the hypocritical priests who commercialized religion and did not live it in daily life. Jesus, in a way, through his miracle of healing the leper, hinted to the priests what they could do if they were really spiritual and did not merely profess being so. Jesus believed in the greatness of Moses and so he asked the leper to offer to the temple those cleansing things which were commanded by Moses as a testimony of God's healing. Forgiveness of sins, Jesus heals the man of palsy. But he went out and began to publish it much and to blaze abroad the matter. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And they came to him from every quarter. And again he entered into Capernaum for some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, which was born of four. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him, and when they could not find by what way they might bring him in, nigh unto him, because of the multitude, they went upon the house top, and uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let him down through the tiling with his couch, wherein the sick of the palsy lay, into the midst before Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. The healed leper became the best publicity agent of Jesus, that great multitudes sought to be healed by him. Jesus could no more openly enter cities and so he withdrew himself into the wilderness of the desert, and into the wilderness of his inner being, where no restless thoughts ever dared to disturb him, and there he communed with God. When he came to Capernaum for seven days, people heard about him and his room became overcrowded. Many Pharisees and doctors of the law from Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem came to see Jesus, and four men, being unable to get to him, broke open the roof of the house where he was and let down the man suffering with palsy. Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick man, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Son, be delighted in spirit, for thy sickness which is due to some prenatal and postnatal sins, consciously or unconsciously practiced by thee, but unknown to thee now, and which are forgiven by the mercy of God is healed. Every sinful action leaves a sinful seed or tendency in the brain, which later sprouts into some mental or physical calamity when the conditions of evil actions are favorable. Just as a needle, when it strikes the grooves of a record, plays a certain song, so also the needle of an evil action, when it touches a grooved evil tendency in the brain, brings forth a corresponding song of evil experience. Every experience, good or bad, if intense, leaves a mental and physical record in the brain. This mental and grooved physical record in the brain can be played at any time by the suitable needle of specific association of ideas. Divine men, like Jesus, can with will and cosmic energy burn from any man the mental and physical records of sin which keep on singing the fruition of sinful calamities. With the burning of the inner sinful records, the misery-producing songs of evil experience disappear also. This is what Jesus meant by forgiveness of sins when he healed the man stricken with palsy. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? 
and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Why reason ye these things? Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. The human consciousness of the materially minded people could not understand how God identified Jesus could forgive the results of evil actions. When a glutton eats too much and suffers from acute indigestion, he cannot forgive or relieve the reactions of his greedy actions. If he follows the advice of a doctor, he can relieve himself of stomach trouble. So, in the spiritual world, the psychologically sick person can be forgiven or freed from the painful results of his actions if he follows the advice of the real spiritual teacher to whom all spiritual errors must be disclosed confession for the sake of spiritual diagnosis and the finding ad prescribing of the proper remedy. But the sinful priest, who has not found forgiveness or relief from his own sins, cannot possibly forgive or relieve other error-makers from sin. Sin consists of pursuing erroneous ways which lead to physical, mental, and spiritual unhappiness under the lure of happiness. Sin promises happiness and imparts unhappiness. Virtue promises no immediate happiness but positively, ultimately gives lasting happiness. Besides, the sons of God have power like God to relieve us from all the suffering of our bodies, minds, and souls. A spiritual and mental healing current can be offered invisibly to offset the effects of evil karma or actions lodged in the brain cells. As acids can dissolve a record, so the mental and physiological grooves in the brain cells of an error-stricken individual can be obliterated by the transmission of life force. Erroneous habits can be changed to good habits in individuals. God, who is the maker of souls, minds, and bodies, originally made human beings after the pattern of his perfect image, but they chose to desecrate and distort that divine image into a mortal image by the misuse of God-given independence. Ordinarily, human beings in general think that God alone, the Almighty Maker, can change an ignorance distorted mortal man back to his original perfect divine state as God's perfect image, but materially minded people fail to realize that the God-knowing saint is one with God. Jesus had often asserted the real truth, I and my Father are one. And Jesus, being one with the Father, could do everything that God can do. That is why Jesus gave life to Lazarus. Jesus, being present in the bodies of the doubting scribes and Pharisees, felt their thoughts and replied to their doubting feelings. Jesus asked the doubting Pharisees, Why are you concerned about my forgiving the sins of men? Why do you think it is evil to relieve people of their miseries by the power of God acting through me, or by my power given unto me by God? Jesus signified his complete unity with God, and that he was free from all elusive egotism. Therefore, Jesus explained why he could say to the sick either, Thy sins be forgiven thee by God, or arise and take up thy bed and walk, or I as the conscious reflection of the power and true image of the Heavenly Father say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. The ordinary person, not one with God and self-realization, even though humble, can have the undetected ego hiding in him, even if he humbly says to the sick, Be healed by God's power. But the superman who is one with God does not feel his separating egotism even when he says, I say unto thee, Arise and be healed. Here I signifies the God alone which the true devotee feels within himself. True devotees, true gurus, perceptors, never feel themselves to be perceptors, for they behold in themselves none other than the pure God. The Guru is the awakened God, awakening the sleeping God and the disciple. The divine law of healing, Jesus heals the impotent man. After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. 
Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie, and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? During a feast time Jesus went to Jerusalem and came to the pool of Bethesda, where a crowd of stricken people waited to bathe when the waters were troubled by an inner healing force and angel. At certain periods, this pool vibrated and emanated healing earth currents electrical, and those who bathed in the pool at that time were healed. Also, the belief in the healing power of the water caused a mental reaction which healed many of the people. The mind controls the body. A person who is sick for a long time becomes mentally weak and his will is so paralyzed with sickness that he cannot throw off the trouble. However, faith in anything or anybody may revive his all-healing, all-powerful will to release the nascent brain energy and affect the healing of any diseased part of the body. Jesus saw a man who had been afflicted for thirty-eight years lying by the pool unable to get into it by himself when the waters moved. Filled with compassion, and knowing the superiority of mind power which could heal by itself without depending upon any outside factor, he asked, Wilt thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked, and on the same day was the Sabbath. Jesus knew the divine law of healing, which requires the proper soil of faith on the part of the patient and the proper seed of mental healing power on the part of the healer in order to grow the three of healing. So Jesus prepared the soil of faith by creating in the stricken man the desire to be healed by divine law. When Jesus found that the sick man desired very much to be healed, he said, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. He meant that the stricken man need no longer wait to be healed by the waters of the pool of Bethesda by an outside physical condition, but that he should realize the unlimited power of God hidden within the human mind, and he would be healed at once. The man was instantaneously healed by one, the uninterrupted flow of the unlimited, all healing energy of God through the mental transparency of the life of Jesus, and two, by his own awakened faith and the revival of his paralyzed will, which served as the antenna for charging the all healing combined cosmic energy from Jesus and the latent life energy of his own brain. The Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Then asked they him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. The hypocritical Jews did not want to express their amazement at the healing performed by Jesus, for that would be an acknowledgment of his superiority over them. So they began to display a sham zeal for the laws of the Sabbath day. The healed man replied to the Jews that the man who had healed him had commanded him to carry the bed. He did not want to say it was Jesus who had disappeared in the multitude. Afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple, and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Jesus told the healed man that his sickness had been the result of his own prenatal and postnatal evil actions, and that was why he should not continue to pursue evil ways. Jesus told him also to free his power of independent action from the influence of the seeds of past evil actions. He said that if evil actions were continued, all the evils of his past actions and the evils accruing from new actions would act like a casual karmic bomb which would explode and cause worse troubles. 
Traces of evil actions lie hidden like mental bombs within the brain until they can be ignited by freshly kindled evil actions. Hidden bombs of past evil tendencies can be destroyed by soaking them in the waters of fresh, newly acquired wisdom. When you become physically sick, remember that sickness is the result of breaking some mental or physical law, either in this life or in a past embodiment. If then, you are healed by spiritual or healthful living, or by the healing power of some divine being, you should not again pile up more traces of evil actions to explode later as greater physical or mental maladies. The Hindu scriptures say that it is difficult to get away from the effects arising from physical, mental, moral, or spiritual errors made in this life or in past lives. Many people lead mechanical lives without taking account of the amount of evil or good they have stored up in past lives. The results of good and bad actions are stored in the subconscious mind like seed tendencies which germinate and grow when the specific suitable opportunity arrives. In this world it sometimes happens that a good man suddenly becomes a bad one. The reason for this change is that a hidden bomb of prenatal evil explodes when he touches the fire of evil environment. Likewise, a man who is habitually bad man suddenly become good due to the germination of hidden seeds of prenatal good actions. Of course, a person may become good or bad due to his own free choice, but in most cases it is found that sudden changes in the habits of a person can be ascribed to prenatal causes or hidden postnatal effects of actions. Sin no more. When Jesus said, Sin no more lest a worse thing come unto thee, he signified that our sufferings are directly or indirectly caused by sinful actions performed in this life or in past lives. Jesus meant that he had, by his great will power, overcome the sufferings resulting from the sick man's past sins, and that the man should not sin again lest worse evil overtake him. Jesus clearly signified that the rewards of sin or virtue do not come from unknown causes or from an act of God, but that they are the result of human wrong or good actions. Jesus knew the law of cause and effect or action which governs the life of man. Ordinary people, who do not lead scientific lives, think that all good fortune or misfortune is caused by an inscrutable, whimsical destiny. They should give up this conception and try to govern their lives by wisdom. Whenever you find that you are suffering from a physical or financial ailment, remember that it is caused by an error committed in the present or in a past life. Instead of moaning over your fate and blaming destiny, you should try to adopt the counteracting antidote of good actions to mitigate and lessen the effect of past evil actions. In the healing of the sinful man by Jesus we find the lesson that when a person is overburdened by the effects of past sinful actions, he can get released by following the counsel of a real spiritual doctor, who can't by his will power, partially or completely heal the patient if the latter chooses to cooperate with the spiritual doctor and follow his divine prescriptions. The Hindu scriptures say that all lives are governed by the law of cause and effect. That is why some people are born blind or ignorant and some are born healthy, wealthy, and wise. If prenatal causes did not operate to create the differences in the lives of men at birth, then God could be blamed for partiality in equipping one with the brain of a moron and another with the brain of a wise man. If God ordained an infant to have the brain of a moron, he certainly could not make that child responsible for his ignorant actions. Whereas, a child who is equipped with a good brain will naturally act wisely. From the above example of healing by Jesus and from his saying, Sin no more lest a worse thing come, it is distinctly evident that Jesus knew that not only are our lives governed by the law of action, but that reincarnation alone can explain the inequalities and seeming injustices which visit human beings at their birth. In this healing it is evident also that all ills and all visitations of sins in the beginning of life or later are due to man's own actions. Jesus makes every man responsible for his own suffering. Another lesson the above example of healing teaches is that a chronic physical, moral, or mental sickness can be healed in one of two ways, 
either by contacting a spiritual man and taking his advice, or by adopting the counteracting antidote of good actions to minimize or destroy the effects of past evil actions. Sabbath Day The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. But Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. When the man departed and told the Jews that Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath day, the Jews tried to persecute him. The Jews mechanically observed the Sabbath and their ethics of living whereas Jesus followed the spirituality of rules, often ignoring the superficiality and formality in following them. It is possible on the Sabbath day to do nothing but be conscious of the idleness of the material body. Many people who outwardly observe the Sabbath day are still living identified with the material consciousness of the body. Such people, who overemphasize the inactivity of the body, often forget to follow the spirit of the Sabbath, which consists in remaining identified with spirit by discarding material engagements. Those hypocritical Jews, who followed only a material Sabbath consisting of cessation of physical activity without spiritual communion, did not realize that Jesus could perform a material act on the Sabbath day without being material. To Jesus every day was a Sabbath day. He lived every day in wisdom and God consciousness and needed no special Sabbath day. Special Sabbath days are necessary for the people who are entangled continuously and who do not take any time for God. Besides this, the act of healing a person is not material work and does not contradict the spirit of the Sabbath day. The Jews knew this in their hearts, and in order to ease their conscience about their hypocritical observance of the Sabbath, they wanted to persecute Jesus, who apparently had broken the inactivity of the Sabbath day by healing the sinful person. That is why Jesus said, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. He meant that whatever work he did here was actuated by his consciousness of the Father, and that he was not actuated by evil. He was guided by the intuitional consciousness which he received from God. Actions are free. Every devotee, no matter what he does, feels that his actions, will, and reason are free, but that they are guided by the wisdom of the Heavenly Father. Devotees are not slaves of God, but they act wisely by their own volition, and in that way they find themselves being guided by God's wisdom, for all wisdom comes from God. God never commands his devotees to do anything, but those who feel the presence of God know him as wisdom and they prefer to be guided by the super wisdom of God rather than by their own egotistical will. That is why Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, the Son can do nothing himself but what he seeth the Father do. In the above sentence, Jesus told exactly how he worked. He showed that he was in love with God and with such wisdom and love of God he saw God and God's actions, and as he saw the Heavenly Father act, and as he felt God's actions, he acted likewise of his own free choice. This did not involve enslavement of the will of Jesus, but it meant that Jesus found that a man's wisdom-guided will is identical with God's wisdom-guided will, since all wisdom is his alone. Chapter 15 the divine task, the will of the Father. Therefore, said the disciples one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus said unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I send you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor, other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. The disciples erroneously thought that Jesus had already had some food when he said, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Ordinary food temporarily nourishes the perishable body and gives it a passing pleasure arising from the sense of taste. 
Jesus was telling his disciples that to human eyes, although his body needed food, his real self tasted the ever-satisfying, eternally nourishing man of divine wisdom and celestial ever-new bliss. The disciples did not know how to nourish their souls. I often find in homes comprised of materially-minded members that most of the members wake up in the morning with the consciousness of a cup of coffee, toast, and ham and eggs, and go to sleep at night thinking of beefsteak. In spiritual homes, the home members think first in the morning of drinking the cool nectar of peace from the bowl of deep contemplation, and at night they think of the voice of divine peace singing softly, inviting them to rest on the bosom of divine peace. Upon wakening in the morning and at night before going to sleep, and at mealtime, people should fumigate their material consciousness with the thought of God. The idea is to remain in the world but not to be of the world. To remain unattached, like the dewdrop on the lotus leaf, is to be really happy, ready to slip the consciousness into God. The dewdrop cannot slide on a blotting paper so the average soul cannot keep the mind free to slip into God if he associates with materially-minded people who are attached to things. Jesus repulsed the idea of food, not because he thought that it was unnecessary for him to eat, but because he wished to show to the disciples that the consciousness of man should be predominantly on God, the ever-satisfying food, and not on a material diet. Jesus said that, as meat is loved by most people, so his relish consisted in doing the will of God cheerfully and not like a puppet. Prophets have come for the distinct purpose of filling a world need according to the cosmic divine plan. Jesus knew how long he was to stay on earth and realized the possibility of being crucified. He was aware of the stupendous mission he had to perform on earth while he lived. To finish his work signifies the finishing of the divine task which was his part to carry out during his incarnation as Jesus, and not the work of redemption which he has to carry throughout eternity. The Spiritual Harvest Jesus used the parable of the sower, the labor, the harvesting time, and the harvest to illustrate the superior law of the divine harvester. In ordinary farming there is a great deal of labor, and the harvest comes in about four months after planting. But Jesus said that the spiritual harvest is not a matter of waiting, laboring, and then acquiring the spiritual harvest, but it is a matter of knowing that one already, in a latent form, possesses in his divine image all the inheritance of the divine Father. When this knowledge comes, the contact of God instantaneously manifests itself in the soul from beneath the wisdom-seared veil of ignorance. Jesus said that all one has to do is to lift the consciousness from the play of material vibrations to the ever-ready harvest of wisdom, glistening on the fields of pure white cosmic consciousness. Human wisdom has to be acquired gradually through the medium of the limited senses and intelligence, but divine wisdom can be grasped instantaneously through the medium of intuition, which is developed by meditation. The idea is that if one closes his eyes, he shuts out the light, and the minute one opens his eyes, he perceives light. In the same way, the minute one opens his eyes of wisdom, he beholds the light of God. This is a great consolation, for the mortal law is governed by the law of as you sow, so shall you reap. To reach perfection as a mortal through this law, one has to travel through endless incarnations, which is almost an impossibility, but to know oneself through meditation as the Son of God is to claim instantaneously the forgotten divine inheritance. As human beings we need to acquire everything. As children of God we do not have to acquire, but we need only to realize that we already know everything. The human harvest has to be sown and reaped, and then enjoyed for a short time, but the divine harvest has only to be reaped and enjoyed throughout eternity. Jesus said not to waste time becoming materially rich, only to lose what you get through great effort, but he said to just make the effort to know what you have as a divine child by taking off the death mask of mortal consciousness from the immortal face of the soul, and to enjoy the eternal harvest of bliss in God. Some people may say, well, it takes great effort to be spiritual. I say, no. 
The only effort we have to make is to forget our unspiritual mortal consciousness, and as soon as that is done we know we are gods. He who reaps divine wisdom through meditation receives the wages of eternal wisdom, and he gathers the forgotten fruits of ever new bliss as the result. That both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together signifies that God, as the sower of wisdom in souls, is pleased when he finds that his true children reap the harvest grown by him and not the harvest of evil sown and reaped by mortal ignorance. One soweth and the other reapeth signifies that God is the only sower, the only source of wisdom, and that we, as him children, must reap what he has already grown for us. Jesus says that God sent people to reap the harvest of wisdom and bliss stacked in their souls for which no human effort was made. We have, by meditation, only to rise above our self-created nightmares of human miseries that is all, then we shall instantaneously remember our forgotten image of God. In the world, just forgetting poverty does not make us rich. We have to acquire riches, but as God's children we immediately become divine, endowed with all powers, the minute we forget our self-created mortal consciousness by deep meditation. It is easy for all of us to be a Jesus Christ in one life by proper meditation because we are potentially already sons of God, made in His image, but for all of us try to become rich like Henry Ford is almost an impossibility because of the limitations of earthly life. Other men labor and ye are entered into their labors means that other mortal souls labor for perishable material things and you foolishly imitate them and struggle on for something you cannot have. Rather, by meditation and calmness, open your age-long closed eyes of wisdom, and in the light of awakening find yourself as the owner of the entire cosmos. Jesus honors the Sabbath. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Jesus went to his native land of Nazareth and in the synagogue on the Sabbath day, he stood up to read. Jesus believed that every man should recharge his vitality by the restful silence of the Sabbath. Eating heavy meals on Sundays does not produce rest but bodily discomfort. Hence, light meals, fruit or vegetable dinners or even fasting is good on Sundays. Fasting or light eating gives the motors of the stomach and heart rest from their heavy weekly work. Too much eating keeps the mind busy with the body and diverts the attention from God. The worldly man saturates his soul with worries throughout the week and loads his body with excessive food and unassimilated food poisons. Hence, a day of introspective silence gives each individual a change to think things over and reorganize a balanced mode of living. Sunday sermons and periods of silence recharge the peace-hungry soul. This Sunday peace, if deeply recharged into the soul of the businessman, may last him throughout the week and help him to battle with his restless mental moods, temptations, and financial worries. If the worldly man gives a whole week to money-making pursuits, eating, and amusements, he should at least give one day to the thought of God, without whom his very life, brain, activity, feeling, and entertainments are impossible. Sunday worship may not have been necessary to Jesus because every day was to him a son's day, or divine wisdom's day. However, great men always show good examples in order to help others who imitate them. If Jesus, spiritual as he was, thought it necessary to go to the temple on Sundays, why shouldn't sense-habit-driven people do likewise? Sunday prayers recharge the soul of the average person until, at the end of the week, those Sunday influences begin to wear off. 
therefore it is necessary for everyone to recharge his soul battery with Sunday silence at least once a week. The average person usually finds the influence of material habits predominant throughout the week and can seldom retain sufficient of the sacred influences of Sunday worship to last until the following Sunday. Of course a dime is better than no money at all. Even weekly Sunday sermons suggest to the materially minded person the necessity of acquiring the peace-producing influence of Sunday silence, but to feel appreciably the predominating influence of Sunday peace one ought to consider early morning, noontime before lunch, evening before dinner, and especially the quiet time before sleep, as Sundays or real times in which to cultivate habits of peace through meditation. If anyone, even twice, during the earliest hour of dawn and in the depth of night, worships God in the church of meditation for fifteen minutes to one hour, he will find that the spiritual habits of peace will predominate over his worry-producing material habits. Of course the man who is busy with perishable things such as stocks, bonds, and so forth, which cannot pass through the fiery gates of afterlife until death, must at least make his best effort to worship God in some real church. He must remember not to keep his body in the church and his soul away concerned with his business worries. He must worship with a calm body and a quiet mind. If he keeps doing this, he may eventually be inclined to meditate every day. Jesus meant that the peace church to attend is one hour's deep silence every Sunday, which may be at any time of the day, whenever one wishes to cultivate wisdom or bask in the daylight of the Son of Wisdom and Silence, Sunday. Besides, doing certain things at certain times creates the willingness to perform those actions. The body assimilates food better when breakfast, lunch, and dinner are served regularly. To go to church regularly on Sundays develops the habit of thinking of religion or of God at least once a week. Regular eating, regular efforts at business success, regular church going and regular meditation develop specific habits. When material or spiritual actions are regularly repeated, either daily or weekly, they are bound to create physiological and consequently psychological habits. Most people are ruled by their bad material habits. Bad habits cannot be destroyed by mere willingness to eradicate them, but only by adopting the antidote of good habits. Many people wonder why, in spite of their continued willingness to get rid of bad habits, they are still swept down that current. Willingness is not enough. One must act according to that willingness, not only once or twice, but repeatedly and consciously, then he can expect to get rid of bad habits. Hence, achievement lies in continued activity. Knowing the above-mentioned law of habit which governs human nature, Jesus set the example by going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. His sermon began with the reading of the book of the prophet Esaias. Jesus purposely read from the book of Esaias those portions which tallied with the kind of work he was destined to do. The Spirit of the Lord or the intelligent power of Christ consciousness which directs all creation is upon my soul. When one unlike mortals feels that his soul is united to the vast spirit, he is baptized with inexhaustible spiritual wisdom, and thus he can ably and fittingly preach the gospel, or God's intuitive wisdom, to the poor or to humble recipient minds. God's saturated souls alone can put together the hearts of men broken by material desires. When the human heart is broken by the false promises of material happiness, then nothing can satisfy that soul except the matchless, unending divine happiness. As immortals we are sent on earth for entertainment, but when we forget that and become enmeshed in material desires, we begin erroneously to expect unending happiness from perishable matter, and hence we become brokenhearted. Then God-known souls can come to the rescue by reminding us of the unending happiness of spirit, which remains hidden within our own souls. God-empowered souls, finding all power coming from Him, can, by the exercise of matter controlling divine will, remodel even the disorganized atoms in a blind man's eyes. Such divine souls can also heal the spiritual blindness of individuals. 
God perceiving souls alone can free other souls who are bruised by worries and by the faithlessness of so-called friends. The purpose of Jesus in reading the above passages from the book of Essays was distinctly meant to show that his coming had already been prophesied. This shows that, in spite of the apparent invisibility and secret presence of God, he sometimes reveals his plans to the world through the meek but true words of prophets. Of course, charlatans use passages of the scriptures to serve their own nefarious ends, but Jesus knew that God had asked his saints to prophesy the coming of his beloved Son through the scriptures. Jesus, in his meek way, declared through the words of Essayas that he was not baptized with water by man, but that he was bathed in the ocean of spirit, which inspired him to be a God-chosen minister. Some people read a little about the scriptures, or get a doctor of divinity degree through the virtue of memorizing the scriptures, and then they think that they are qualified to stand in a pulpit and pour out to others their imagination about scriptural truths. Of course, such self-elected ministers do little good in the world. People let their unlived sermons in through one ear and out through the other. But when one who has been a devotee for years meditates upon God and succeeds in pleasing Him, then he chooses that devoted soul to bring others back to his mansion. These advanced souls are saturated with the spirit, intelligence, and power of God and anyone physically, mentally, or spiritually sick coming in contact with them becomes really healed. In modern churches there is very little real beneficial relation between the minister and his church members. The minister instead of giving holy sermons simply to create a vague devotion in the minds of his people, must be able to heal their physical, mental, and above all, their spiritual sickness of ignorance. Jesus, knowing the prevalence of false prophets, declared that he was not a self-elected, useless minister, but one who had been taught by God and empowered by him to heal his children. Besides, Jesus showed that God had declared in the scriptures the coming of his special messenger or son. The usual custom is to develop gradually from the physical and intellectual to the spiritual, and then from the spiritual people fall back to the physical again. During the material state of world civilization, when misery invades man, God from time to time sends his Christ like devotees to redeem men. That is why some souls are ordained to act as reformers chosen by God. That is why Jesus said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, that is, in reality Jesus came to declare through his own words his coming, which had been written in the scriptures a long time before. As God chooses a special manifestation of himself to redeem the world from its special state of darkness, he also works through his devotees at all times to redeem his erring children. Jesus reveals his past incarnation and his knowledge of divine law. And all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Serpta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were as Israel in the time of Elias the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. All those who heard Jesus were amazed at the prophetic words which gently flowed out of his sacred mouth, and they perceived the ring of truth in his words. And yet, while they were marveling at his profound utterances, they suddenly doubted in the mortal way and began to say, Oh, how could the son of our Joseph, one or our fellow mortals, prophesy and heal people? As soon as Jesus heard this, he began to furnish reasons for the behavior of prophets who only act according to the will of God and not like ordinary self-willed mortals. Jesus spoke to the people in the following way, revealing the grand secret of his past incarnation. 
My dear people, you expect me to heal here just as I healed the sick at Capernaum, and you may wonder why, as a spiritual physician, I can heal foreign people and cannot heal my own people in my own country. Do you realize that a prophet is not usually accepted in his own country? Acceptance signifies faith, and without the good soil of faith, no healing seed can be fruitfully sown by even a man of God. The Almighty subjects his prophets to his inculcated spiritual laws. Since God gave independence to man, man could shut out divine power out of his life or bring God's power to shine through the window of faith. Divine healing is based on the law of reciprocity. Here in my own country the people are used to me. They know me as a mortal man and have consequently no faith in me, and without faith neither God nor I could heal, because according to the divine decree of the gift of free will, man can successfully resist divine influences as well as the influence of all saints. There can be no greater healer than omnipresent God. He is trying to heal his mortal children from all troubles, but he cannot do so because man shuts him out. Besides, dear people, don't you know that the scriptures are full of illustrations where prophets, like Elias, Elijah and my former self as the prophet Elias, Elisha healed only those who spiritually deserved it and who were thus ordained by God to be healed. Jesus knew that John the Baptist, in a former life, had been Elias, Elijah the Guru preceptor of his long past incarnation. One attracts spiritual teachers when he is desirous of spiritual training, but a guru, or direct messenger of God, is sent only when the disciple is extremely determined to know God. God uses the speech, mind, and wisdom of the guru to teach and redeem the disciple. Jesus mentioned Elias, Elijah and Elias, Elisha in the course of his talk to the people, because he knew that his former guru preceptor, Elias, and himself as Elias, had been supremely endowed with healing powers, yet were allowed to heal only in accordance with divine laws. So Jesus said to the people, I tell you of a truth, that is, I tell you truthfully as I remember from my past incarnation, that during the existence of my guru preceptor Elias, due to the accumulated evils of bad actions of people in general, and their destructive vibrations, heavenly laws controlling all forces of nature were prevented from proper functioning, resulting in great famine. Elias and God were helpless and could not free the people because they exercised their own misguided free will to shut out the divine powers. Thus Jesus said that famine resulted from the accumulated evils of people, and when they did not exercise their free choice to cultivate faith, they had to go through the ravages of famine for three years and six months. Of course their punishment was brought on by themselves, because their wrong actions and their vibrations disrupted the finer astral forces which control the ultimate forces, climatic conditions and so forth which govern the earth. Jesus was not speaking of fatalism, but he was emphasizing the idea that man must suffer the consequences of his actions if he misuses his free will, and if he does not invoke God's aid when he has fallen. Thus, Jesus said that not even his past guru preceptor, Elias, nor God, could do anything to stop the famine in Israel. Jesus also pointed out that there were many needy widows in Israel at that time, but there was only one widow in Serpta, a city of Sidon, who made enough spiritual effort to deserve the God-ordained spiritual aid from Elias. Then, with a dramatic prophecy, he subtly and incidentally spoke of himself as the Elysius of Yore, who was not ordained by the spiritual laws to heal all the lepers who existed then, but only one named Naaman. This reference of Elysius is very significant. This truth has remained veiled since Jesus spoke of Elysius. This is the first time that this great truth as to who Jesus was in the time of Elias has been revealed. Read about Elysius or Elisha, and you will find that he raised the dead and fed 100 people with 20 loaves of bread, even as when he appeared as Jesus he raised Lazarus from the dead and fed 5,000 people with five loaves. In the above passage, Jesus said to the people, My dear people, 
you do not understand how divine laws operate, and that is why you ask me why I cannot heal in my own country. Now you know that it is nothing new that when I as the prophet Eliseus raised one from the dead and healed one leper, but did not raise all the dead people, nor heal all the lepers in Israel in my time. I, Eliseus, did only what the spiritual laws influenced me to do. In the above passages Jesus described the divine law which works justly in secrecy and not in a sensational way before the curious gazing eyes of people, and incidentally, Jesus described his past as the prophet Eliseus, the disciple of Elias. It is for this reason that Jesus said that Elias had come already as John the Baptist. It is for this reason that he asked Elias to anoint him and baptize him with spirit and with water. A Giru preceptor being ordained by God is sent to the extremely anxious and genuinely seeking disciple. Then the Giru preceptor and the disciple enter into a vow of eternal, unconditional friendship and pledge to redeem each other and help each other until final emancipation is gained. Human friends part through misunderstanding, forgetfulness and death. Divine friendship, though born in mutual divine usefulness, still is unconditional and continues beyond the portals of death. Sometimes the Guru Preceptor falls down, only to be lifted up by the advanced disciple, as Jesus uplifted the fallen Elias, or John the Baptist, who could only baptize with water. Most of the time, the Guru Preceptor follows the disciple through all necessary incarnations, until he is redeemed. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. Those who heard Jesus flawlessly expound the divine law were filled with wrath. The people wanted Jesus to operate the divine law of healing as if he were performing in a circus. They tempted him to go against the will of the Father by saying, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. But Jesus cut them short by saying that Elijah and Elias were great prophets who did not do what they wanted to do, but who did what God directed them to do. Even though they had healing power and could heal thousands, yet they healed only those who were commanded by God to be healed. People were frustrated in their attempt to dislodge Jesus from his consciousness of right action and from exhibiting an open display of divine powers, so they became filled with wrath and thrust Jesus out of the city and led him to the brow of a hill, to cast him down headlong. But strange as are the decrees of God, Jesus was protected by invisible divine power. God being present in the souls of all secretly cast oblivion in the hearts of the adversaries of Jesus, who forgot to take the final step in the act of throwing him down the hill. Jesus fulfills the scriptures and preaches repentance. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the sea coast in the borders of Zabulon and Nethalim that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Esaias the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun, and the land of Nethelim by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region in shadow of death light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus went to Galilee, Leaving Nazareth, he dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast at the border between Zabulon and Nephilim, that the prophecy of Esaias, the prophet, might be fulfilled. Great prophets predict the coming of great Messias, who from time to time are sent to earth. So Esaias, or Isaiah, happened to be the mouthpiece of God to declare the coming of St. John and Jesus. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. When the words of prophets come true, it should be a glaring testimony to the disbelievers of the consciously initiated plan of God in the world. In spite of the mystery of events and strange happenings in the world, 
once in a while definite prophecies, veiled in complex language, are given to the world so that people may awaken to the realization of the subtle presence of God in the world. Jesus consciously knew about the declaration of the prophet Esaias and was divinely guided to go into Galilee to preach the gospel of the Lord. The people who sat in the darkness of ignorance beheld the great all-revealing light of Christ's wisdom. In the Hindu scriptures we find mentioned that the saints live in so-called darkness of material poverty and in the light of eternal wisdom, whereas most people are living in the imaginary light of material prosperity enveloped by the thick darkness of unspirituality. Here darkness signifies spiritual ignorance. Just as a thousand years of darkness lodge in a mountain cave is dislodged by a lighted match, so the vibrations of the gathered ignorance of ages in a city can be dispelled by a saint who bears the invisible torch of God's wisdom. There are two kinds of people, those who sit in the darkness of ignorance and love it, and those who become conscious of the gloom of ignorance and want to get out of it with the freeing light of wisdom. Through knowledge and subconscious memory in the soul, the latter kind of people remember their experience with light and therefore abhor the pit of dark ignorance into which they find themselves fallen through their own wrong actions. So in Galilee, only those people who realized their dark ignorance and were inwardly clamoring for the light of wisdom felt the great wisdom vibrations of Jesus. Those also who were steeped in spiritual ignorance and had been going through the mysterious death like changes of life were relieved of their inner gloom by the very presence of Jesus and his luminous wisdom. Usually souls who are under the influence of this cosmic dream behold life in shadowy death and all dualities, but when they wake up in the light of wisdom, they behold nothing but the oneness of God's light. Krishna, in the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, speaks of this earth as the aggregate of delusive mysteries and the ocean of affliction. In the Christian Bible Esaias speaks of the worldly people as sitting in the shadow of death or constantly changing temporal events of this earth. How could changeless, permanent happiness be wrung out of the imperfect earth surroundings, mixed with the changeful events of sorrow and joy, disease and health? People are foolish to look for paradise in earthly things. They should look for paradise within themselves while living on earth. The earth conditions, being born of delusion, will always be more or less defective, and that can only be overcome by the contact of the unchanging light of wisdom perceived in meditation. Jesus made people open their closed eyes of wisdom and dispel the self-created darkness, so that they perceive the fountain of light springing from the broken soil of darkness. To fulfill the words of the prophecy, Jesus, from that time on, began to preach the gospel or God's pronouncements or commandments and the laws about the kingdom of heaven and its happiness. There is time for everything. The whole cosmos is mathematically adjusted by God and his angels so that it runs like a clock. Esaias had prophesied the coming of Jesus in Galilee, and as soon as Jesus reached there, he felt the divine vibrations of the cosmic cycle and he put his heart and soul into giving God to all. At this auspicious time, Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost or cosmic holy vibration and was baptized by the Spirit, and from then on he began to declare the truth of God's kingdom as he perceived it. Many people look for the vast kingdom of God as a point of space in the clouds, far away from the noxious, sinful vapors of the earth, but they forget that the vast eternal land of God's omniscience is near at hand. Whenever you close your eyes, you shut out the land of finitude and matter, and the land of eternity is found to lie tier upon tier in endless vistas before the inner vision of man. If man repents of his folly of constantly gazing at the finite cosmos, and closes his eyes and constantly meditates, he perceives the land of infinity within him. Repentance signifies seeing the folly of life and keeping the attention turned upon matter. The wise man repents because he knows the miseries resulting from the contact of matter. Then he makes up his mind and first believes in the kingdom within, and then, by constant meditation, he perceives the kingdom of eternity lying close at hand within him. First, one must believe in God's message as sent through his saints, 
and repent of the folly of matter attachment, then he must meditate ceaselessly and he will be sure to find the kingdom of God within, which kingdom he was looking for in the clouds. Repent, for the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of heaven God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel the time is fulfilled signifies the divine plan of sending Jesus on earth at a definite time. Just as motion picture directors plan the time for filming a picture, so also God and his angels plan the time for the projection and materialization of certain great events in the cosmos. When the darkness of ignorance, like an inky mist, encircles the minds of mundane people at certain times, then God sends great saints to redeem the sin-submerged souls. Jesus knew he was empowered by heaven to give spiritual light to all men, so he said that the kingdom of God, which lies very near, just behind the darkness of closed eyes, could easily be found through his help. The words at hand signify the nearness of heaven within the consciousness of man, as well as the ease with which people could find God through the meditation of Jesus. Repenti signifies the withdrawal of the principal attention from matter to God. Every soul, upon spiritual awakening, should repent of its folly of expecting permanent happiness from fleeting sense pleasures. The poor taste for sorrow producing evil should be displaced by the superior inclinations for joy producing good. Unless one is sorry about his evil ways, he cannot find pleasure in pursuing the path of purity. Repentance does not mean crying over spilled milk constantly, but it means to so impregnate the mind with consciousness of the after effects of evil that one will automatically shrink from even thought of evil deeds, not to speak of evil deeds themselves. Unless the mind learns to abhor evil actions, it is very difficult to keep it proof against the subtle allurements of temptation. One must repent, not only of following unprofitable ways of living, but one must desist from all evil actions after every repentance. To steal during the week and repent on Sundays would not provide remission from the evils of theft. If one finds that he has been a thief for a week, he must repent of his wicked deeds on the eighth day, and after his repentance, he must forever relinquish the habit of stealing. Repentance is not a cure for the results of evil actions. It serves only to keep the mind consciously acquainted with the results of evil deeds, with the hope of keeping it from repeating evil experiences. Many people, who think repentance is a cure for evil habits, keep repenting after each evil deed, expecting thereby to receive divine amnesty from sin. Jesus exhorted the people, saying that the time to receive divine glory was within their easy reach, and that they should first repent of their evil ways and not blindly enjoy them as before. After repentance, it is necessary to believe in the gospel, or God's spell, or God's pronouncement of truth, through the meditative intuition of the devotee. Belief is that conditional receptive attitude of mind preceding an experience necessary to cognize it. One refuses to believe in a thing long enough to experiment with it, he cannot possibly know about it. If a man is thirsty and is advised to quench his thirst with the water from a nearby good well, he must believe in the water in that well, and must make the effort to go to it before he can satisfy the demands of his thirst. But if a thirsty man questions the purity of the water in the good well the minute he hears about it, there is no way of showing him the good quality of the water in that well. Therefore Jesus emphasizes the fact that each truth-seeking soul must repent of the foolishness of following unsatisfying material ways of living, and must act at a suitable time to believe, not in imaginary things, but in the truths experienced by him through God. To be an orthodox, unquestioning believer in any spiritual doctrine without the scrutiny of experimentation makes one ossified with dogmatism. Belief should not be wasted on false doctrines, but should be exercised only on the truth poured out to man through the authority of saints. Jesus did not ask the people to believe anything or any false doctrines, as false prophets do, 
but he asked his people to keep faith only in divine revelations with the assurance that if the people kept on unceasingly believing in and hence concentrating upon the gospel, they would surely and ultimately come to experience the truths revealed in it.